The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vince D. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you this whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! <laughs> would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight, but I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night... I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea that perhaps he heard me, or he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed, fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I 
kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo, the terrors that distract me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions. But he had found all in vain. All in vain. Because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray like the thread of a spider, shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the sense? Now, I say, there come to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done, but for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound. 
This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone, dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. Ha <laughs> ha! When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures. Secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness, until... At length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt, I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently. But the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations. But the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew, they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think, but anything was better than this agony, 
anything was more tolerable than this derision, I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark! Louder! 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 Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart. End of The Telltale Heart Recording by Vince D. The Inn by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Inn by Guy de Maupassant Resembling in appearance all the wooden hostelries of the high Alps situated at the foot of glaciers in the barren rocky gorges that intersect the summits of the mountains, the Inn of Schwarenbach serves as a resting place for travellers crossing the Gemini Pass. It remains open for six months in the year and is inhabited by the family of Jean Hauser. Then, as soon as the snow begins to fall, and fill the valley so as to make the road down to Leche impossible, the father and his three sons go away and leave the house in charge of the old guide, Gaspard Hari, with the young guide, Ulrich Kunzi, and Sam, the great mountain dog. The two men and the dog remain till the spring in their snowy prison, with nothing before their eyes except the immense white slopes of the Balmhorn, surrounded by light, glistening summits, and are shut in, blocked up and buried by the snow which rises around them, and which envelops, binds, and crushes the little house, which lies piled on the roof, covering the windows, and blocking up the door. It was the day on which the house of family were going to return to Leche, as winter was approaching, and the descent was becoming dangerous. The three mules started first, laden with baggage and led by the three sons. Then the mother, Shena Hauser, and her daughter Louise mounted a fourth mule and set off in their turn, and the father followed them, accompanied by the two men in charge, who were to escort the family as far as the brow of the descent. First of all, they passed round the small lake, which was now frozen over, at the bottom of the mass of rocks which stretched in front of the inn, and then they followed the valley, which was dominated on all sides by the snow-covered summits. A ray of sunlight fell into that little white, glistening, frozen desert, and illuminated it with a cold and dazzling flame. No living thing appeared among this ocean of mountains. There was no motion in this immeasurable solitude, and no noise disturbed the profound silence. By degrees, the young guide, Ulrich Kunzi, a tall, long-legged Swiss, left old man Hauser and old Gaspard behind, in order to catch up the mule which bore the two women. The younger one looked at him as he approached, and appeared to be calling him with her sad eyes. She was a young, fair-haired, little peasant girl, whose milk-white cheeks and pale hair looked as if they had lost their colour by their long abode amid the ice. When he had got up to the animal she was riding, he put his hand on the crupper and relaxed his speed. Mother Hauser began to talk to him, enumerating with the minutest details all that he would have to attend to during the winter. It was the first time that he was going to stay up there, while old Harry had already spent fourteen winters amid the snow at the inn of Schwarenbach. Ulrich Kunzi listened, without appearing to understand, and looked incessantly at the girl. From time to time he replied, Yes, Madame Hauser, but his thoughts seemed far away, and his calm features remained unmoved. They reached Lake Dauber, whose broad frozen surface extended to the end of the valley. On the right one saw the black pointed rocky summits of the Dobenhorn 
beside the enormous moraines of the Lohmann Glacier, above which rose the Wildstrugel. As they approached the Gemini Pass, where the descent of the Lecher begins, they suddenly beheld the immense horizon of the Alps of the Valais, from which the broad, deep valley of the Rhone separated them. In the distance, there was a group of white, unequal, flat, or pointed mountain summits, which glistened in the sun. The Mischhabel, with its two peaks, the huge group of the Weisshorn, the heavy Brunaghorn, the lofty and formidable pyramid of Mount Servin, the slayer of men, and the Dent Blanche, that monstrous coquette. Then beneath them, in a tremendous hole, at the bottom of a terrific abyss, they perceived Lerche, where houses looked as grains of sand, which had been thrown into that enormous crevice that is ended and closed by the Gemini, and which opens down below, on the Rhone. The mule stopped at the edge of the path, which winds and turns continually, doubling backward, then, fantastically and strangely, along the side of the mountain, as far as the almost invisible little village at its feet. The women jumped into the snow, and the two old men joined them. Well, Father Hauser said, Goodbye, and keep your spirits till next year, my friends. And old Harry replied, Till next year. They embraced each other, and then Madame Hauser in her turn offered her cheek, and the girl did the same. When Ulrich Kunze's turn came, he whispered in Louise's ear, Do not forget those up yonder. And she replied, No, in such a low voice that he guessed what she had said without hearing it. Well, adieu, Jean Hauser repeated. And don't fall ill. And going before the two women, he commenced the descent, and soon all three disappeared at the first turn in the road, while the two men returned to the inn at Schwarenbach. They walked slowly, side by side, without speaking. It was over, and they would be alone together for four or five months. Then Gaspard Harry began to relate his life last winter. He had remained with Michael Cannell, who was too old to stand it, for an accident might happen during that long solitude. They had not been dull, however. The only thing was to make up one's mind to it from the first, and in the end one would find plenty of distraction, games, and other means of whiling away the time. Ulrich Kunsi listened to him with his eyes on the ground, for in his thoughts he was following those who were descending to the village. They soon came in sight of the inn, which was, however, scarcely visible, so small did it look, a black speck at the foot of that enormous billow of snow. And when they opened the door, Sam, the great curly dog, began to romp around them. Come, my boy, old Gaspard said, we have no women now so we must get our own dinner ready. Go and peel the potatoes. And they both sat down on wooden stools and began to prepare the soup. The next morning seemed very long to Kunsi. Old Harry smoked and spat on the hearth, while the young man looked out of the window at the snow-covered mountain opposite the house. In the afternoon he went out, and going over yesterday's ground again, he looked for the traces of the mule that had carried the two women. Then, when he had reached the Gemini Pass, he laid himself down on his stomach and looked at Lerche. The village, in its rocky pit, was not yet buried under the snow, from which it was sheltered by the pine woods which protected it on all sides. Its low houses looked like paving stones in a large meadow from above. Hauser's little daughter was there now, in one of those grey-coloured houses, in which Ulrich Kunze was too far away to be able to make them out separately. How he would have liked to go down while he was yet able. But the sun had disappeared behind the lofty crest of the wild struggle, and the young man returned to the chalet. Daddy Harry was smoking, 
and when he saw his maid come in, he proposed a game of cards to him, and they sat down opposite each other, on either side of the table. They played for a long time, a simple game called brisk, and then they had supper, and went to bed. The following days were like the first, bright and cold, without any fresh snow. Old Gaspard spent his afternoons in watching the eagles and other rare birds which ventured on those frozen heights, while Ulrich returned regularly to the Gemini Pass to look at the village. Then they played cards, dice or dominoes, and lost and won a trifle, just to create an interest in the game. One morning, Harry, who was up first, called his companion. A moving, deep and light cloud of white spray was falling on them, noiselessly, and was by degrees burying them under a thick, heavy coverlet of foam. That lasted four days and four nights. It was necessary to free the door and the windows, to dig out a passage, and to cut steps to get over this frozen powder, which a twelve hours' frost had made as hard as the granite of the moraines. They lived like prisoners, and did not venture outside their abode. They had divided their duties, which they performed regularly. Ulrich Kunsi undertook the scouring, washing, and everything that belonged to cleanliness. He also chopped up the wood, while Gaspard Harry did the cooking and attended to the fire. Their regular and monotonous work was interrupted by long games at cards or dice, and they never quarrelled, but were always calm and placid. They were never seen impatient or ill-humoured, nor did they ever use hard words, for they had laid in a stock of patience for their wintering on the top of the mountain. Sometimes old Gaspar took his rifle and went up to Shamor, and occasionally he killed one. Then there was a feast in the inn at Schwarenbach, and they reveled in fresh meat. One morning he went out as usual. The thermometer outside marked eighteen degrees of frost, and as the sun had not yet risen, the hunter hoped to surprise the animals at the approaches to the Wildstrubel and Ulrich, being alone, remained in bed until ten o'clock. He was of a sleepy nature, but he would not have dared to give way like that to his inclination in the presence of the old guide, who was ever an early riser. He breakfasted leisurely with Sam, who also spent his days and nights in sleeping in front of the fire, and then he felt low-spirited and ever frightened at the solitude and was seized by a longing for his daily game of cards, as one is by the craving of a confirmed habit, and so he went out to meet his companion, who was to return at four o'clock. The snow had levelled the whole deep valley, filled up the crevices, obliterated all signs of the two lakes, and covered the rocks, so that between the high summits there was nothing but an immense, white, regular, dazzling, and frozen surface. For three weeks, Ulrich had not been to the edge of the precipice from which he had looked down on the village, and he wanted to go there before climbing the slopes which led to Wildstrubel. Lecher was now covered by the snow, and the houses could scarcely be distinguished, covered as they were by that white cloak. Then, Turning to the right, he reached the Lohmann Glacier. He went along with the mountaineer's long strides, striking the snow, which was as hard as a rock, with his iron-pointed stick, and with his piercing eyes he looked for the little black moving speck in the distance on that enormous white expanse. When he reached the end of the glacier, he stopped and asked himself, whether the old man had taken that road, and then he began to walk along the moraines with rapid and uneasy steps. The day was declining. The snow was assuming a rosy tint, and a dry, frozen wind blew in rough gusts over its crystal surface. Ulrich uttered a long, shrill, vibrating call. His voice sped through the death-like silence in which the mountains were sleeping. It reached the distance, 
across profound and motionless waves of glacial foam, like the cry of a bird across the waves of the sea. Then it died away, and nothing answered him. He began to walk again. The sun had sunk yonder behind the mountain tops, which were still purple with the reflection from the sky, but the depths of the valley were becoming grey, and suddenly the young man felt frightened. It seemed to him as if the silence, the cold, the solitude, the winter death of these mountains were taking possession of him, were going to stop and to freeze his blood, to make his limbs grow stiff, and to turn him into a motionless and frozen object, and he set off running, fleeing toward his dwelling. The old man, he thought, would have returned during his absence. He had taken another road. He would, no doubt, be sitting before the fire, with a dead chamois at his feet. He soon came in sight of the inn, but no smoke rose from it. Ulrich walked faster and opened the door. Sam ran up to him to greet him, but Gaspard Harry had not returned. Kunsi, in his alarm, turned round suddenly, as if he had expected to find his comrade hidden in a corner. Then he relighted the fire and made the soup, hoping every moment to see the old man come in. From time to time he went out to see if he were not coming. It was quite night now that wan, livid night of the mountains, lighted by a thin yellow crescent moon, just disappearing behind the mountain tops. Then the young man went in and sat down to warm his hands and feet, while he pictured to himself every possible accident. Gaspard might have broken a leg, have fallen into a crevasse, taken a false step and dislocated his ankle and perhaps he was lying on the snow, overcome and stiff with the cold, in agony of mind, lost and, perhaps, shouting for help, calling with all his might in the silence of the night. But where? The mountain was so vast, so rugged, so dangerous in places, especially at that time of the year, that it would have required ten or twenty guides to walk for a week in all directions, to find a man in that immense space. Ulrich Kunsi, however, made up his mind to set out with Sam if Gaspar did not return by one in the morning, and he made his preparations. He put provisions for two days into a bag, took his steel climbing iron, tied a long, thin, strong rope round his waist, and looked to see that his iron shod stick and his axe, which served to cut steps in the ice, were in order. Then he waited. The fire was burning on the hearth. The great dog was snoring in front of it, and the clock was ticking. As regularly as a heart beating, in its resounding wooden case. He waited, with his ears on the alert for distant sounds, and he shivered when the wind blew against the roof and the walls. It struck twelve, and he trembled. Then, frightened and shivering, he put some water on the fire, so that he might have some hot coffee before starting, and when the clock struck one, he got up, woke Sam, opened the door, and went off in the direction of the wild struggle. For five hours he mounted, scaling the rocks by means of his climbing iron, cutting into the ice, advancing continually, and occasionally hauling up the dog, who remained below at the foot of some slope that was too steep for him, by means of the rope. It was about six o'clock when he reached one of the summits to which old Gaspard often came after Chamois, and he waited till it should be daylight. The sky was growing pale overhead, and a strange light, springing nobody could tell whence, suddenly illuminated the immense ocean of pale mountain summits, which extended for a hundred leagues around him. One might have said that this vague brightness arose from the snow itself and spread abroad in space. By degrees, the highest distant summits assumed a delicate pink flesh color, 
and the red sun appeared behind the ponderous giants of the Bernese Alps. Ulrich Kunsi set off again, walking like a hunter, bent over, looking for tracks, and saying to his dog, Seek, old fellow, seek. He was descending the mountain now, scanning the depths closely, and from time to time shouting, uttering a loud, prolonged cry, which soon died away in that silent vastness. Then he put his ear to the ground to listen. He thought he could distinguish a voice, and began to run, and shouted again, but he heard nothing more, and sat down, exhausted and in despair. Toward midday he breakfasted, and gave Sam, who was as tired as himself, something to eat also, and then he recommenced his search. When evening came, he was still walking, and he had walked more than thirty miles over the mountains. As he was too far away to return home, and too tired to drag himself along any further, he dug a hole in the snow and crouched in it with his dog under a blanket which he had brought with him, and the man and dog lay side by side, trying to keep warm, but frozen to the marrow nevertheless. Ulrich scarcely slept, his mind haunted by visions, and his limbs shaking with cold. Day was breaking when he got up. His legs were as stiff as iron bars, and his spirits so low, he was ready to cry with anguish, while his heart was beating, so that he almost fell over with agitation when he thought he heard a noise. Suddenly he imagined that he was also going to die of cold in the midst of this vast solitude, and the terror of such a death roused his energies and gave him renewed vigour. He was descending toward the inn, falling down and getting up again, and followed at a distance by Sam, who was limping on three legs, and they did not reach Schwarenbach till four o'clock in the afternoon. The house was empty and the young man made a fire, had something to eat, and went to sleep, so worn out that he did not think of anything more. He slept for a long time, for a very long time, an irresistible sleep. But suddenly a voice, a cry, a name, Ulrich, aroused him from his profound torpor, and made him sit up in bed. Had he been dreaming? Was it one of those strange appeals which cross the dreams of disquieted minds? No. He heard it still, that reverberating cry, which had entered his ears and remained in his flesh to the tips of his sinewy fingers. Certainly somebody had cried out and called, Ulrich! There was somebody there near the house. There could be no doubt of that and he opened the door and shouted, Is it you, Gaspard? with all the strength of his lungs. But there was no reply, no murmur, no groan. Nothing. It was quite dark, and the snow looked wan. The wind had risen, that icy wind that cracks the rocks and leaves nothing alive on those deserted heights, and it came in sudden gusts which were more parching and more deadly than the burning wind of the desert. And again Ulrich shouted, Gaspar! 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 And then he waited again. Everything was silent on the mountain. Then he shook with terror, and with a bound he was inside the inn, when he shut and bolted the door. And then he fell into a chair, trembling all over for he felt certain that his comrade had called him at the moment he was expiring. He was sure of that, as sure as one is of being alive or of eating a piece of bread. Old Gaspard Harry had been dying for two days and three nights somewhere, in some hole, in one of those deep, untrodden ravines whose whiteness is more sinister than subterranean darkness. He had been dying for two days and three nights, and he had just then died, 
thinking of his comrade. His soul, almost before it was released, had taken its flight to the inn where Ulrich was sleeping, and it had called him by that terrible and mysterious power which the spirits of the dead have to haunt the living. That voiceless soul had cried to the worn-out soul of the sleeper. It had uttered its last farewell, or its reproach, or its curse on the man who had not searched carefully enough. And Ulrich felt that it was there, quite close to him, behind the wall, behind the door, which he had just fastened. It was wandering about, like a night bird, which lightly touches a lighted window with his wings. And the terrified young man was ready to scream with horror. He wanted to run away, but he did not dare to go out. He did not dare, and he should never dare to do it in the future, for that phantom would remain there day and night, round the inn, as long as the old man's body was not recovered and had not been deposited in the consecrated earth of a churchyard. Where it was daylight, Kunsi recovered some of his courage at the return of the bright sun. He prepared his meal, gave his dog some food, and then remained motionless on a chair, tortured at heart as he thought of the old man lying on the snow. And then, as soon as night once more covered the mountains, new terrors assailed him. He now walked up and down the dark kitchen, which was scarcely lighted by the flame of one candle and he walked from one end of it to the other with great strides, listening, listening whether the terrible cry of the other night would again break the dreary silence outside. He felt himself alone, unhappy man, as no man had ever been alone before. He was alone in this immense desert of snow, about five thousand feet above the inhabited earth, above human habitation, above that stirring, noisy, palpitating life, alone under an icy sky. A mad longing impelled him to run away, no matter where, to get down to Lerche by flinging himself over the precipice. But he did not even dare to open the door, as he felt sure that the other, the dead man, would bar his road, so that he might not be obliged to remain up there alone. Toward midnight, tired with walking, worn out by grief and fear. He at last fell into a doze in his chair, for he was afraid of his bed, as one is of a haunted spot. But suddenly, the strident cry of the other evening pierced his ears, and it was so shrill that Ulrich stretched out his arms to repulse the ghost, and he fell backward with his chair. Sam who was awakened by the noise, began to howl as frightened dogs do howl, and he walked all about the house trying to find out where the danger came from. When he got to the door, he sniffed beneath it, smelling vigorously, with his coat bristling and his tail stiff, while he growled angrily. Kunsi, who was terrified, jumped up, and holding his chair by one leg, he cried, don't come in, don't come in, or I shall kill you. And the dog, excited by his threat, barked angrily at that invisible enemy who defied his master's voice. By degrees, however, he quieted down and came back and stretched himself in front of the fire. But he was uneasy, and he kept his head up and growled beneath his teeth. Ulrich, in turn, recovered his senses. But as he felt faint with terror, he went and got a bottle of brandy out of the sideboard. Then he drank off several glasses, one after another, at a gulp. His ideas became vague. His courage revived, and a feverish glow ran through his veins. He ate scarcely anything the next day and limited himself to alcohol. And so he lived for several days, like a drunken brute. 
As soon as he thought of Gaspard Harry, he began to drink again, and went on drinking until he fell to the ground, overcome by intoxication. And there he remained, lying on his face, dead drunk, his limbs benumbed and snoring loudly. But scarcely had he digested the maddening and burning liquor than the same cry, O oh, rake, woke him like a bullet piercing his brain, and he got up, still staggering, stretching out his hands to save himself from falling, and calling to Sam to help him. And the dog, who appeared to be going mad like his master, rushed to the door, scratched it with his claws, and gnawed it with his long white teeth, while the young man, with his head thrown back, drank the brandy in draughts, as if it had been cold water, so that it might by and by send his thoughts, his frantic terror, and his memory to sleep again. In three weeks he had consumed all his stock of ardent spirits, but his continual drunkenness only lulled his terror, which awoke more furiously than ever as soon as it was impossible for him to calm it. His fixed idea then which had been intensified by a month of drunkenness, and which was continually increasing in his absolute solitude, penetrated him like a gimlet. He now walked about the house like a wild beast in its cage, putting his ear to the door to listen if the other were there, and defying him through the wall. Then, as soon as he dozed, overcome by fatigue, he heard the voice which made him leap to his feet. At last, one night, as cowards do when driven to extremities, he sprang to the door and opened it to see who was calling him and to force him to keep quiet. But such a gust of cold wind blew into his face that it chilled him to the bone, and he closed and bolted the door immediately, without noticing that Sam had rushed out. Then, as he was shivering with cold, he threw some wood on the fire and sat down in front of it to warm himself. But suddenly he started, for something was scratching at the wall and crying. In desperation, he called out, Go away! but was answered by another long, sorrowful wail. Then all his remaining senses forsook him for sheer fright. He repeated, Go away! and turned round to try to find some corner in which to hide, while the other person went round the house to still, crying and rubbing against the wall. Ulrich went to the oak sideboard, which was full of plates and dishes and of provisions, and lifting it up with superhuman strength, he dragged it to the door so as to form a barricade. Then piling up all the rest of the furniture, the mattresses, palliasses and chairs, he stopped up the windows, as one does when assailed by an enemy. But the person outside now uttered long, plaintive, moanful groans, to which the young man replied by similar groans. And thus days and nights passed, without their ceasing to howl at each other. The one was continually walking round the house, and scraped the walls with his nails so vigorously that it seemed as if he wished to destroy them, while the other inside followed all his movements, stooping down and holding his ear to the walls and replying to all his appeals with terrible cries. One evening, however, Ulrich heard nothing more, and he sat down, so overcome by fatigue, that he went to sleep immediately and awoke in the morning without a thought without any recollection of what had happened, just as if his head had been emptied during his heavy sleep. But he felt hungry, and he ate. The winter was over, and the Gemini Pass was practicable again, so the house of family started off to return to their inn. As soon as they had reached the top of the ascent, the women mounted their mule, and spoke about the two men whom they would meet again shortly. They were indeed rather surprised, 
that neither of them had come down a few days before, as soon as the road was open, in order to tell them all about their long winter sojourn. At last, however, they saw the inn, still covered with snow like a quilt. The door and the window were closed, but a little smoke was coming out of the chimney, which reassured old Hauser. On going up to the door, however, he saw the skeleton of an animal which had been torn to pieces by the eagles, a large skeleton lying on its side. They all looked close at it, and the mother said, That must be Sam. And then she shouted, Hi, Gaspard! A cry from the interior of the house answered her, and a sharp cry that one might have thought some animal had uttered. Old Hauser repeated, Hi, Gaspard! and they heard another cry similar to the first. Then the three men, the father and the two sons, tried to open the door, but it resisted their efforts. From the empty cow stall they took a beam to serve as a battering ram and hurled it against the door with all their might. The wood gave way and the boards flew into splinters. Then the house was shaken by a loud voice, and inside, behind the sideboard which was overturned. They saw a man standing upright, with his hair falling on his shoulders, and a beard descending to his breast, with shining eyes, and nothing but rags to cover him. They did not recognize him, but Louise Hauser exclaimed, It is Ulrich, mother! And her mother declared that it was Ulrich, although his hair was white. He allowed them to go up to him and to touch him, but he did not reply to any of their questions, and they were obliged to take him to Lerche, where the doctors found that he was mad, and nobody ever found out what had become of his companion. Little Louise Hauser nearly died that summer of decline, which the physicians attributed to the cold air of the mountains. End of The Inn Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Ensouled Violin by Madame Blavatsky This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Ensouled Violin 1. In the year 1828, an old German, a music teacher, came to Paris with his pupil and settled unostentatiously in one of the quiet faubourgs of the metropolis. The first rejoiced in the name of Samuel Klaus, the second answered to the more poetical appellation of Franz Stenio. The younger man was a violinist, gifted, as rumour went, with extraordinary, almost miraculous talent. Yet, as he was poor, and had not hitherto made a name for himself in Europe, he remained for several years in the capital of France, the heart and pulse of capricious continental fashion, unknown and unappreciated. France was Styrian by birth, and, at the time of the event to be presently described, he was a young man, considerably under thirty, a philosopher and a dreamer by nature. Imbued with all the mystic oddities of true genius, he reminded one of some of the heroes in Hoffmann's Conte Fantastique. His earlier existence had been a very unusual, in fact quite an eccentric one, and its history must be briefly told, for the better understanding of the present story. Born of the very pious country people, in a quiet burg among the Styrian Alps, nursed by the native gnomes who watched over his cradle, growing up in the weird atmosphere of the ghouls and vampires who play such a prominent part in the household of every Styrian and Slavonian in southern Austria, educated later as a student in the shadow of the old Rhenish castles of Germany, Franz from his childhood 
had passed through every emotional stage on the plane of the so-called supernatural. He had also studied at one time the occult arts with an enthusiastic disciple of Paracelsus and Klunrath. Alchemy had few theoretical secrets from him, and he had dabbled in ceremonial magic and sorcery with some Hungarian Ziganis. Yet he loved, above all else, music, and above music, his violin. At the age of twenty-two, he suddenly gave up his practical studies in the occult, and from that day, though as devoted as ever in thought to the beautiful Grecian gods, he surrendered himself entirely to his art. Of his classical studies he had retained only that which related to the muses, Euterpe especially, at whose altar he worshipped, and Orpheus, whose magic lyre he tried to emulate with his violin. Except his dreamy belief in nymphs and the sirens, on account probably of the double relationship of the latter to the muses through Calliope and Orpheus, he was interested but little in matters of the sublunary world. All his aspirations mounted like incense with the wave of the heavenly harmony that he drew from his instrument to a higher and nobler sphere. He dreamed awake and lived a real though an enchanted life only during those hours when his magic bow carried him along the wave of sound to the pagan Olympus, to the feet of Euterpe. A strange child he had ever been in his own home, where tales of magic and witchcraft grow out of every inch of the soil. A still stranger boy he had become, until finally he had blossomed into manhood without one single characteristic of youth. Never had a fair face attracted his attention. Not for one moment had his thoughts turned from his solitary studies to a life beyond that of a mystic bohemian. Content with his own company, he had thus passed the best years of his youth and manhood with his violin for his chief idol, and with the gods and goddesses of old Greece for his audience, in perfect ignorance of practical life. His whole existence had been one long day of dreams, of melody and sunlight, and he had never felt any other aspirations. How useless! But oh, how glorious those dreams! How vivid! And why should he desire any better fate? Was he not all that he wanted to be, transformed in a second of thought into one or another hero, from Orpheus, who held all nature breathless, to the urchin who piped away under the plane tree, to the naiads of Calairo's crystal fountain? Did not the swift-footed nymphs frolic at his beck and call, to the sound of the magic flute of the Arcadian shepherd, who was himself. Behold, the goddess of love and beauty, herself descending from on high, attracted by the sweet-voiced notes of his violin. Yet there came a time when he preferred Syrinx to Aphrodite, not as a fair nymph pursued by Pan, but after her transformation by the merciful gods into the reed out of which the frustrated god of the shepherds had made his magic pipe. For also with time, ambition grows and is rarely satisfied. When he tried to emulate on his violin the enchanting sounds that resounded in his mind, the whole of Parnassus kept silent under the spell, or joined in heavenly chorus. But the audience he finally craved was composed of more than gods sung by Hesiod, verily of the most appreciative melomanes of European capitals. He felt jealous of the magic pipe, and would fain have had it at his command. Oh, that I could allure a nymph into my beloved violin, he often cried, after awakening from one of his daydreams. Oh, that I could only span in spirit flight the abyss of time. Oh, that I could find myself for one short day a partaker of the secret arts of the gods, a god myself in the sight and hearing of enraptured humanity, and having learned the mystery of the lyre of Orpheus, or secured within my violin a siren, thereby benefit mortals to my own glory. Thus having for long years dreamed in the company of the gods of his fancy, he now took to dreaming of the transitory glories of fame upon this earth. But at this time he was suddenly called home by his widowed mother from one of the German universities where he had lived for the last year or two. This was an event which brought his plans to an end at least so far as the immediate future was concerned. 
for he had hitherto drawn upon her alone for his meagre pittance, and his means were not sufficient for an independent life outside his native place. His return had a very unexpected result. His mother, whose only love he was on earth, died soon after she had welcomed her Benjamin back, and the good wives of the burg exercised their swift tongues for many a month as to the real causes of that death. Frau Stenio, before Franz's return, was a healthy, buxom, middle-aged body, strong and hearty. She was a pious and a God-fearing soul, too, who had never failed in saying her prayers, nor had missed an early Mass for years during his absence. On the first Sunday, after her son had settled at home, a day that she had been longing for, and had anticipated for months in joyous visions, in which she saw him kneeling by her side in the little church on the hill, she called him from the foot of the stairs. The hour had come when her pious dream was to be realized, and she was waiting for him, carefully wiping the dust from the prayer book he had used in his boyhood. But instead of Franz, it was his violin that responded to her call, mixing its sonorous voice with the rather cracked tones of the peal of the merry Sunday bells. The fond mother was somewhat shocked at hearing the prayer-inspiring sounds drowned by the weird, fantastic notes of the dance of the witches. They seemed to her so unearthly and mocking, but she almost fainted upon hearing the definite refusal of her well-beloved son to go to church. He never went to church, he coolly remarked. It was loss of time. Besides which, the loud peals of the old church organ jarred on his nerves. Nothing should induce him to submit to the torture of listening to that cracked organ. He was firm, and nothing could move him. To her supplications and remonstrances, he put an end by offering to play for her a hymn to the sun he had just composed. From that memorable Sunday morning, Frau Stenio lost her usual serenity of mind. She hastened to lay her sorrows and seek for consolation at the foot of the confessional, but that which she heard in response from the stern priest filled her gentle and unsophisticated soul with dismay and almost with despair. A feeling of fear, a sense of profound terror, which soon became a chronic state with her, pursued her from that moment. Her nights became disturbed and sleepless. Her days passed in prayer and lamentations. In her maternal anxiety for the salvation of her beloved son's soul and for his post-mortem welfare, she made a series of rash vows. Finding that neither the Latin petition to the Mother of God written for her by her spiritual adviser, nor yet the humble supplications in German, addressed by herself to every saint she had reason to believe was residing in paradise, worked the desired effect. She took to pilgrimages to distant shrines. During one of these journeys to a holy chapel situated high up in the mountains, she caught cold amidst the glaciers of the Tyro and redescended only to take to a sick bed, from which she arose no more. Frau Stenio's vow had led her, in one sense, to the desired result. The poor woman was now given an opportunity of seeking out in propria persona the saints she had believed in so well, and of pleading face to face for the recreant son, who refused adherence to them and to the church, scoffed at monk and confessional, and held the organ in such horror. Franz sincerely lamented his mother's death. Unaware of being the indirect cause of it, he felt no remorse, but selling the modest household goods and chattels, light in purse and heart, he resolved to travel on foot for a year or two before settling down to any definite profession. A hazy desire to see the great cities of Europe and to try his luck in France lurked at the bottom of his travelling project but his bohemian habits of life were too strong to be abruptly abandoned. He placed a small capital with the banker for a rainy day, and started on his pedestrian journey via Germany and Austria. His violin paid for his board and lodging in the inns and farms on his way, and he passed his days in the green fields and in the solemn silent woods, face to face with nature, dreaming all the time as usual, with his eyes open. During the three months of his pleasant travels to and fro, he never descended for one moment from Parnassus, but as an alchemist transmutes lead into gold, so he transformed everything on his way into a song of Hesiod or Anacreon. Every evening, while fiddling for his supper and bed, whether on a green lawn or in the hall of a rustic inn, his fancy changed the whole scene for him. 
Village swains and maidens became transfigured into Arcadian shepherds and nymphs. The sand-covered floor was now a green sward. The uncouth couple spinning round in a measured waltz with the wild grace of tamed bears became priests and priestesses of Topsichory. The bulky, cherry-cheeked, and blue-eyed daughters of rural Germany were the Hesperides, circling around the trees laden with the golden apples. Nor did the melodious strains of the Arcadian demigods, piping on their syrinxes, and audible but to his own enchanted ear, vanish with the dawn. For no sooner was the curtain of sleep raised from his eyes that he would sally forth into a new magic realm of daydreams. On his way to some dark and solemn pine forest, he played incessantly to himself and to everything else. He fiddled to the green hill, and forthwith the mountain and the moss-covered rocks moved forward to hear him the better, as they had done at the sound of the Orphean lyre. He fiddled to the merry-voiced brook, to the hurrying river, and both slackened their speed and stopped their waves, and, becoming silent, seemed to listen to him in an entranced rapture. Even the long-legged stork, who stood meditatively on one leg on the thatched top of the rustic mill, gravely resolving unto himself the problem of his too long existence, sent out after him a long and strident cry, screeching, Art thou Orpheus himself, O Stenio? It was a period of full bliss, of a daily and almost hourly exaltation. The last words of his dying mother, whispering to him of the horrors of eternal condemnation, had left him unaffected, and the only vision her warning evoked in him was that of Pluto. By a ready association of ideas, he saw the lord of the dark nether kingdom greeting him as he had greeted the husband of Eurydice before him. Charmed with the magic sounds of his violin, the wheel of the Ixion was at a standstill once more, thus affording relief to the wretched seducer of Juno, and giving the lie to those who claim eternity for the duration of the punishment of condemned sinners. He perceived Tantalus forgetting his never-ceasing thirst, and smacking his lips as he drank in the heaven-born melody, the stone of Sisyphus becoming motionless, the Furies themselves smiling on him, and the sovereign of the gloomy regions delighted, and awarding preference to his violin over the lyre of Orpheus. Taken no serieux, mythology thus seemed a decided antidote to fear, in the face of theological threats, especially when strengthened with an insane and passionate love of music. With Franz, Euterpe proved always victorious in every contest, I, even with hell itself. But there is an end to everything, and very soon Franz had to give up uninterrupted dreaming. He had reached the university town, where dwelt his old violin teacher, Samuel Klaus. When this antiquated musician found that his beloved and favorite pupil, Franz, had been left poor in purse and still poorer in earthly affections, he felt his strong attachment to the boy awaken with tenfold force. He took Franz to his heart and forthwith adopted him as his son. The old teacher reminded people of one of those grotesque figures which look as if they had just stepped out of some medieval panel, and yet Klaus, with his fantastic allures of a night goblin, had the most loving heart, as tender as that of a woman, and the self-sacrificing nature of an old Christian martyr. When Franz had briefly narrated to him the history of his last few years, the professor took him by the hand, and leading him into his study simply said, Stop with me, and put an end to your bohemian life. Make yourself famous. I am old and childless, and will be your father. Let us live together, and forget all save fame. And forthwith he offered to proceed with Franz to Paris, via several large German cities, where they would stop to give concerts. In a few days, Klaus succeeded in making Franz forget his vagrant life, and its artistic independence, and reawakened in his pupil his now dormant ambition and desire for worldly fame. Hitherto, since his mother's death, he had been content to receive applause only from the gods and goddesses who inhabited his vivid fancy. Now he began to crave once more for the admiration of mortals. Under the clever and careful training of old Klaus, his remarkable talent gained in strength and powerful charm with every day, and his reputation grew and expanded with every city and town wherein he made himself heard. His ambition was being rapidly idealized, 
the presiding genie of various musical centres to whose patronage his talent was submitted soon proclaimed him the one violinist of the day and the public declared loudly that he stood unrivalled by any one whom they had ever heard these laudations very soon made both master and pupil completely lose their heads but paris was less ready with such appreciation paris makes reputations for itself and will take none on faith they had been living in it for almost three years and were still climbing with difficulty the artist's calvary when an event occurred which put an end even to their most modest expectations the first arrival of niccolo paganini was suddenly heralded and threw lutetia into a convulsion of expectation the unparalleled artist arrived and all paris fell at once at his feet two now it is a well-known fact that a superstition born in the dark days of medieval superstition and surviving almost to the middle of the present century attributed all such abnormal out-of-the-way talent as that of paganini to supernatural agency every great and marvellous artist had been accused in his day of dealings with the devil a few instances will suffice to refresh the reader's memory tartini the great composer and violinist of the seventeenth century was denounced as one who got his best inspirations from the evil one with whom he was it was said in regular league the accusation was of course due to the almost magical impression he produced upon his audiences his inspired performance on the violin secured for him in his native country the title of master of nations the sonate du diable also called tartini's dream as every one who had heard it will be ready to testify is the most weird melody ever heard or invented hence the marvellous composition has become the source of endless legends nor were they entirely baseless since it was he himself who was shown to have originated them tartini confessed to have written it on awakening from a dream in which he had heard his sonata performed by satan for his benefit and in consequence of a bargain made with his infernal majesty several famous singers even whose exceptional voices struck the hearers with superstitious admiration have not escaped a like accusation pasta's splendid voice was attributed in her day to the fact that three months before her birth the diva's mother was carried during a trance to heaven and there treated to a vocal concert of seraphs malibran was indebted for her voice to saint cecilia while others said she owed it to a demon who watched over her cradle and sang the baby to sleep finally paganini the unrivalled performer the mean italian who like dryden's jubal striking on the corded shell forced the throngs that followed him to worship the divine sounds produced and made people say that less than a god could not dwell within the hollow of his violin paganini left a legend too the almost supernatural art of the greatest violin player that the world has ever known was often speculated upon never understood the effect produced by him on his audience was literally marvellous overpowering the great rossini is said to have wept like a sentimental german maiden on hearing him play for the first time the princess elisa of lucca a sister of the great napoleon in whose service paganini was as director of her private orchestra for a long time was unable to hear him play without fainting in women he produced nervous fits and hysterics at his will stout-hearted men he drove to frenzy he changed cowards into heroes and made the bravest soldiers feel like so many nervous schoolgirls it is to be wondered at then that hundreds of weird tales circulated for long years about and around the mysterious genoese that modern orpheus of europe one of these was especially ghastly it was rumored and was believed by more people than would probably like to confess it that the strings of his violin were made of human intestines according to all the rules and requirements of the black art exaggerated that this idea may seem to some it has nothing impossible in it and it is more than probable that it was this legend that led to the extraordinary events which we are about to narrate human organs are often used by the eastern black magician so called and it is an averred fact that some bengali tantrikas reciters of tantras or invocations to the demon as a reverend writer has described them use human corpses and certain internal and external organs pertaining to them as powerful magical agents for bad purposes 
however this may be, now that the magnetic and mesmeric potencies of hypnotism are recognized as facts by most physicians, it may be suggested with less danger than heretofore that the extraordinary effects of Paganini's violent playing were not perhaps entirely due to his talent and genius. The wonder and awe he so easily excited were as much caused by his external appearance, which had something weird and demoniacal in it, according to certain of his biographers, as by the inexpressible charm of his execution and his remarkable mechanical skill. The latter is demonstrated by his perfect imitation of a flagulet and his performance of long and magnificent melodies on the G-string alone. In this performance, which many an artist has tried to copy without success, he remains unrivaled to this day. It is owing to this remarkable appearance of his, termed by his friends eccentric, and by his two nervous victims diabolical, that he experienced great difficulties in refuting certain ugly rumors. These were credited far more easily in his day than they would be now. It was whispered throughout Italy, and even in his own native town, that Paganini had murdered his wife, and later on a mistress, both of whom he had loved passionately, and both of whom he had not hesitated to sacrifice to his fiendish ambition. He had made himself proficient in magic arts, it was asserted, and had succeeded thereby in imprisoning the souls of his two victims in his violin, his famous Cremona. It is maintained by the immediate friends of Ernest T. W. Hoffman, the celebrated author of Die Elixir de Toffel, Meister Martin, and other charming and mystical tales, that Councillor Crespel, in the violin of Cremona, was taken from the legend about Paganini. It is, as all who have read it know, the history of a celebrated violin into which the voice and the soul of a famous diva, a woman whom Crespel had loved and killed, had passed, and to which was added the voice of his beloved daughter, Antonia. Nor was this superstition utterly ungrounded, nor was Hoffman to be blamed for adopting it after he had heard Paganini's playing. The extraordinary facility with which the artist drew out of his instrument not only the most unearthly sounds, but positively human voices, justified the suspicion. Such effects might well have startled an audience and thrown terror into many a nervous heart. Add to this the impenetrable mystery connected with a certain period of Paganini's youth, and the most wild tales about him must be found in measure justifiable, and even excusable, especially among a nation whose ancestors knew the Borgias and the Medicis of black art fame. 3. In those pre-telegraphic days, newspapers were limited, and the wings of fame had a heavier flight than they have now. Franz had hardly heard of Paganini, and when he did, he swore he would rival, if not eclipse, the Genoese magician. Yes, he would either become the most famous of all living violinists, or he would break his instrument and put an end to his life at the same time. Old Klaus rejoiced at such a determination. He rubbed his hands in glee, and jumping about on his lame leg like a crippled satyr, he flattered and incensed his pupil, believing himself all the while to be performing a sacred duty to the holy and majestic cause of art. Upon first setting foot in Paris three years before, France had all but failed. Musical critics pronounced him a rising star, but had all agreed that he required a few more years' practice before he could hope to carry his audiences by storm. Therefore, after a desperate study of over two years and uninterrupted preparations, the Styrian artist had finally made himself ready for his first serious appearance in the great opera house, where a public concert before the exacting critics of the old world was to be held. At this critical moment, Paganini's arrival in the European metropolis placed an obstacle in the way of the realization of his hopes, and the old German professor wisely postponed his pupil's debut. At first he had simply smiled at the vile enthusiasm, the laudatory hymns sung about the Genoese violinist, and the almost superstitious awe with which his name was pronounced. But very soon, Paganini's name became a burning iron in the hearts of both the artists and a threatening phantom in the mind of Klaus. A few days more, and they shuddered at the very mention of their great rival, whose success became with every night more unprecedented. The first series of concerts was over but neither Klaus nor Franz had as yet had an opportunity of hearing him and of judging for themselves. So great and so beyond their means was the charge for admission, 
and so small the hope of getting a free pass from a brother artist justly regarded as the meanest of men in monetary transactions that they had to wait for a chance, as did so many others. But the day came when neither master nor pupil could control their impatience any longer, so they pawned their watches and with the proceeds bought two modest seats. Who can describe the enthusiasm, the triumphs of this famous and at the same time fatal night? The audience was frantic, men wept and women screamed and fainted, while both Klaus and Stenio sat looking paler than two ghosts. At the first touch of Paganini's magic bow, both Franz and Samuel felt as if the icy hand of death had touched them. Carried away by an irresistible enthusiasm which turned into a violent, unearthly mental torture, they dared neither look into each other's faces nor exchange one word during the whole performance. At midnight, while the chosen delegates of the musical societies and the Conservatory of Paris unhitched their horses and dragged the carriage of the grand artist home in triumph, the two Germans returned to their modest lodging, and it was a pitiful sight to see them. Mournful and desperate, they placed themselves in their usual seats at the fire corner, and neither for a while opened his mouth. Samuel! at last exclaimed Franz, pale as death itself. Samuel! It remains for us now but to die. Do you hear me? We are worthless. We were too madmen to have ever hoped that anyone in this world would ever rival him. The name of Paganini stuck in his throat. As in utter despair, he fell into his armchair. The old professor's wrinkles suddenly became purple. His little greenish eyes gleamed phosphorescently as, bending toward his pupil, he whispered to him in hoarse and broken tones, Nine, nine, thou art wrong, my Franz. I have taught thee, and thou hast learned all of the great art that a simple mortal and a Christian by baptism can learn from another simple mortal. Am I to blame because these accursed Italians, in order to reign unequaled in the domain of art, have recourse to Satan and the diabolical effects of black magic? Franz turned his eyes upon his old master. There was a sinister light burning in those glittering orbs, a light telling plainly that, to secure such a power, he too would not scruple to sell himself body and soul to the evil one. But he said not a word, and turning his eyes from his old master's face, he gazed dreamily at the dying embers. The same long-forgotten incoherent dreams, which after seeming such realities to him in his younger days, had been given up entirely, and had gradually faded from his mind, now crowded back into it with the same force and vividness as of old. The grimacing shades of Ixion, Sisyphus, and Tantalus resurrected, and stood before him, saying, What matters hell in which thou believest not? And even if hell there be, it is the hell described by the old Greeks, not that of the modern bigots, a locality full of conscious shadows to whom thou canst be a second Orpheus. Franz felt that he was going mad, and, turning instinctively, he looked his old master once more right in the face. Then his bloodshot eye evaded the gaze of Klaus. Whether Samuel understood the terrible state of mind of his pupil, or whether he wanted to draw him out, to make him speak, and thus to divert his thoughts, must remain as hypothetical to the reader as it is to the writer. Whatever may have been in his mind, the German enthusiast went on, speaking with a faint calmness. Franz, my dear boy, I tell you that the art of the accursed Italian is not natural, that it is due neither to study nor to genius. It never was acquired in the usual natural way. You need not stare at me in that wild manner, for what I say is in the mouth of millions of people. Listen to what I now tell you, and try to understand. You have heard the strange tale whispered about the famous Tartini. He died one fine Sabbath night strangled by his familiar demon, who had taught him how to endow his violin with a human voice, by shutting up in it, by means of incantation, the soul of a young virgin. Paganini did more. In order to endow his instrument with the faculty of emitting human sounds, such as sobs, despairing cries, supplications, moans of love and fury, in short, the most heart-rending notes of the human voice, Paganini became the murderer not only of his wife and his mistress, but also of a friend, who was more tenderly attached to him than any other being on this earth. 
He then made the four chords of his magic violin out of the intestines of his last victim. This is the secret of his enchanting talent, of that overpowering melody, that combination of sounds which you will never be able to master unless... The old man could not finish his sentence. He staggered back before the fiendish look of his pupil and covered his face with his hands. Franz was breathing heavily, and his eyes had an expression which reminded Klaus of those of a hyena. His pallor was cadaverous. For some time he could not speak, but only gasped for breath. At last he slowly muttered, Are you in earnest? I am, as I hope to help you. And, and do you really believe that had I only the means of obtaining human intestines for strings, I could rival Paganini? asked Franz, after a moment's pause, and casting down his eyes. The old German unveiled his face, and with a strange look of determination upon it, softly answered, Human intestines alone are not sufficient for our purpose. They must have belonged to someone who had loved us well, with an unselfish, holy love. Tartini endowed his violin with the life of a virgin, but that virgin had died of unrequited love for him. The fiendish artist had prepared beforehand a tube, in which he managed to catch her last breath as she expired, pronouncing his beloved name, and then he transferred this breath to his violin. As to Paganini, I have just told you his tale. It was with the consent of his victim, though, that he murdered him to get possession of his intestines. Oh, for the power of the human voice, Samuel went on after a brief pause. What can equal the eloquence, the magic spell of the human voice? Do you think, my poor boy, I would not have taught you this great, this final secret, were it not that it throws one right into the clutches of him who must remain unnamed at night? He added with a sudden return to the superstitions of his youth. Franz did not answer, but with a calmness awful to behold, he left his place, took down his violin from the wall where it was hanging, and with one powerful grasp of the cords, he tore them out and flung them into the fire. Samuel suppressed a cry of horror. The cords were hissing upon the coals, where among the blazing logs they wriggled and curled like so many living snakes. By the witches of Thessaly and the dark arts of Circe, he exclaimed with foaming mouth and his eyes burning like coals, by the furies of hell and Pluto himself, I now swear in thy presence, O Samuel, my master, never to touch a violin again until I can string it with four human cords. May I be accursed for ever and ever if I do. He fell senseless on the floor with a deep sob that ended like a funeral wail. Old Samuel lifted him up as he would have lifted a child and carried him to his bed. Then he sallied forth in search of a physician. 4. For several days after this painful scene, Franz was very ill, ill almost beyond recovery. The physician declared him to be suffering from brain fever, and said that the worst was to be feared. For nine long days the patient remained delirious, and Klaus, who was nursing him night and day, with the solicitude of the tenderest mother, was horrified at the work of his own hands. For the first time since their acquaintance began, the old teacher, owing to the wild ravings of his pupil, was able to penetrate into the darkest corners of that weird, superstitious, cold, and at the same time passionate nature, and he trembled at what he discovered. For he saw that which he had failed to perceive before. Franz, as he was in reality, and not as he seemed to superficial observers. Music was the life of the young man, and adulation was the air he breathed, without which that life became a burden, from the chords of his violin alone, Stenio drew his life and being, but the applause of men and even of gods was necessary to its support. He saw unveiled before his eyes a genuine, artistic, earthly soul, with its divine counterpart totally absent, a son of the muses, all fancy and brain poetry, but without a heart. While listening to the ravings of that delirious and unhinged fancy, Klaus felt as if he were, for the first time in his long life, exploring a marvellous and untravelled region, a human nature not of this world, but of some incomplete planet. He saw all this and shuddered. More than once he asked himself whether it would not be doing a kindness to this boy to let him die before he returned to consciousness. But he loved his pupil too well to dwell for long on such an idea. Franz had bewitched his truly artistic nature, 
and now old Klaus felt as though their two lives were inseparably linked together. That he could thus feel was a revelation to the old man, so he decided to save Franz, even at the expense of his own old and, as he thought, useless life. The seventh day of the illness brought on a most terrible crisis. For twenty-four hours the patient never closed his eyes, nor remained for a moment silent. He raved continuously during the whole time. His visions were peculiar, and he minutely described each. Fantastic, ghastly figures kept slowly swimming out of the penumbra of his small, dark room in regular and uninterrupted procession, and he greeted each by name as he might greet old acquaintances. He referred to himself as Prometheus, bound to the rock by four bands made of human intestines. At the foot of the Caucasian mount the black waters of the river Styx were running. They had deserted Arcadia, and were now endeavouring to encircle within a sevenfold embrace the rock upon which he was suffering. "'Wouldst thou know the name of the Promethean rock, old man?' he rode into his adopted father's ear. "'Listen, then. Its name is called Samuel Klaus.' "'Yes, yes,' the German murmured disconsolately. "'It is I who killed him while seeking to console.' The news of Paganini's magic arts struck his fancy too vividly. Oh, my boy, my poor boy! Ha, 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 ha! The patient broke into a loud and discordant laugh. I, poor old man, sayest thou? So, so, thou art of poor stuff, anyhow, and wouldst look well only when stretched upon a frying Cremona violin. Klaus shuddered, but said nothing. He only bent over the poor maniac, and with a kiss upon his brow, a caress as tender and as gentle as that of a doting mother, he left the sick room for a few instants to seek relief in his own garret. When he returned, the ravings were following another channel. Franz was singing, trying to imitate the sounds of a violin. Toward the evening of that day the delirium of the sick man became perfectly ghastly. He saw spirits of fire clutching at his violin. Their skeleton hands, from each finger of which grew a flaming claw, beckoned to old Samuel. They approached and surrounded the old master, and were preparing to rip him open. Him, the only man on this earth who loves me with an unselfish holy love, and whose intestines can be of any good at all. He went on whispering, with glaring eyes and demon laugh. By the next morning, however, the fever had disappeared, and by the end of the ninth day Stenio had left his bed, having no recollection of his illness, and no suspicion that he had allowed Klaus to read his inner thought. Nay, had he himself any knowledge that such a horrible idea as the sacrifice of his old master to his ambition had ever entered his mind? Hardly. The only immediate result of his fatal illness was that as, by reason of his vow, his artistic passion could find no issue. Another passion awoke, which might avail to feed his ambition and his insatiable fancy. He plunged headlong into the study of the occult arts, of alchemy and of magic. In the practice of magic, the young dreamer sought to stifle the voice of his passionate longing for his, as he thought, forever lost violin. Weeks and months passed away, and the conversation about Paganini was never resumed between the master and the pupil. But a profound melancholy had taken possession of Franz. The two hardly exchanged a word. The violin hung mute, cordless, full of dust in its habitual place. It was as the presence of a soulless corpse between them. The young man had become gloomy and sarcastic, even avoiding the mention of music. Once, as his old professor, after long hesitation, took out his own violin from its dust-covered case and prepared to play, Franz gave a convulsive shudder, but said nothing. At the first notes of the bow, however, he glared like a madman, and rushing out of the house remained for hours wandering in the streets. Then old Samuel, in his turn, threw his instrument down and locked himself up in his room till the following morning. One night as Franz sat, looking particularly pale and gloomy, old Samuel suddenly jumped from his seat, and after hopping about the room in a magpie fashion, approached his pupil, imprinted a fond kiss upon the young man's brow, and squeaked at the top of his shrill voice, "'Is it not time to put an end to all this?' Thereupon, starting from his usual lethargy, Franz echoed as in a dream. Yes, it is time to put an end to this. Upon which the two separated and went to bed. 
On the following morning, when Franz awoke, he was astonished not to see his old teacher in his usual place to greet him. But he had greatly altered during the last few months, and he at first paid no attention to his absence, unusual as it was. He dressed and went into the adjoining room, a little parlour where they had had their meals, and which separated their two bedrooms. The fire had not been lighted since the embers had died out the previous night, and no sign was any way visible of the professor's busy hand in his usual housekeeping duties. Greatly puzzled, but in no way dismayed, Franz took his usual place at the corner of the now cold fireplace, and fell into an aimless reverie. As he stretched himself in his old armchair, raising both his hands to clasp them behind his head in a favourite posture of his, his hand came into contact with something on a shelf at his back. He knocked against a case and brought it violently on the ground. It was old Klaus's violin case that came down to the floor with a sudden crash that the case opened and the violin fell out of it rolling to the feet of Franz. And then the chords striking against the brass fender emitted a sound, prolonged, sad and mournful as the sigh of an unrestful soul. It seemed to fill the whole room and reverberated in the head and the very heart of the young man. The effect of that broken violin string was magical. Samuel! cried Stenio, with his eyes starting from their sockets, and an unknown terror suddenly taking possession of his whole being. Samuel, what has happened? My good, my dear old master, he called out, hastening to the professor's little room, and throwing the door violently open. No one answered. All was silent within. He staggered back, frightened at the sound of his own voice, so changed and hoarse it seemed to him at this moment. No reply came in response to his call. Naught followed but a dead silence, that stillness which in the domain of sounds usually denotes death. In the presence of a corpse, as in the lugubrious stillness of a tomb, such silence acquires a mysterious power, which strikes the sensitive soul with a nameless terror. The little room was dark, and Franz hastened to open the shutters. Samuel was lying on his bed, cold, stiff, and lifeless. At the sight of the corpse of him who had loved him so well, and had been to him more than a father, Franz experienced a dreadful revulsion of feeling, a terrible shock. But the ambition of the fanatical artist got the better of the despair of the man, and smothered the feelings of the latter in a few seconds. A note bearing his own name was conspicuously placed upon a table near the corpse. With trembling hand, the violinist tore open the envelope and read the following. My beloved son, Franz, when you read this, I shall have made the greatest sacrifice that your best and only friend and teacher could have accomplished for your fame. He who loved you most is now but an inanimate lump of clay. Of your old teacher there now remains but a clod of cold organic matter. I need not prompt you as to what you have to do with it. Fear, not stupid prejudices. It is for your future fame that I have made an offering of my body and you would be guilty of the blackest ingratitude were you now to render useless the sacrifice. When you shall have replaced the chords upon your violin, and these chords a portion of my own self, under your touch it will acquire the power of that accursed sorcerer, all the magic voices of Paganini's instrument. You will find therein my voice, my sighs and groans, my song of welcome, the prayerful sobs of my infinite and sorrowful sympathy, my love for you. And now, my friends, fear nobody. Take your instrument with you, and dog the steps of him who filled our lives with bitterness and despair. Appear in every arena, where hitherto he has reigned without a rival, and bravely throw the gauntlet of defiance in his face. O Franz, then only wilt thou hear with what a magic power the full notes of unselfish love will issue forth from thy violin. Perchance, with a last caressing touch of its chords, thou wilt remember that they once formed a portion of thine old teacher, who now embraces and blesses thee for the last time. Samuel. Two burning tears sparkled in the eyes of Franz, but they dried up instantly. Under the fiery rush of passionate hope and pride, the two orbs of the future magician artist, riveted to the ghastly face of the old man, shone like the eyes of a demon. Our pen refuses to describe that which took place on that day, 
after the legal inquiry was over. As another note written with the view of satisfying the authorities had been prudently provided by the loving care of the old teacher, the verdict was suicide from causes unknown. After this the coroner and the police retired, leaving the bereaved heir alone in the death room with the remains of that which had once been a living man. Scarcely a fortnight had elapsed from that day, ere the violin had been dusted, and four new stout strings had been stretched upon it. Franz dared not look at them. He tried to play, but the bow trembled in his hand like a dagger in the grasp of a novice brigand. He then determined not to try again, until the portentous night should arrive, when he should have a chance of rivaling, nay, of surpassing Paganini. The famous violinist had meanwhile left Paris and was giving a series of triumphant concerts at an old Flemish town in Belgium. 5. One night, as Paganini, surrounded by a crowd of admirers, was sitting in the dining room of the hotel at which he was staying, a visiting card with a few words written on it in pencil was handed to him by a young man with wild staring eyes. Fixing upon the intruder a look which few persons could bear, but receiving back a glance as calm and determined as his own, Paganini slightly bowed, and then dryly said, Sir, it shall be as you desire. Name the night. I am at your service. On the following morning, the whole town was startled by the appearance of bills posted at the corner of every street and bearing the strange notice. On the night of, at the Grand Theatre of, and for the first time will appear before the public Franz Stenio, a German violinist, arrived purposely to throw down the gauntlet to the world-famous Paganini and to challenge him to a duel upon their violence. He purposes to compete with the great virtuoso in the execution of the most difficult of his compositions. The famous Paganini has accepted the challenge. Franz Tenio will play, in competition with the unrivaled violinist, the celebrated Fantasy Caprice of the latter, known as the Witches. The effect of the notice was magical. Paganini, who amid his greatest triumphs never lost sight of a profitable speculation, doubled the usual price of admission but still the theatre could not hold the crowds that flocked to secure tickets for that memorable performance. At last the morning of the concert day dawned, and the duel was in everyone's mouth. Franz Tenier, who, instead of sleeping, had passed the whole long hours of the preceding midnight in walking up and down his room like an encaged panther, had toward morning fallen on his bed from mere physical exhaustion. Gradually he passed into a death-like and dreamless slumber. At the gloomy winter dawn he awoke, but finding it too early to rise he fell asleep again. And then he had a vivid dream, so vivid indeed, so lifelike, that from its terrible realism he felt sure that it was a vision rather than a dream. He had left his violin on a table by his bedside, locked in its case, the key of which never left him. Since he had strung it with those terrible chords, he never let it out of his sight for a moment. In accordance with this resolution, he had not touched it since his first trial, and his bow had never but once touched the human strings, for he had since always practiced on another instrument. But now in his sleep he saw himself looking at the locked case. Something in it was attracting his attention, and he found himself incapable of detaching his eyes from it. Suddenly he saw the upper part of the case slowly rising, and within the chink thus produced, he perceived two small phosphorescent green eyes, eyes but too familiar to him, fixing themselves on his lovingly, almost beseechingly. Then a thin, shrill voice, as if issuing from these ghastly orbs, the voice and orbs of Samuel Klaus himself, resounded in Stenio's horrified ear, and he heard it say, Franz, my beloved boy, Franz, I cannot, no, I cannot separate myself from them and they twanged piteously inside the case. Franz stood speechless, horror-bound. He felt his blood actually freezing, and his hair moving and standing erect on his head. It's but a dream, an empty dream, he attempted to formulate in his mind. I have tried my best, Franzchen. I have tried my best to sever myself from these accursed strings without pulling them to pieces, pleaded the same shrill, familiar voice. Wilt thou help me to do so? Another twang, 
still more prolonged and dismal, resounded within the case, now dragged about the table in every direction by some interior power, like some living, wriggling thing, the twangs becoming sharper and more jerky with every new pull. It was not for the first time that Stenio heard these sounds. He had often remarked them before. Indeed, ever since he had used his master's viscera as a footstool for his own ambition. But on every occasion a feeling of creeping horror had prevented him from investigating their cause, and he had tried to assure himself that the sounds were only a hallucination. But now he stood face to face with the terrible fact, whether in dream or in reality he knew not, nor did he care, since the hallucination, if hallucination it were, was far more real and vivid than any reality. He tried to speak, to take a step forward, but as often happens in nightmares, he could neither utter a word nor move a finger. He felt hopelessly paralyzed. The pulls and jerks became even more desperate with each moment, and at last something inside the case snapped violently. The vision of his Stradivarius, devoid of its magical strings, flashed before his eyes, throwing himself into a cold sweat of mute and unspeakable terror. He made a superhuman effort to rid himself of the incubus that held him spellbound, but at the last supplicating whisper of the invisible presence repeated, Do, oh do, help me to cut myself off. Franz sprang to the case with one bound like an enraged tiger defending its prey, and with one frantic effort breaking the spell. Leave the violin alone, you old fiend from hell, he cried, in hoarse and trembling tones. He violently shut down the self-raising lid, while firmly pressing his left hand on it, he seized with the right a piece of rosin from the table, and drew on the leather-covered top the sign of the six-pointed star, the seal used by King Solomon to bottle up the rebellious jinns inside their prisons. A wail, like the howl of a she-wolf mourning over her dead little ones, came out of the violin case. "'Thou art ungrateful, very ungrateful, my Franz,' sobbed the blubbering spirit voice. "'But I forgive, for I still love thee well. Yet thou canst not shut me in, boy, behold!' And instantly a greyish mist spread over and covered case and table, and rising upward formed itself into an indistinct shape. Then it began growing, and as it grew, Franz felt himself gradually enfolded in cold and damp coils, slimy as those of a huge snake. He gave a terrible cry, and awoke. But strangely enough, not on his bed, but near the table, just as he had dreamed, pressing the violin case desperately with both hands. It was but a dream, after all, he muttered, still terrified but relieved of the load on his heaving breast. With a tremendous effort he composed himself, and unlocked the case to inspect the violin. He found it covered with dust, but otherwise sound and in order, and he suddenly felt himself as cool and as determined as ever. Having dusted the instrument, he carefully rosined the bow, tightened the strings and tuned them. He even went so far as to try upon it the first notes of the witches, first cautiously and timidly then using his bow boldly and with full force. The sound of that loud, solitary note, defined as the war-trumpet of a conqueror, sweet and majestic as the touch of a seraph on his golden harp, in the fancy of the faithful, thrilled through the very soul of Franz. It revealed to him a hitherto unsuspected potency in his bow, which ran on in strains that filled the room with the richest swell of melody, unheard by the artist until that night. Commencing in uninterrupted legato tones, his bow sang to him of sun-bright hope and beauty, of moonlit nights, when the soft and balmy stillness endowed every blade of grass, and all things animate and inanimate, with a voice and a song of love. For a few brief moments it was a torrent of melody, the harmony of which, tuned to soft woe, was calculated to make mountains weep, had there been any in the room, and to soothe even the inexorable powers of hell, the presence of which was undeniably felt in this modest hotel room. Suddenly the solemn legato chant, contrary to all laws of harmony, quivered, became arpeggios, and ended in shrill staccatos like the notes of a hyena laugh. The same creeping sensation of terror as he had felt before came over him, 
and Franz threw the bow away. He had recognized the familiar laugh and would have no more of it. Dressing, he locked the bedeviled violin securely in its case, and taking it with him to the dining room, determined to await quietly the hour of trial. 6. The terrible hour of the struggle had come, and Stenio was at his post, calm, resolute, almost smiling. The theatre was crowded to suffocation, and there was not even standing room to be got for any amount of hard cash or favouritism. The singular challenge had reached every quarter to which the post could carry it, and gold flowed freely into Paganini's unfathomable pockets to an extent almost satisfying, even to his insatiate and venal soul. It was arranged that Paganini should begin. When he appeared upon the stage, the thick walls of the theatre shook to their foundations with the applause that greeted him. He began and ended his famous composition, The Witches, amid a storm of cheers. The shouts of public enthusiasm lasted so long that Franz began to think his turn would never come. When at last Paganini, amid the roaring applause of a frantic public, was allowed to retire behind the scenes, his eyes fell upon Stenio, who was tuning his violin, and he felt amazed at the serene calmness, the air of assurance of the unknown German artist. When Franz approached the footlights, he was received with icy coldness. But for all that, he did not feel in the least disconcerted. He looked very pale, but his thin white lips wore a scornful smile as response to this dumb unwelcome. He was sure of his triumph. At the first notes of the prelude of the witches, a thrill of astonishment passed over the audience. It was Paganini's touch, and it was something more. Some, and they were the majority, thought that never in his best moments of inspiration had the Italian artist himself, in executing that diabolical composition of his, exhibited such an extraordinary diabolical power. Under the pressure of the long muscular fingers of Franz, the cords shivered like the palpitating intestines of a disemboweled victim under the vivisector's knife. They moaned melodiously, like a dying child. The large blue eye of the artist, fixed with a satanic expression upon the sounding board, seemed to summon forth Orpheus himself from the infernal regions, rather than the musical notes supposed to be generated in the depths of the violin. Sounds seemed to transform themselves into objective shapes, thickly and precipitately gathering as at the evocation of a mighty magician, and to be whirling around him like a host of fantastic infernal figures dancing the witch's goat dance. In the empty depths of the shadowy background of the stage, behind the artist, a nameless phantasmagoria produced by the concussion of unearthly vibrations seemed to form pictures of shameless orgies, of the voluptuous hymens of a real witch's sabbat. A collective hallucination took hold of the public, panting for breath, ghastly and trickling with the icy perspiration of an inexpressible horror, they sat spellbound and unable to break the spell of the music by the slightest motion. They experienced all the illicit, enervating delights of the paradise of Muhammad, and came into the disordered fancy of an opium-eating Muslim, and felt at the same time the abject terror, the agony of one who struggles against an attack of delirium tremens. Many ladies shrieked aloud, others fainted, and strong men gnashed their teeth in a state of utter helplessness. Then came the finale. Thundering, uninterrupted applause delayed its beginning, expanding the momentary pause to a duration of almost a quarter of an hour. The bravos were furious, almost hysterical. At last, after a profound and last bow, Stenio, whose smile was as sardonic as it was triumphant, lifted his bow to attack his famous finale, his eyes fell upon Paganini, who, calmly seated in the manager's box, had been behind none in zealous applause. The small and piercing black eyes of the Genoese artist were riveted to the Stadivarius in the hands of Franz, but otherwise he seemed quite cool and unconcerned. His rival's face troubled him for one short instant, but he regained his self-possession, and, lifting once more his bow, drew the final note. Then the public enthusiasm reached its acme, and soon knew no bounds. The listeners heard and saw indeed. The witches' voices resounded in the air, and beyond all the other voices, one voice was heard. 
discordant and unlike to human sounds it seemed of dogs the bark of wolves the howl the doleful screechings of the midnight owl the hiss of snakes the hungry lions roar the sounds of billows beating on the shore the groan of winds among the leafy wood and burst of thunder from the rending cloud twas these all these in one the magic bow was drawing forth its last quivering sounds famous among prodigious musical feats imitating the precipitate flight of the witches before bright dawn of the unholy women saturated with the fumes of their nocturnal saturnalia when a strange thing came to pass on stage without the slightest transition the notes suddenly changed in their aerial flight of ascension and descent their melody was unexpectedly altered in character the sounds became confused scattered disconnected and then it seemed from the sounding board of the violin came out squeaking jarring tones like those of a street punch a screaming at the top of a senile voice art thou satisfied franz my boy have not i gloriously kept my promise eh the spell was broken though still unable to realize the whole situation those who heard the voice and the punchinello like tones were freed as by enchantment from the terrible charm under which they had been held loud roars of laughter mocking exclamations of half anger and half irritation were now heard from every corner of the vast theatre the musicians in the orchestra with faces still blanched from weird emotions were now seen shaking with laughter and the whole audience rose like one man from their seats unable yet to solve the enigma they felt nevertheless too disgusted too disposed to laugh to remain one moment longer in the building but suddenly the sea of moving heads in the stalls and the pit became once more motionless and stood petrified as though struck by lightning what all saw was terrible enough the handsome though wild face of the young artist suddenly aged and his graceful erect figure bent down as though under the weight of years but this was nothing to that which some of the most sensitive clearly perceived franz tenure's person was now entirely enveloped in a semi-transparent mist cloud-like creeping with serpentine motion and gradually tightening round the living form as though ready to engulf him and there were those also who discerned in this tall and ominous pillar of smoke a clearly defined figure a form showing the unmistakable outlines of a grotesque and grinning a terribly awful-looking old man whose viscera were protruding and the ends of the intestines stretched on the violin within this hazy quivering veil the violinist was then seen driving his bow furiously across the human cords with the contortions of, of a demoniac as we see them represented on medieval cathedral paintings an indescribable panic swept over the audience and breaking now for the last time through the spell which had again bound them motionless every living creature in the theatre made one mad rush towards the door it was like the sudden outburst of a dam a human torrent roaring amid a shower of discordant notes idiotic squeakings prolonged and whining moans cacophonous cries of frenzy above which like the detonations of pistol shots was heard the consecutive bursting of the four strings stretched upon the soundboard of that bewitched violin when the theatre was emptied of the last man of the audience the terrified manager rushed on the stage in search of the unfortunate performer he was found dead and already stiff behind the footlights twisted up into the most unnatural of postures with the cat guts wound curiously around his neck and his violin shattered into a thousand fragments when it became publicly known that the unfortunate would-be rival of nicolo paganini had not left a cent to pay for his funeral or his hotel bill the genoese his proverbial meanness notwithstanding settled the hotel bill and had poor stenio buried at his own expense he claimed however in exchange the fragments of the stradivarius as a memento of the strange event end of the ensouled violin by madame blavatsky read for you by chiquito crasto Birmingham, Alabama. The Monkey's Paw 
by W. W. Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank. The Monkey's Paw by W. W. Jacobs. Without, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of Laburnum Villa the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils, that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. "'Hark at the wind,' said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. "'I'm listening,' said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. "'Check.' "'I should hardly think that he'd come to-night,' said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out, bawled Mr. White, with sudden and unlooked-for violence. Of all the beastly, slushy, out-of-the-way places to live in, this is the worst. Pathway's a bog, and the road's a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses in the road are let, they think it doesn't matter. "'Never mind, dear,' said his wife soothingly. "'Perhaps you'll win the next one.' Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. "'There he is,' said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly, and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The old man rose with hospitable haste, and opening the door was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said, Tut, tut, and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, he said, introducing him. The Sergeant Major shook hands and taking the preferred seat by the fire, watched contentedly while his host got out whiskey and tumblers, and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk, the little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair, and spoke of wild scenes and dofty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it,' said Mr. White, nodding at his wife and son. "'When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him.' "'He don't look to have taken much harm,' said Mrs. White politely. "'I'd like to go to India myself,' said the old man. "'Just to look round a bit, you know.' "'Better where you are,' said the sergeant-major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass, and, sighing softly, shook it again. "'I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers,' said the old man. "'What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris?' "'Nothing,' said the soldier hastily. "'Leastways nothing worth hearing.' "'Monkey's paw?' said Mrs. White curiously. "'Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps,' said the sergeant-major offhandedly. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips, and then set it down again. His host filled it for him. "'To look at,' said the sergeant-major, fumbling in his pocket, it's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. "'And what is there special about it?' inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son, 
and having examined it, placed it upon the table. "'It had a spell put on it by an old fakir,' said the sergeant major, "'a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it, so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. His manner was so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter jarred somewhat. "'Well, why don't you have three, sir?' said Herbert White cleverly. The soldier regarded him in the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. "'I have,' he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. "'And did you really have the three wishes granted?' asked Mrs. White. "'I did,' said the sergeant-major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. "'And has anybody else wished?' persisted the old lady. "'The first man has his three wishes, yes,' was the reply. "'I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. "'That's how I got the paw.' "'His tones were so grave that a hush fell upon the group. "'If you've had your three wishes, it's no good to you now, then, Morris,' said the old man at last. "'What do you keep it for?' The soldier shook his head. Fancy, I suppose, he said slowly. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them, and those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. "'If you could have another three wishes,' said the old man, eyeing him keenly, "'would you have them?' "'I don't know,' said the other. "'I don't know.' He took the paw and, dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. White, with a slight cry, stooped down and snatched it off. "'Better let it burn,' said the soldier solemnly. "'If you don't want it, Morris,' said the other, "'give it to me.' "'I won't,' said his friend doggedly. "'I threw it on the fire. "'If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. "'Pitch it on the fire again, like a sensible man.' The other shook his head and examined his new possession closely. "'How do you do it?' he inquired. "'Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud,' said the sergeant-major. "'But I warn you of the consequences.' "'Sounds like the Arabian Nights,' said Mrs. White, as she rose and began to set the supper. "'Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me?' Her husband drew the talisman from pocket, and then all three burst into laughter as the sergeant-major, with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. "'If you must wish,' he said gruffly, "'wish for something sensible.' Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket, and placing chairs motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldier's adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert, as the door closed behind their guest, just in time for him to catch the last train, we shan't make much out of it. Did you give him anything for it, father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle, said he, coloring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it and he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely, said Herbert with pretended horror, why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. Wish to be an emperor, father, to begin with, then you can't be henpecked. He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White, armed with an antimacassar. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. 
"'I don't know what to wish for, and that's a fact,' he said slowly. "'It seems to me I've got all I want.' "'If you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you?' said Herbert, with his hand on his shoulder. "'Well, wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it.' His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down at the piano and struck a few impressive chords. "'I wish for two hundred pounds,' said the old man distinctly. A fine crash from the piano greeted the words, interrupted by a shuddering cry from the old man. His wife and son ran toward him. "'It moved!' he cried, with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. "'As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake.' "'Well, I don't see the money,' said his son as he picked it up and placed it on the table. "'And I bet I never shall.' "'It must have been your fancy, father,' said his wife, regarding him anxiously. He shook his head. "'Never mind, though. There's no harm done. But it gave me a shock all the same.' They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside the wind was higher than ever, and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. "'I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed,' said Herbert, as he bade them good night and something horrible squatting up on top of the wardrobe watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room, which it had lacked on the previous night and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. "'I suppose all old soldiers are the same,' said Mrs. White. "'The idea of our listening to such nonsense! How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you, father?' "'Might drop on his head from the sky,' said the frivolous Herbert. "'Morris said the things happened so naturally,' said his father, "'that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence.' "'Well, don't break into the money before I come back,' said Herbert, as he rose from the table. "'I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you.' His mother laughed and following him to the door, watched him down the road. And returning to the breakfast-table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant-majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. "'Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home,' she said, as they sat at dinner. "'I dare say,' said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. "'But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. That I'll swear to.' "'You thought it did,' said the old lady soothingly. "'I say it did,' replied the other. "'There was no thought about it. I had just... "'What's the matter?' His wife made no reply. 
she was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside, who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the two hundred pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it, and then, with a sudden resolution, flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White at the same moment placed her hands behind her, and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively, and listened in a preoccupied fashion, as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room, and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited as patiently as her sex would permit for him to broach his business. But he was at first strangely silent. "'I was asked to call,' he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. "'I come from Ma and Megan's.' The old lady started. "'Is anything the matter?' she asked breathlessly. "'Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it?' Her husband interposed. "'There, there, mother,' he said hastily. "'Sit down and don't jump to conclusions. "'You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir,' and he eyed the other wistfully. "'I'm sorry,' began the visitor. "'Is he hurt?' demanded the mother wildly. The visitor bowed in assent. "'Badly hurt,' he said quietly. "'But he is not in any pain.' "'Oh, thank God,' said the old woman, clasping her hands. "'Thank God for that. Thank—' She broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's perverted face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. "'He was caught in the machinery,' said the visitor at length in a low voice. "'Caught in the machinery?' repeated Mr. White in a dazed fashion. Yes. He sat staring blankly out at the window, and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly forty years before. He was the only one left to us, he said, turning gently to the visitor. It is hard. The other coughed, and rising, walked slowly to the window. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, he said, without looking round. I beg that you will understand. I am only their servant, and merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The old woman's face was white, her eyes staring, and her breath inaudible. On the husband's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility, continued the other. They admit no liability at all. But, in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand, and, rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, "'How much?' Two hundred pounds,' was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery some two miles distant, 
the old people buried their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence it was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear but the days passed and expectation gave place to resignation the hopeless resignation of the old sometimes miscalled apathy sometimes they hardly exchanged a word for now they had nothing to talk about and their days were long to weariness it was about a week after that the old man waking suddenly in the night stretched out his hand and found himself alone the room was in darkness and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window he raised himself in bed and listened come back he said tenderly you will be cold it is colder for my son said the old woman and wept afresh the sound of her sobs died away on his ears the bed was warm and his eyes heavy with sleep he dozed fitfully and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start the paw she cried wildly the monkey's paw he started up in alarm where where is it what's the matter she came stumbling across the room toward him i want it she said quietly you've not destroyed it it's in the parlor on the bracket he replied marveling why she cried and laughed together and bending over kissed his cheek i i, I only just thought of it she said hysterically why didn't i think of it before why didn't you think of it think of what he questioned the other two wishes she replied rapidly we've only had one was not that enough he demanded fiercely no she cried triumphantly we'll have one more go down and get it quickly and wish our boy alive again the man sat up in bed and flung the bedclothes from his quaking limbs good god you are mad he cried aghast get it she panted get it quickly and wish oh my boy my boy her husband struck a match and lit the candle get back to bed he said unsteadily you don't know what you are saying we had the first wish granted said the old woman feverishly why not the second a coincidence stammered the old man go and get it and wish cried his wife quivering with excitement the old man turned and regarded her and his voice shook he has been dead ten days and besides he i would not tell you else but i could only recognize him by his clothing if he was too terrible for you to see then how now bring him back cried the old woman and dragged him toward the door do you think i fear the child i have nursed he went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece the talisman was in its place and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door his brow cold with sweat he felt his way round the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room it was white and expectant and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it he was afraid of her wish she cried in a strong voice it is foolish and wicked he faltered wish repeated his wife he raised his hand i wish my son alive again the talisman fell to the floor 
and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman with burning eyes walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute or two afterward the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches, and striking one went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs the match went out, and he paused to strike another, and at the same moment a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? cried the old woman, starting up. "'A rat,' said the old man in shaking tones. "'A rat! It passed me on the stairs.' His wife sat up in bed, listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. "'It's Herbert!' she screamed. "'It's Herbert!' She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm held her tightly. "'What are you going to do?' he whispered hoarsely. "'It's my boy! It's Herbert!' she cried, struggling mechanically. "'I forgot it was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go! I must open the door!' "'For God's sake, don't let it in!' cried the old man, trembling. "'You're afraid of your own son?' she cried, struggling. "'Let me go! I'm coming, Herbert! I'm coming!' There was another knock, and another. The old woman with a sudden wrench broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing, and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back, and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice, strained and panting. "'The bolt!' she cried loudly. "'Come down! I can't reach it!' But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish the knocking ceased suddenly although the echoes of it were still in the house he heard the chair drawn back and the door opened a cold wind rushed up the staircase and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him courage to run down to her side, and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. End of the monkey's paw recording by m j frank portland oregon the three sisters by w w jacobs 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page. The Three Sisters by W. W. Jacobs. Thirty years ago, on a wet autumn evening, the household of Mallet's Lodge was gathered round the deathbed of Ursula Mallow, the eldest of the three sisters who inhabited it. The dingy, moth-eaten curtains of the old wooden bedstead were drawn apart. The light of a smoking oil lamp falling upon the hopeless countenance of the dying woman as she turned her dull eyes upon her sisters. The room was in silence, except for an occasional sob from her youngest sister, Eunice. Outside the rain fell steadily over the steaming marshes. "'Nothing is to be changed, Tabitha,' gasped Ursula to the other sister who bore a striking resemblance to her, although her expression was harder and colder. This room is to be locked up and never opened. Very well, said Tabitha brusquely, though I don't see how it can matter to you then. It does matter, said her sister with startling energy. How do you know? How do you know that I may not sometimes visit it? I have lived in this house so long. I am certain that I shall see it again. I will come back. Come back to watch over you both, and see that no harm befalls you. You are talking wildly, said Tabitha, by no means moved by her sister's solicitude for her welfare. Your mind is wandering. You know that I have no faith in such things. Ursula sighed and beckoned to Eunice, who was weeping silently at the bedside, placed her feeble arms round her neck and kissed her. Do not weep, dear, she said feebly. Perhaps it is best so. A lonely woman's life is scarcely worth living. We have no hopes no aspirations. Other women have had happy husbands and children, but we in this forgotten place have grown old together. I go first, but you must soon follow. Tabitha, comfortably conscious of only forty years and an iron frame, shrugged her shoulders and smiled grimly. I go first repeated Ursula, in a new and strange voice, as her heavy eyes slowly closed. But I will come for each of you in turn, when your lease of life runs out. At that moment I will be with you, to lead your steps whither I now go. As she spoke the flickering lamp went out suddenly as though extinguished by a rapid hand, and the room was left in utter darkness. A strange, suffocating noise issued from the bed, and when the trembling women had relighted the lamp, all that was left of Ursula Mallow was ready for the grave. That night the survivors passed together. The dead woman had been a firm believer in the existence of that shadowy borderland which is said to form an unhallowed link between the living and the dead. And even the stolid Tabitha, slightly unnerved by the events of the night, was not free from certain apprehensions that she might have been right. With the bright morning their fears disappeared. The sun stole in the window, and seeing the poor earthworm face on the pillow so touched it, and glorified it that only its goodness and weakness were seen, and the beholders came to wonder how they could ever have felt any dread of aught so calm and peaceful. 
A day or two passed, and the body was transferred to a massive coffin, long regarded as the finest piece of work of its kind ever turned out of the village carpenter's workshop. Then a slow and melancholy cortege headed by four bearers wound its solemn way across the marshes to the family vault in the grey old church, and all that was left of Ursula was placed by the father and mother who had taken the self-same journey some thirty years before. To Eunice, as they toiled slowly home, the day seemed strange and Sabbath-like, the flat prospect of marsh wider and more forlorn than usual, the roar of the sea more depressing. Tabitha had no such fancies. The bulk of the dead woman's property had been left to Eunice, and her avarous soul was sorely troubled, and her proper sisterly feelings of regret for the deceased sadly interfered with it in consequence. "'What are you going to do with all that money, Eunice?' she asked as they sat at their quiet tea. "'I shall leave it as it stands,' said Eunice slowly. "'We have both got sufficient to live upon, and I shall devote the income from it to supporting some beds in the children's hospital. "'If Ursula had wished it to go to a hospital,' said Tabitha in her deep tones, she would have left the money to it herself. I wonder you do not respect her wishes more. What else can I do with it, then? inquired Eunice. Save it, said the other with gleaming eyes. Save it. Eunice shook her head. No, said she, it shall go to the sick children. But the principal I will not touch. And if I die before you, it shall become yours, and you can do what you like with it. Very well, said Tabitha, smouldering her anger by a strong effort. I don't believe that was what Ursula meant you to do with it, and I don't believe she will rest quietly in the grave while you squander the money she stored so carefully. What do you mean? asked Eunice with pale lips. You are trying to frighten me. I thought that you did not believe in such things. Tabitha made no answer, and, to avoid the anxious, inquiring gaze of her sister, drew her chair to the fire, and, folding her gaunt arms, composed herself for a nap. For some time life went on quietly in the old house. The room of the dead woman, in accordance with her last desire, was kept firmly locked, its dirty windows forming a strange contrast to the prim cleanliness of the others. Tabitha, never very talkative, became more taciturn than ever, and stalked about the house and the neglected garden like an unquiet spirit, her brow roughened into deep wrinkles suggestive of much thought. As the winter came on, bringing with it the long dark evenings, the old house became more lonely than ever, and an air of mystery and dread seemed to hang over it and brood in its empty rooms and dark corridors. The deep silence of night was broken by strange noises, for which neither the wind nor the rats could be held accountable. Old Martha, seated in her distant kitchen, heard strange sounds upon the stairs, and once, upon hurrying to them, fancied that she saw a dark figure squatting upon the landing, though a subsequent search with a candle and spectacles failed to discover anything. Eunice was disturbed by several vague incidents, and as she suffered from a complaint of the heart, rendered very ill by them. Even Tabitha admitted a strangeness about the house, but, confident in her piety and virtue, took no heed of it, her mind being fully employed in another direction. Since the death of her sister, all restraint upon her was removed, and she yielded herself up entirely to the stern and hard rules enforced by avarice upon its devotees. 
Her housekeeping expenses were kept rigidly separate from those of Eunice, and her food limited to the coarsest dishes, while in the matter of clothes the old servant was by far the better dressed. Seated alone in her bedroom, this uncouth, hard-featured creature reveled in her possessions, grudging even the expense of the candle-end, which enabled her to behold them. So completely did this passion change her that both Eunice and Martha became afraid of her, and lay awake in their beds night after night, trembling at the chinking of coins at her unholy vigils. One day Eunice ventured to remonstrate. "'Why don't you bank your money, Tabitha?' she said. "'It is surely not safe to keep such large sums in such a lonely house.' "'Large sums!' repeated the exasperated Tabitha. "'Large sums! What nonsense is this? You know well that I have barely sufficient to keep me.' "'It is a great temptation to housebreakers,' said her sister, not pressing the point. "'I made sure last night that I heard somebody in the house.' "'Did you?' said Tabitha, grasping her arm, a horrible look on her face. "'So did I.' I thought they went to Ursula's room, and I got out of bed and went on the stairs to listen. Well, said Eunice faintly, fascinated by the look on her sister's face. There was something there, said Tabitha slowly. I'll swear it, for I stood on the landing by her door and listened. Something scuffling on the floor round and round the room. At first I thought it was the cat. When I went up there this morning the door was still locked, and the cat was in the kitchen. "'Oh, let us leave this dreadful house,' moaned Eunice. "'What?' said her sister grimly. "'Afraid of poor Ursula?' "'Why should you be? Your own sister who nursed you when you were a babe, and who perhaps even now comes and watches over your slumbers.' "'Oh,' said Eunice, pressing her hand to her side, if I saw her I should die. I should think that she had come for me, as she said she would. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I am dying. She reeled as she spoke, and before Tabitha could save her, sank senseless to the floor. Get some water, cried Tabitha, as old Martha came hurrying up the stairs. Eunice has fainted. The old woman, with a timid glance at her, retired reappearing shortly afterwards with the water, with which she proceeded to restore her much-loved mistress to her senses. Tabitha, as soon as this was accomplished, stalked off to her room, leaving her sister and Martha, sitting drearily enough in the small parlour, watching the fire, and conversing in whispers. It was clear to the old servant that this stage of things could not last much longer, and she repeatedly urged her mistress to leave the house so lonely and so mysterious. To her great delight, Eunice at length consented, despite the fierce opposition of her sister, and that the mere idea of leaving gained greatly in health and spirits. A small but comfortable house was hired in Morval, and arrangements made for a speedy change. It was the last night in the old house and all the wild spirits of the marshes, the wind, and the sea seemed to have joined forces for one supreme effort. When the wind dropped, as it did at brief intervals, the sea was heard moaning on the distant beach. Strangely mingled with the desolate warning of the bell buoy as it rocked on the waves. When the wind rose again, and the noise of the sea was lost in the fierce gusts, which, finding no obstacle on the open marshes, swept with their full fury upon the house by the creek. The strange voices of the air shrieked in its chimneys, windows rattled, doors slammed, and even the very curtains seemed to be alive. Eunice was in bed, awake. A small nightlight, in a saucer of oil, shed a sickly glare upon the worm-eaten old furniture, distorting the most innocent articles into ghastly shapes. 
a wilder gust than usual almost deprived her of the protection afforded by that poor light, and she lay listening, fearfully, to the creakings and to the other noises on the stairs, bitterly regretting that she had not asked Martha to sleep with her. But it was not too late even now. She slipped hastily to the floor, crossed to the huge wardrobe, and was in the very act of taking her dressing-gown from its peg, when an unmistakable footfall was heard on the stairs. The robe dropped from her shaking fingers, and with a quickly beating heart she regained her bed. The sounds ceased, and a deep silence followed, which she herself was unable to break, although she strove hard to do so. A wild gust of wind shook the windows, and nearly extinguished the light, and when its flame had regained its accustomed steadiness, she saw that the door was slowly opening, while the huge shadow of a hand blotted the papered wall. Still her tongue refused its office. The door flew open with a crash, a cloaked figure entered, and throwing aside its covering she saw with a horror, past all expression, the napkin-bound face of the dead Ursula smiling terribly at her. In her last extremity, she raised her faded eyes above for succor, and then, as the figure noiselessly advanced and laid its cold hand upon her brow, the soul of Eunice Mallow left its body with a wild shriek and made its way to the Eternal. Martha, roused by the cry and shivering with dread, rushed to the door and gazed in terror at the figure which stood leaning over the bedside. As she watched, it slowly removed the cowl and the napkin, and exposed the fell face of Tabitha, so strangely contorted between fear and triumph that she hardly recognized it. "'Who's there?' cried Tabitha, in a terrible voice as she saw the old woman's shadow on the wall. I thought I heard a cry," said Martha, entering. Did anybody call? Yes, Eunice, said the other, regarding her closely. I too heard the cry and hurried to her. What makes her so strange? Is she in a trance? I, said the old woman, falling on her knees by the bed and sobbing bitterly, the trance of death. Oh, my dear, my poor lonely girl, that this should be the end of it. She has died of fright, said the old woman, pointing to the eyes, which even yet retained their horror. She has seen something devilish. Tabitha's gaze fell. She has always suffered with her heart, she muttered. The night has frightened her. It frightened me. She stood upright by the foot of the bed as Martha drew the sheet over the face of the dead woman. First Ursula, then Eunice, said Tabitha, drawing a deep breath. I can't stay here. I'll dress and wait for the morning. She left the room as she spoke, and with bent head proceeded to her own. Martha remained by the bedside and gently closed the staring eyes fell on her knees and prayed long and earnestly for the departed soul. Overcome with grief and fear, she remained with a bowed head until a sudden sharp cry from Tabitha brought her to her feet. Well, said the old woman, going to the door. Where are you? cried Tabitha, somewhat reassured by her voice. In Miss Eunice's bedroom. Do you want anything? Come down at once, quick, I am unwell. Her voice rose suddenly to a scream. Quick, for God's sake, quick, or I shall go mad. There is some strange woman in the house. The old woman stumbled hastily down the stairs. What is the matter? She cried, entering the room. Who is it? What do you mean? I saw it, said Tabitha, gasping her convulsively by the shoulder. I was coming to you when I saw the figure of a woman. 
in front of me going up the stairs. Is it? Can it be Ursula coming for the soul of Eunice, as she said she would? Or for yours? said Martha, the words coming from her in an odd fashion, despite herself. Tabitha, with a ghastly look, fell cowering by her side, clutching tremulously at her clothes. Light the lamps, she cried hysterically. Light a fire, make a noise, oh, this dreadful darkness, will it never be day? Soon, soon, said Martha, overcoming her repugnance and trying to pacify her. The day comes when we will laugh at these fears. I murdered her, screamed the miserable woman. I killed her with fright. Why did she not give me the money? "'Twas no use to her. Oh, look there!" Martha, with a horrible fear, followed her glance to the door, but saw nothing. "'It's Ursula!' said Tabitha from between her teeth. "'Keep her off! Keep her off!' The old woman, who by some unknown sense seemed to feel the presence of a third person in the room, moved to step forward and stood before her. As she did so, Tabitha waved her arms as though to free herself from the touch of a detaining hand, half rose to her feet, and without a word fell dead before her. At this the old woman's courage forsook her, and with a great cry she rushed from the room, eager to escape from this house of death and mystery. The bolts of the great door were stiff with age. The strange voices seemed to ring in her ears as she strove wildly to unfasten them. Her brain whirled. She thought that the dead in their distant rooms called her, and that a devil stood on the step outside laughing and holding the door against her. Then, with a supreme effort, she flung it open, and heedless of her night clothes, passed into the bitter night. The path across the marshes was lost in the darkness but she found it. The planks over the ditches slippery and narrow, but she crossed them in safety, until at last, her feet bleeding and her breath coming in great gasps, she entered the village and sank down more dead than alive on a cottage doorstep. End of the Three Sisters Recording by Capricia Page The Haunted Valley by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Raphael Phoenix Blaze. June 2012, Dallas, Texas. The Haunted Valley by Ambrose Bierce. 1. HOW TREES ARE FELLED IN CHINA A half-mile north from Joe Dunfer's, on the road from Hutton's to Mexican Hill, the highway dips into a sunless ravine which opens out on either hand in a half-confidential manner, as if it had a secret to impart at some more convenient season. I never used to ride through it without looking first to the one side and then to the other, to see if the time had arrived for the revelation. If I saw nothing, and I never did see anything, there was no feeling of disappointment, for I knew the disclosure was merely withheld temporarily for some good reason which I had no right to question. That I should one day be taken into full confidence I no more doubted than I doubted the existence of Joe Dunfer himself, through whose premises the ravine ran. It was said that Joe had once undertaken to erect a cabin in some remote part of it, but for some reason had abandoned the enterprise and constructed his present hermaphrodite habitation, half residence and half groggery, at the roadside, upon an extreme corner of his estate, as far away as possible, as if on purpose to show how radically he had changed his mind. This Joe Dunfer, or, as he was familiarly known in the neighborhood, Whiskey Joe, was a very important personage in those parts. He was apparently about forty years of age, a long, shock-headed fellow, with a corded face, 
a gnarled arm and a knotty hand like a bunch of prison keys. He was a hairy man, with a stoop in his walk, like that of one who was about to spring upon something and rend it. Next to the peculiarity to which he owed his local appellation, Mr. Dunfer's most obvious characteristic was a deep-seated antipathy to the Chinese. I saw him once in a towering rage because one of his herdsmen had permitted a travel-heated Asian to slake his thirst at the horse trough in front of the saloon end of Joe's establishment. I ventured faintly to remonstrate with Joe for his unchristian spirit, but he merely explained that there was nothing about Chinaman in the New Testament, and strode away to wreak his displeasure upon his dog, which also, I suppose, the inspired scribes had overlooked. Some days afterward, finding him sitting alone in his barroom, I cautiously approached the subject, when, greatly to my relief, the habitual austerity of his expression visibly softened into something that I took for condescension. You young Easterners, he said, are a mile and a half too good for this country, and you don't catch on to our play. People who don't know a Chileno from a Kanaka can afford to hang out liberal ideas about Chinese immigration, but a fellow that has to fight for his bone with a lot of mongrel coolies hasn't any time for foolishness. This long consumer, who had probably never done an honest day's work in his life, sprung the lid of a Chinese tobacco box and with thumb and forefinger forked out a wad like a small haycock. Holding this reinforcement within supporting distance, he fired away with renewed confidence. They're a flight of devouring locusts, and they're going for everything green in this God-blessed land, if you want to know. Here he pushed his reserve into the breach, and when his gabble gear was again disengaged, resumed his uplifting discourse. I had one of them on this ranch five years ago, and I'll tell you about it so that you can see the nub of this whole question. I didn't pan out particularly well those days, drank more whiskey than was prescribed for me, and didn't seem to care for my duty as a patriotic American citizen. So I took that pagan in, as a kind of cook. But when I got religion over at the hill and they talked of running me for the legislature, it was given to me to see the light. But what was I to do? If I gave him the go, somebody else would take him, and mightn't treat him white. What was I to do? What would any good Christian do, especially one new to the trade, and full to the neck with the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God? Joe paused for a reply, with an expression of unstable satisfaction, as of one who has solved a problem by a distrusted method. Presently he rose and swallowed a glass of whiskey from a full bottle on the counter, then resumed his story. Besides, he didn't count for much, didn't know anything, and gave himself airs. They all do that. I said him nay, but he mulled it through on that line while he lasted. But after turning the other cheeks seventy and seven times, I doctored the dice so that he didn't last forever. And I'm almighty glad I had the sand to do it. Joe's gladness, which somehow did not impress me, was duly and ostentatiously celebrated at the bottle. About five years ago, I started in to stick up a shack. That was before this one was built, and I put it in another place. I set Ah Wee and a little cuss named Gopher to cutting the timber. Of course, I didn't expect Ah Wee to help much, for he had a face like a day in June and big black eyes. I guess maybe they were the damnedest eyes in this neck of woods. While delivering this trenchant thrust at common sense, Mr. Dunfer absently regarded a knot hole in the thin board partition separating the bar from the living room, as if that were one of the eyes whose size and color had incapacitated his servant for good service. Now you eastern galoots won't believe anything against the yellow devils, he suddenly flamed out with an appearance of earnestness not altogether convincing. But I tell you that Chink was the perversest scoundrel outside San Francisco. The miserable pigtail Mongolian went to hewing away at the saplings all around the stems, like a worm or the dust gnawing a radish. 
I pointed out his error as patiently as I knew how, and showed him how to cut them on two sides, so as to make them fall right, but no sooner would I turn my back on him, like this, and he turned it on me, amplifying the illustration by taking some more liquor. Then he was at it again. It was just this way, while I looked at him so, regarding me rather unsteadily and with evident complexity of vision. He was all right, but when I looked away, so, taking a long pull at the bottle, he defied me. Then I'd gaze at him reproachfully, so, and butter wouldn't have melted in his mouth. Doubtless Mr. Dunfer honestly intended the look that he fixed upon me to be merely reproachful, but it was singularly fit to arouse the gravest apprehension in an unarmed person incurring it. And as I had lost all interest in his pointless and interminable narrative, I rose to go. Before I had fairly risen, he had again turned to the counter, and with a barely audible so, had emptied the bottle at a gulp. Heavens! What a yell! It was like a titan in this last strong agony. Joe staggered back after emitting it, as a cannon recoils from its own thunder, and then dropped into his chair, as if he had been knocked in the head like a beef, his eyes drawn sidewise toward the wall, with a stare of terror. Looking in the same direction, I saw that the knot hole in the wall had indeed become a human eye, a full black eye, that glared into my own with an entire lack of expression more awful than the most devilish glitter. I think I must have covered my face with my hands to shut out the horrible illusion, if such it was, and Joe's little white man-of-all-work coming into the room broke the spell, and I walked out of the house with a sort of dazed fear that delirium tremens might be infectious. My horse was hitched at the watering trough, and untying him I mounted and gave him his head, too much troubled in mind to know whither he took me. I did not know what to think of all this, and like everyone who does not know what to think, I thought a great deal, and to little purpose. The only reflection that seemed at all satisfactory was that on the morrow I should be some miles away, with a strong probability of never returning. A sudden coolness brought me out of my abstraction, and looking up I found myself entering the deep shadows of the ravine. The day was stifling and this transition from the pitiless, visible heat of the parched fields to the cool gloom, heavy with pungency of cedars and vocal with twittering of the birds that had been driven to its leafy asylum, was exquisitely refreshing. I looked for my mystery, as usual, but not finding the ravine in a communicative mood, dismounted, led my sweating animal into the undergrowth, tied him securely to a tree, and sat down upon a rock to meditate. I began bravely by analyzing my pet superstition about the place. Having resolved it into its constituent elements, I arranged them in convenient troops and squadrons, and collecting all the forces of my logic bore down upon them from impregnable premises, with the thunder of irresistible conclusions and a great noise of chariots and general intellectual shouting. Then, when my big mental guns had overturned all opposition and were growing almost inaudibly away on the horizon of pure speculation, the routed enemy straggled in upon their rear, massed silently into a solid phalanx, and captured me, bag and baggage. An indefinable dread came upon me. I rose to shake it off and began threading the narrow dell by an old, grass-grown cow path that seemed to flow along the bottom, as a substitute for the brook that nature had neglected to provide. The trees among which the path straggled were ordinary, well-behaved plants, a trifle perverted as to trunk and eccentric as to bow, but with nothing unearthly in their general aspect. A few loose boulders, which had detached themselves from the sides of the depression to set up an independent existence at the bottom, had dammed up the pathway, here and there, but their stony repose had nothing in it of the stillness of death. There was a kind of death chamber hush in the valley, it is true, and a mysterious whisper above. The wind was just fingering the tops of the trees, that was all. 
I had not thought of connecting Joe Dunfer's drunken narrative with what I now sought, and only when I came into a clear space and stumbled over the level trunks of some small trees did I have the revelation. This was the site of the abandoned shack. The discovery was verified by noting that some of the rotting stumps were hacked all around, in a most unwoodmanlike way, while others were cut straight across, and the butt ends of the corresponding trunks had the blunt wedge form given by the axe of a master. The opening among the trees was not more than thirty paces across. At one side was a little knoll, a natural hillock, bare of shrubbery, but covered with wild grass, and on this, standing out of the grass, a headstone of a grave. I do not remember that I felt anything like surprise at this discovery. I viewed that lonely grave with something of the feeling that Columbus must have had when he saw the hills and headlands of the New World. Before approaching it, I leisurely completed my survey of the surroundings. I was even guilty of the affectation of winding my watch at that unusual hour, and with needless care and deliberation. Then I approached my mystery. The grave, a rather short one was in somewhat better repair than was consistent with its obvious age and isolation, and my eyes, I dare say, widened a trifle at a clump of unmistakable garden flowers showing evidence of recent watering. The stone had clearly enough done duty once as a doorstep. In its front was carved, or rather dug, an inscription. It read thus, Ah, we, Chinaman, age unknown worked for Joe Dunfer. This monument is erected by him to keep the chink's memory green, likewise as a warning to celestials not to take on airs. Devil take them! She was a good egg. I cannot adequately relate my astonishment at this uncommon inscription. The meager but sufficient identification of the deceased, the impudent candor of confession, the brutal anathema, the ludicrous change of sex and sentiment, all marked this record as the work of one who must have been at least as much demented as bereaved. I felt that any further disclosure would be a paltry anticlimax, and with an unconscious regard for dramatic effect turned squarely about and walked away, nor did I return to that part of the county for four years. 2. Who drives sane oxen should himself be sane? Gee up there, old fuddy-duddy. This unique adjuration came from the lips of a queer little man perched upon a wagon full of firewood, behind a brace of oxen that were hauling it easily along with a simulation of mighty effort which had evidently not imposed on their lord and master. As that gentleman happened at the moment to be staring me squarely in the face as I stood by the roadside. It was not altogether clear whether he was addressing me or his beasts, nor could I say if they were named Fuddy and Duddy, and were both subjects of the imperative mood to G up. Anyhow, the command produced no effect on us, and the queer little man removed his eyes from mine long enough to spear Fuddy and Duddy alternately with a long pole, remarking, quietly but with feeling, during your skin, as if they enjoyed that integument in common. Observing that my request for a ride took no attention, and finding myself falling slowly astern, I placed one foot upon the inner circumference of a hind wheel and was slowly elevated to the level of the hub. Hence, I boarded the concern, sans ceremony, and scrambling forward seated myself beside the driver who took no notice of me until he had administered another indiscriminate castigation to his cattle, accompanied with the advice to buckle down, you derned incapable. Then the master of the outfit, or rather the former master, for I could not suppress a whimsical feeling that the entire establishment was my lawful prize, trained his big black eyes upon me with an expression strangely and somewhat unpleasantly familiar laid down his rod, which neither blossomed nor turned into a serpent, as I half expected, folded his arms, and gravely demanded, What did you do to whiskey? My natural reply would have been that I drank it, 
but there was something about the quarry that suggested a hidden significance, and something about the man that did not invite a shallow jest. And so, having no other answer ready, I merely held my tongue, but felt as if I were resting under an imputation of guilt, and that my silence was being construed into a confession. Just then a cold shadow fell upon my cheek, and caused me to look up. We were descending into my ravine. I cannot describe the sensation that came upon me. I had not seen it since it unbosomed itself four years before, and now I felt like one to whom a friend has made some sorrowing confession of crime long past, and who has basely deserted him in consequence. The old memories of Joe Dunford, his fragmentary revelation, and the unsatisfying explanatory note by the headstone came back with singular distinctness. I wondered what had become of Joe, and I turned sharply round and asked my prisoner. He was intently watching his cattle, and without withdrawing his eyes replied, Gee up, old terrapin. He lies aside of Ah Wee up the gulch. Like to see it? They always come back to the spot. I've been expecting you. Huh? At the enunciation of the aspirate, Fuddy Duddy, the incapable terrapin, came to a dead halt, and before the vowel had died away of the ravine, had folded up all his eight legs and lain down in the dusty road, regardless of the effect upon his dern skin. The queer little man slid off his seat to the ground and started up the dell without deigning to look back to see if I was following, but I was. It was about the same season of the year, and at near the same hour of the day, of my last visit. The jays clamored loudly, and the trees whispered darkly, as before, and I somehow traced in the two sounds a fanciful analogy to the open boastfulness of Mr. Joe, Dunford's mouth, and the mysterious reticence of his manner, and to the mingled hardihood and tenderness of his sole literary production, the epitaph. All things in the valley seemed unchanged, excepting the cow path which was almost wholly overgrown with weeds. When we came out into the clearing, however, there was change enough. Among the stumps and trunks of the falling saplings, those that had been hacked, china fashion, were no longer distinguishable from those that were cut Melican way. It was as if the old world barbarism and the new world civilization had reconciled their differences by the arbitration of an impartial decay as is the way of civilizations. The knoll was there, but the Hunnish brambles had overrun and all but obliterated its effete grasses, and the patrician garden violet had capitulated to his plebeian brother, perhaps had merely reverted to his original type. Another grave, a long, robust mound, had been made beside the first, which seemed to shrink from the comparison and in the shadow of a new headstone the old one lay prostrate, with its marvelous inscription illegible by accumulation of leaves and soil. In point of literary merit, the new was inferior to the old, was even repulsive in its terse and savage jocularity. Joe Dunfer. Done for. I turned from it with indifference, and brushing away the leaves from the tablet of the dead pagan restored to light the mocking words which, fresh from their long neglect, seemed to have a certain pathos. My guide, too, appeared to take on an added seriousness as he read it, and I fancied that I could detect beneath his whimsical manner something of manliness, almost of dignity. But while I looked at him, his former aspect, so subtly unhuman, so tantalizingly familiar, crept back into his big eyes, repellent and attractive. I resolved to make an end of the mystery if possible. My friend, I said, pointing to the smaller grave, did Joe Dunfer murder that Chinaman? He was leaning against a tree and looking across the open space into the top of another, or into the blue sky beyond. He neither withdrew his eyes, nor altered his posture as he slowly replied. No, sir. He justifiably homicided him. Then he really did kill him. Kill him? I should say he did, rather. Doesn't everybody know that? Didn't he stand up before the coroner's jury and confess it? 
And didn't they find a verdict of, came to his death by a wholesome Christian sentiment working in the Caucasian breast? And didn't the church at the hill turn whiskey down for it? And didn't the sovereign people elect him justice of the peace to get even on the gospelers? I don't know where you were brought up. But did Joe do that because the Chinaman did not or would not learn to cut down trees like a white man? Sure. It stands so on the record, which makes it true and legal. My knowing better doesn't make any difference with legal truth. It wasn't my funeral, and I wasn't invited to deliver an oration. But the fact is, Whiskey was jealous of me, and the little wretch actually swelled out like a turkey cock and made a pretense of adjusting an imaginary necktie, noting the effect in the palm of his hand, held up before him to represent a mirror. Jealous of you? I repeated with ill-mannered astonishment. That's what I said. Why not? Don't I look all right? He assumed a mocking attitude of studied grace and twitched the wrinkles out of his threadbare waistcoat. Then, suddenly dropping his voice to a low pitch of singular sweetness, he continued. Whiskey thought a lot of that chink. Nobody but me knew how he doted on him. Couldn't bear. I'm out of his sight, the darn protoplasm. And we ain't come down to this clearing one day and found I'm in me neglecting our work. I'm asleep, and me grappling a tarantula out of his sleeve. Whiskey laid hold of my axe and let us have it. Good and hard. I dodged just then, for the spider bit me. But all we got it bad in the side and tumbled about like anything. Whiskey was just weighing me out one when he saw the spider fastened on my finger. Then he knew make a jackass of himself. He threw away the axe and got down on his knees alongside of Ah Wee, who gave a last little kick and opened his eyes. He had eyes like mine, and putting up his hands drew down Whiskey's ugly head and held it there while he stayed. That wasn't long, for a trembling ran through. I'm an E gave a bit of moan and beat the game. During the progress of the story, the narrator had become transfigured. The comic, or rather, the sardonic element was all out of him, and as he painted that strange scene, it was with difficulty that I kept my composure, and this commensurate actor had somehow so managed me that the sympathy due to his dramatis personae was given to himself. I stepped forward to grasp his hand, when suddenly a broad grin danced across his face, and with a light, mocking laugh he continued. When Whiskey got his nut out of that, he was a sight to see. All his fine clothes, he dressed mighty blind in those days, were spoiled everlasting. His hair was tousled, and his face, what I could see of it, was whiter than the ace of lilies. He stared once at me, and looked away as if I didn't count. And then there were shooting pains chasing one another from my bitten finger into my head, and it was gopher to the dark. That why I wasn't at the inquest. But why did you hold your tongue afterward, I asked. It's that kind of tongue, he replied, and not another word would he say about it. After that, Whiskey took to drinking harder and harder, and was rabbiter and rabbiter anti cooly But I don't think he was ever particularly glad that he dispelled Ah Wee. He didn't put on so much dog about it when... We were alone, and when he had the ear of a darn spectacular extravaganza like you, he put up that headstone and gouged the inscription according to his varying moods. It took him um, three weeks working between drinks. I gouged his in one day. When did Joe die? I asked rather absently. The answer took my breath. Pretty soon after I looked at I'm through that knot hole when you had put something in his whiskey, you darn Borgia. Recovering somewhat from my surprise at this astounding charge, I was half-minded to throttle the audacious accuser, but was restrained by a sudden conviction that came to me in the light of a revelation. I fixed a grave look upon him and asked, as calmly as I could, And when did you go loony? Nine years ago, he shrieked, throwing out his clenched hands. Nine years ago, when that big brute killed the woman who loved him better than she did me. Me, who had followed her from San Francisco, where he won her a draw poker, 
me who watched over her for years when the scoundrel she belonged to was ashamed to acknowledge her and treat her white. Me who for her sake kept his cuss secret till it ate him up. Me who when you poisoned the beast fulfilled as his last requests to lay I'm alongside her and give I'm a stone to the head and I'm. And I've never since seen her grave till now, for I didn't want to meet him here. Meet him? Why, Gopher, my poor fellow? He is dead? That's why I'm afraid of him. I followed the little wretch back to his wagon and wrung his hand at parting. It was now nightfall, and as I stood there at the roadside in the deepening gloom, watching the blank outlines of the receding wagon, a sound was borne to me on the evening wind. A sound as a series of vigorous thumps, and a voice came out of the night. Gee up there, you derned old geranium. End of The Haunted Valley by Ambrose Bierce Recorded by Raphael Phoenix Blaze June 2012, Dallas, Texas The Tomb by H.P. Lovecraft this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jared Hess. The Tomb by H. P. Lovecraft. In relating the circumstances which have led to my confinement within this refuge for the demented, I am aware that my present position will create a natural doubt of the authenticity of my narrative. It is an unfortunate fact that the bulk of humanity is too limited in its mental vision to weigh with patience and intelligence those isolated phenomena seen and felt only by a psychologically sensitive few which lie outside its common experience. Men of broader intellect know that there is no sharp distinction betwixt the real and the unreal that all things appear as they do only by virtue of the delicate individual physical and mental media through which we are made conscious of them but the prosaic materialism of the majority condemns as madness the flashes of supersight which penetrate the common veil of obvious empiricism my name is jervis dudley and from earliest childhood I have been a dreamer and a visionary, wealthy beyond the necessity of a commercial life, and temperamentally unfitted for the formal studies and social recreations of my acquaintances. I have dwelt ever in realms apart from the visible world, spending my youth and adolescence in ancient and little-known books, and in roaming the fields and groves of the region near my ancestral home. I do not think that what I read in these books or saw in these fields and groves was exactly what other boys read and saw there, but of this I must say little, since detailed speech would but confirm those cruel slanders upon my intellect which I sometimes overhear from the whispers of the stealthy attendants around me. It is sufficient for me to relate events without analyzing causes. I have said that I dwelt apart from the visible world, but I have not said that I dwelt alone. This no human creature may do. For lacking the fellowship of the living, he inevitably draws upon the companionship of things that are not, or are no longer, living. Close by my home there lies a singular wooded hollow, in whose twilight deeps I spent most of my time reading thinking and dreaming down its moss-covered slopes my first steps of infancy were taken and around its grotesquely gnarled oak trees my first fancies of boyhood were woven well did i come to know the presiding dryads of those trees and often have i watched their wild dances in the struggling beams of a waning moon but of these things i must not now speak I will tell only of the lone tomb in the darkest of the hillside thickets, the deserted tomb of the Hydes, an old and exalted family whose last direct descendants had been laid within its black recesses many decades before my birth. 
The vault to which I refer is of ancient granite, weathered and discolored by the mists and dampness of generations. Excavated back into the hillside, the structure is visible only at the entrance. The door, a ponderous and forbidding slab of stone, hangs upon rusted iron hinges, and is fastened ajar, in a queerly sinister way by means of heavy iron chains and padlocks, according to a gruesome fashion of half a century ago. The abode of the race whose scions are here inured had once crowned the declivity which holds the tomb, but had long since fallen victim to the flames which sprang up from a disastrous stroke of lightning. Of the midnight storm which destroyed this gloomy mansion, the older inhabitants of the region sometimes speak in hushed and uneasy voices alluding to what they call divine wrath, in a manner that in later years vaguely increased the always strong fascination which I felt for the forest-darkened sepulchre. One man only had perished in the fire. When the last of the hides was buried in this place of shade and stillness, the sad urnful of ashes had come from a distant land, to which the family had repaired when the mansion burned down. No one remains to lay flowers before the granite portal, and few care to brave the depressing shadows which seem to linger strangely about the water-worn stones. I shall never forget the afternoon when first I stumbled upon the half-hidden house of death. It was in midsummer when the alchemy of nature transmutes the sylvan landscape to one vivid and almost homogeneous mass of green, when the senses are well-nigh intoxicated with the surging seas of moist verdure and the subtly indefinable odors of the soil and the vegetation. In such surroundings the mind loses its perspective, time and space become trivial and unreal, and echoes of a forgotten prehistoric past beat insistently upon the enthralled consciousness. All day I had been wandering through the mystic groves of the hollow, thinking thoughts I need not discuss, and conversing with things I need not name. In years, a child of ten, I had seen and heard many wonders unknown to the throng, and the oddly aged in certain respects. When upon forcing my way between two savage clumps of briars, I suddenly encountered the entrance of the vault. I had no knowledge of what I had discovered. The dark blocks of granite, the door so curiously ajar, and the funereal carvings above the arch aroused in me no associations of mournful or terrible character. Of graves and tombs I knew and imagined much, but had, on account of my peculiar temperament, been kept from all personal contact with churchyards and cemeteries. The strange stone house on the woodland slope was to me only a source of interest and speculation, and its cold, damp interior into which I vainly peered through the aperture so tantalizingly left contained for me no hint of death or decay. But in that instant of curiosity was born the madly unreasoning desire which had brought me to this hell of confinement. Spurred on by a voice which must have come from the hideous soul of the forest, I resolved to enter the beckoning gloom in spite of the ponderous chains which barred my passage. In the waning light of day, I alternately rattled the rusty impediments with a view to throwing wide the stone door and essayed to squeeze my slight form through the space already provided. But neither plan met with success. At first curious, I was now frantic, and when in the thickening twilight I returned to my home, I had sworn to the hundred gods of the grove that at any cost I would some day force an entrance to the black, chilly depths that seemed calling out to me. The physician with the iron-gray beard, who comes each day to my room, once told a visitor that this decision marks the beginning of a pitiful monomania, but I will leave final judgment to my readers when they shall have learnt all. The months following my discovery were spent in futile attempts to force the complicated padlock of the slightly open vault, and in carefully guarded inquiries regarding the nature and history of the structure. With the traditionally receptive ears of the small boy, I learned much, though 
An habitual secretiveness caused me to tell no one of my information or my resolve. It is perhaps worth mentioning that I was not at all surprised or terrified on learning of the nature of the vault. My rather original ideas regarding life and death had caused me to associate the cold clay with the breathing body in a vague fashion. And I felt that the great and sinister family of the burned-down mansion was in some way represented within the stone space I sought to explore. Mumbled tales of the weird rites and godless revels of bygone years in the ancient hall gave to me a new and potent interest in the tomb, before whose door I would sit for hours at a time each day. Once I thrust a candle within the nearly closed entrance, but could see nothing save a flight of damp stone steps leading downward. The odor of the place repelled yet bewitched me. I felt I had known it before, in a past remote beyond all recollection, beyond even my tenancy of the body I now possess. The year after I first beheld the tomb, I stumbled upon a worm-eaten translation of Plutarch's Lives in the book-filled attic of my home. Reading the life of Theseus, I was much impressed by that passage, telling of the great stone beneath which the boyish hero was to find his tokens of destiny whenever he should become old enough to lift its enormous weight. This legend had the effect of dispelling my keenest impatience to enter the vault, for it made me feel that the time was not yet ripe. Later, I told myself, I should grow to a strength and ingenuity which might enable me to unfasten the heavily chained door with ease, but until then I would do better by conforming to what seemed the will of fate. Accordingly, my watches by the dank portal became less persistent, and much of my time was spent in other, though equally strange, pursuits. I would sometimes rise very quietly in the night, stealing out to walk in those churchyards and places of burial from which I had been kept by my parents. What I did there I may not say, for I am not now sure of the reality of certain things, but I know that on the day after such a nocturnal ramble I would often astonish those about me with my knowledge of topics almost forgotten for many generations. It was after a night like this that I shocked the community with a queer conceit about the burial of the rich and celebrated Esquire Brewster, a maker of local history, who was interred in 1711, and whose slate headstone bearing a graven skull and crossbones was slowly crumbling to powder. In a moment of childish imagination, I vowed not only that the undertaker, Goodman Simpson, had stolen the silver buckled shoes, silken hose, and satin small clothes of the deceased before burial, but that the squire himself, not fully inanimate, had turned twice in his mound-covered coffin on the day after interment. But the idea of entering the tomb never left my thoughts being indeed stimulated by the unexpected genealogical discovery that my own maternal ancestry possessed at least a slight link with the supposedly extinct family of the Hydes. Last of my paternal race, I was likewise the last of this older and more mysterious line. I began to feel that the tomb was mine, and to look forward with hot eagerness to the time when I might pass within that stone door and down those slimy stone steps in the dark. I now formed the habit of listening very intently at the slightly open portal, choosing my favorite hours of midnight stillness for the odd vigil. By the time I came of age, I had made a small clearing in the thicket before the mold-stained facade of the hillside, allowing the surrounding vegetation to encircle and overhang the space like the walls and roof of a sylvan bower. This bower was my temple, the fastened door my shrine, and here I would lie outstretched on the mossy ground, thinking strange thoughts and dreaming of strange dreams. The night of the first revelation was a sultry one. I must have fallen asleep from fatigue, for it was with a distinct sense of awakening that I heard the voices. Of those tones and accents I hesitate to speak, of their quality I will not speak, but I may say that they presented certain uncanny differences in vocabulary, pronunciation, and mode of utterance. 
every shade of New England dialect from the uncouth syllables of the Puritan colonists to the precise rhetoric of fifty years ago seemed represented in that shadowy colloquy, though it was only later that I noticed the fact. At the time, indeed, my attention was distracted from this matter by another phenomenon, a phenomenon so fleeting that I could not take oath upon its reality. I barely fancied that as I awoke a light had been hurriedly extinguished within the sunken sepulchre. I do not think I was either astounded or panic-stricken, but I know that I was greatly and permanently changed that night. Upon returning home I went with much directness to a rotting chest in the attic, wherein I found the key, which next day unlocked with ease the barrier I had so long stormed in vain. It was in the soft glow of late afternoon that I first entered the vault on the abandoned slope. A spell was upon me, and my heart leaped with an exultation I can but ill describe. As I closed the door behind me and descended the dripping steps by the light of my lone candle, I seemed to know the way, and though the candle sputtered with the stifling reek of the place, I felt singularly at home in the musty charnel-house air. Looking about me, I beheld many marble slabs bearing coffins, or the remains of coffins. Some of these were sealed and intact, but others had nearly vanished, leaving the silver handles and plates isolated amidst certain curious heaps of whitish dust. Upon one plate I read the name of Sir Geoffrey Hyde, who had come from Sussex in 1640 and died here a few years later. In a conspicuous alcove was one fairly well-preserved and untenanted casket, adorned with a single name, which brought to me both a smile and a shudder. An odd impulse caused me to climb upon the broad slab, extinguish my candle, and lie down within the vacant box. In the gray light of dawn I staggered from the vault and locked the chain of the door behind me. I was no longer a young man, though but twenty-one winters had chilled my bodily frame. Early rising villagers, who observed my homeward progress, looked at me strangely and marveled at the signs of ribald revelry which they saw in one whose life was known to be sober and solitary. I did not appear before my parents till after a long and refreshing sleep. Henceforth I haunted the tomb each night, seeing, hearing, and doing things I must never reveal. My speech, always susceptible to environmental influences, was the first thing to succumb to the change, and my suddenly acquired archaism of diction was soon remarked upon. Later a queer boldness and recklessness came into my demeanor, till I unconsciously grew to possess the bearing of a man of the world, despite my lifelong seclusion. My formerly silent tongue waxed voluble with the easy grace of a Chesterfield or the godless cynicism of a Rochester. I displayed a peculiar erudition utterly unlike the fantastic monkish lore over which I had pored in youth and covered the fly-leaves of my books with facile impromptu epigrams which brought up suggestions of gay, prior, and the sprightliest of the Augustan wits and rhymesters. One morning at breakfast I came close to disaster by declaiming in palpably licorice accents in a fusion of eighteenth-century Bacchanalian mirth, a bit of Gregorian playfulness never recorded in a book, which ran something like this. Come hither, my lads, with your tankards of ale, and drink to the present before it shall fail. Pile each on your platter a mountain of beef, for tis eating and drinking that bring us relief. So fill up your glass, for life will soon pass. When you're dead, you'll ne'er drink to your king or your lass. Anacreon had a red nose, so they say. But what's a red nose if you're happy and gay? Gad split me, I'd rather be red whilst I'm here than white as a lily and dead half a year. So Betty, my miss, come give me a kiss. In hell there's no innkeeper's daughter like this. Young Harry, propped up just as straight as he's able, will soon lose his wig and slip under the table. But fill up your goblets and pass em around. Better under the table than under the ground. So revel and chaff as ye thirstily quaff. Under six feet of dirt tis less easy to laugh. 
The fiend strike me blue, I'm scarce able to walk, and damn ye if I can stand upright or talk. Here, landlord, bid Betty to summon a chair. I'll try home for a while, for my wife is not there. So lend me a hand, I'm not able to stand, but I'm gay whilst I linger on top of the land. About this time I conceived my present fear of fire and thunderstorms, previously indifferent to such things. I had now an unspeakable horror of them, and would retire to the innermost recesses of the house whenever the heavens threatened an electrical display. A favorite haunt of mine during the day was the ruined cellar of the mansion that had burned down and in fancy I would picture the structure as it had been in its prime. On one occasion I startled a villager by leading him confidently to a shallow sub-cellar, of whose existence I seemed to know in spite of the fact that it had been unseen and forgotten for many generations. At last came that which I had long feared. My parents, alarmed at the altered manner and appearance of their only son, commenced to exert over my movements a kindly espionage which threatened to result in disaster. I had told no one of my visits to the tomb, having guarded my secret purpose with religious zeal since childhood, but now I was forced to exercise care in threading the mazes of the wooded hollow that I might throw off a possible pursuer. My key to the vault I kept suspended from a cord about my neck its presence known only to me. I never carried out of the sepulchre any of the things I came upon whilst within its walls. One morning, as I emerged from the damp tomb and fastened the chain of the portal with none too steady hand, I beheld in an adjacent thicket the dreaded face of a watcher. Surely the end was near, for my boyer was discovered, and the objective of my nocturnal journeys revealed. The man did not accost me, so I hastened home in an effort to overhear what he might report to my careworn father. Were my sojourns beyond the chained door about to be proclaimed to the world? Imagine my delighted astonishment on hearing the spy inform my parent in a cautious whisper that I had spent the night in the boyer outside the tomb. My sleep-filmed eyes fixed upon the crevice where the padlocked portal stood ajar. I was now convinced that a supernatural agency protected me. Made bold by this heaven-sent circumstance, I began to resume perfect openness in going to the vault, confident that no one could witness my entrance. For a week I tasted to the full the joys of that charnel conviviality, which I must not describe, when... The thing happened, and I was borne away to this accursed abode of sorrow and monotony. I should not have ventured out that night, for the taint of thunder was in the clouds, and a hellish phosphorescence rose from the rank swamp at the bottom of the hollow. The call of the dead, too, was different. Instead of the hillside tomb, it was the charred cellar on the crest of the slope, whose presiding daemon beckoned to me with unseen fingers. As I emerged from an intervening grove upon the plain before the ruin, I beheld in the misty moonlight a thing I had always vaguely expected. The mansion, gone for a century, once more reared its stately height to the raptured vision. Every window ablaze with the splendor of many candles, up the long drive rolled the coaches of the Boston gentry, whilst on foot came a numerous assemblage of powdered exquisites from the neighboring mansions. With this throng I mingled, though I knew I belonged with the hosts rather than with the guests. Inside the hall were music, laughter, and wine on every hand. Several faces I recognized, though I should have known them better had they been shriveled or eaten away by death and decomposition. Amidst a wild and reckless throng, I was the wildest and most abandoned. Gay blasphemy poured in torrents from my lips, and in my shocking sallies I heeded no law of God, man, or nature. Suddenly a peal of thunder resonant even above the din of the swinish revelry clave the very roof and laid a hush of fear upon the boisterous company. Red tongues of flame and searing gusts of heat engulfed the house, and the roisterers struck with terror at the descent of a calamity which seemed to transcend the bounds of unguided nature 
fled shrieking into the night. I alone remained riveted to my seat by a groveling fear which I had never felt before. And then a second horror took possession of my soul. Burnt alive to ashes, my body dispersed by the four winds, I might never lie in the tomb of the hides. Was not my coffin prepared for me? Had I not a right to rest till eternity amongst the descendants of Sir Geoffrey Hyde? I, I would claim my heritage of death, even though my soul go seeking through the ages for another corporeal tenement to represent it on that vacant slab in the alcove of the vault. Jervis Hyde should never share the sad fate of Palinurus. As the phantom of the burning house faded, I found myself screaming and struggling madly in the arms of two men, one of whom was the spy who had followed me to the tomb. Rain was pouring down in torrents, and upon the southern horizon were flashes of the lightning that had so lately passed over our heads. My father, his face lined with sorrow, stood by as I shouted my demands to be laid within the tomb, frequently admonishing my captors to treat me as gently as they could. A blackened circle on the floor of the ruined cellar told of a violent stroke from the heavens. And from this spot a group of curious villagers with lanterns were prying a small box of antique workmanship which the thunderbolt had brought to light. Ceasing my futile and now objectless writhing, I watched the spectators as they viewed the treasure trove and was permitted to share in their discoveries. The box, whose fastenings were broken by the stroke which had unearthed it, contained many papers and objects of value. But I had eyes for one thing alone. It was the porcelain miniature of a young man in a smartly curled bag wig and bore the initials J.H. The face was such that as I gazed I might well have been studying my mirror. On the following day I was brought to this room with the barred windows but I have been kept informed of certain things through an aged and simple-minded servitor, for whom I bore a fondness in infancy, and who, like me, loves the churchyard. What I have dared relate of my experiences within the vault has brought me only pitying smiles. My father, who visits me frequently, declares that at no time did I pass the chained portal, and swears that the rusted padlock had not been touched for fifty years when he examined it. He even says that all the village knew of my journeys to the tomb, and that I was often watched as I slept in the boyer outside the grim façade, my half-open eyes fixed on the crevice that leads to the interior. Against these assertions I have no tangible proof to offer, since my key to the padlock was lost in the struggle on that night of horrors, the strange things of the past which I learnt during those nocturnal meetings with the dead he dismisses as the fruits of my lifelong and omnivorous browsing amongst the ancient volumes of the family library. Had it not been for my old servant Hiram, I should have by this time become quite convinced of my madness. But Hiram, loyal to the last, has held faith in me and has done that which impels me to make public at least a part of my story. A week ago he burst open the lock which chains the door of the tomb perpetually ajar, and descended with a lantern into the murky depths. On a slab in an alcove he found an old but empty coffin, whose tarnished plate bears the single word, Jervis. In that coffin and in that vault. They have promised me I shall be buried. End of The Tomb Recording by Jared Hess Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula's Guest by Bram Stoker When we started for our drive, the sun was shining brightly on Munich, and the air was full of the joyousness of early summer. Just as we were about to depart, Herr Delbruck, the maitre d'hôtel of the Quatre Saisons, where I was staying, came down bareheaded to the carriage and, 
after wishing me a pleasant drive, said to the coachman still holding his hand on the handle of the carriage door, "'Remember you are back by nightfall. The sky looks bright, but there is a shiver in the north wind that says there may be a sudden storm. But I am sure you will not be late.' Here he smiled and added, "'For you know what night it is.' Johann answered with the emphatic, "'Ja, mein Herr,' and, touching his hat, drove off quickly. When we had cleared the town, I said, after signaling to him to stop, "'Tell me, Johann, what is tonight?' He crossed himself, as he answered laconically, Walpurgisnacht. Then he took out his watch, a great old-fashioned German silver thing as big as a turnip, and looked at it, with his eyebrows gathered together and a little impatient shrug of his shoulders. I realized that this was his way of respectfully protesting against the unnecessary delay, and sank back into the carriage, merely motioning him to proceed. He started off rapidly, as if to make up for lost time. Every now and then the horses seemed to throw up their heads and sniff the air suspiciously. On such occasions I often looked round in alarm. The road was pretty bleak, for we were traversing a sort of high, wind-swept plateau. As we drove, I saw a road that looked but little used, and which seemed to dip through a little winding valley. It looked so inviting that, even at the risk of offending him, I called Johann to stop, and when he had pulled up, I told him I would like to drive down that road. He made all sorts of excuses and frequently crossed himself as he spoke. This somewhat piqued my curiosity, so I asked him various questions. He answered fencingly and repeatedly looked at his watch in protest. Finally, I said, "'Well, Johann, I want to go down this road. I shall not ask you to come unless you like, but tell me why you do not like to go. That is all I ask.' For answer he seemed to throw himself off the box, so quickly did he reach the ground. Then he stretched out his hands appealingly to me and implored me not to go. There was just enough English mixed with the German for me to understand the drift of his talk. He seemed always just about to tell me something, the very idea of which evidently frightened him. But each time he pulled himself up, saying, Walpurgisnacht. I tried to argue with him, but it was difficult to argue with a man when I did not know his language. The advantage certainly rested with him— for although he began to speak in English of a very crude and broken kind, he always got excited and broke into his native tongue, and every time he did so, he looked at his watch. Then the horses became restless and sniffed the air. At this he grew very pale, and, looking around in a frightened way, he suddenly jumped forward, took them by the bridles, and led them on some twenty feet. I followed and asked why he had done this. For an answer he crossed himself, pointed to the spot we had left, and drew his carriage in the direction of the other road, indicating a cross, and said, first in German, then in English, buried him, him what killed themselves. I remembered the old custom of burying suicides at crossroads. Ah, I see, a suicide. How interesting. But for the life of me I could not make out why the horses were frightened. Whilst we were talking, we heard a sort of sound between a yelp and a bark. It was far away, but the horses got very restless, and it took Johann all his time to quiet them. He was pale and said, It sounds like a wolf, but yet there are no wolves here now. No, I said, questioning him. Isn't it long since the wolves were so near the city? Long, long, he answered. In the spring and summer, but with the snow the wolves have been here not so long. Whilst he was petting the horses and trying to quiet them, dark clouds drifted rapidly across the sky. The sunshine passed away, and a breath of cold wind seemed to drift over us. It was only a breath, however, and more of a warning than a fact, for the sun came out brightly again. Johann looked under his lifted hand at the horizon and said, The storm of snow, he comes before long time. Then he looked at his watch again, and straightway holding his reins firmly, for the horses were still pawing the ground restlessly and shaking their heads. He climbed to his box as though the time had come for proceeding on our journey. I felt a little obstinate and did not at once get into the carriage. "'Tell me,' I said, "'about this place where the road leads?' And I pointed down. Again he crossed himself and mumbled a prayer before he answered, "'It is unholy.' "'What is unholy?' I inquired. 
the village. Then there is a village? No, no. No one lives there hundreds of years. My curiosity was piqued. But you said there was a village. There was. Where is it now? Whereupon he burst out into a long story in German and English, so mixed up that I could not quite understand exactly what he said. Roughly I gathered that, long ago, hundreds of years, men had died there and been buried in their graves, but sounds were heard under the clay, and when the graves were opened, men and women were found rosy with life and their mouths red with blood. And so, in haste to save their lives, I and their souls, and here he crossed himself, those who were left fled away to other places, where the living lived and the dead were dead and not, not something. He was evidently afraid to speak the last words. As he proceeded with his narration, he grew more and more excited. It seemed as if his imagination had got hold of him, and he ended in a perfect paroxysm of fear, white-faced, perspiring, trembling, and looking round him as if expecting some dreadful presence would manifest itself there in the bright sunshine on the open plain. Finally, in an agony of desperation, he cried, Walpurgisnacht, and pointed to the carriage for me to get in. All my English blood rose at this, and standing back I said, You are afraid, Johann, you are afraid. Go home, I shall return alone, the walk will do me good. The carriage door was open. I took from the seat my oak walking stick, which I always carry on my holiday excursions, and closed the door pointing back to Munich, and said, Go home, Johann. Walpurgisnacht doesn't concern Englishmen. The horses were now more restive than ever, and Johann was trying to hold them in, while excitedly imploring me not to do anything so foolish. I pitied the poor fellow. He was so deeply in earnest, but all the same I could not help laughing. His English was quite gone now. In his anxiety he had forgotten that his only means of making me understand was to talk my language. So he jabbered away in his native German. It began to be a little tedious. After giving the direction, home, I turned to go down the crossroad into the valley. With a despairing gesture, Johann turned his horses towards Munich. I leaned on my stick and looked after him. He went slowly along the road for a while. Then there came over the crest of the hill a man tall and thin. I could see so much in the distance. When he drew near the horses... They began to jump and kick about, then to scream with terror. Johann could not hold them in. They bolted down the road, running away madly. I watched them out of sight, then looked for the stranger. But I found that he, too, was gone. With a light heart I turned down the side road through the deepening valley to which Johann had objected. There was not the slightest reason that I could see for his objection and I dare say I tramped for a couple of hours without thinking of time or distance and certainly without seeing a person or a house. So far as the place was concerned, it was desolation itself. But I did not notice this particularly till, on turning a bend in the road, I came upon a scattered fringe of wood. Then I recognized that I had been impressed unconsciously by the desolation of the region through which I had passed. I sat down to rest myself and began to look around. It struck me that it was considerably colder than it had been at the commencement of my walk. A sort of sighing sound seemed to be around me with, now and then, high overhead, a sort of muffled roar. Looking upwards, I noticed that great thick clouds were drafting rapidly across the sky, from north to south at a great height. There were signs of a coming storm in some lofty stratum of the air. I was a little chilly, and, thinking that it was the sitting still after the exercise of walking, I resumed my journey. The ground I passed over was now much more picturesque. There were no striking objects that the eye might single out, but in all there was a charm of beauty. I took little heed of time, and it was only when the deepening twilight forced itself upon me that I began to think of how I should find my way home. The air was cold, and the drifting of clouds high overhead was more marked. They were accompanied by a sort of faraway rushing sound through which seemed to come at intervals that mysterious cry which the driver had said came from a wolf. For a while I hesitated. I had said I would see the deserted village, so on I went, and presently came on a wide stretch of open country, shut in by hills all around. Their sides were covered with trees which spread down to the plain, 
dotting in clumps the gentler slopes and hollows which showed here and there. I followed with my eye the winding of the road, and saw that it curved close to one of the densest of these clumps, and was lost behind it. As I looked there came a cold shiver in the air, and the snow began to fall. I thought of the miles and miles of bleak country I had passed, and then hurried on to seek shelter of the wood in front. Darker and darker grew the sky, and faster and heavier fell the snow, till the earth before and around me was a glistening white carpet, the further edge of which was lost in misty vagueness. The road was here but crude, and when on the level its boundaries were not so marked as when it passed through the cuttings, and in a little while I found that I must have strayed from it, for I missed underfoot the hard surface, and my feet sank deeper in the grass and moss. Then the wind grew stronger and blew with ever-increasing force, till I was fain to run before it. The air became icy cold, and in spite of my exercise I began to suffer. The snow was now falling so thickly and whirling around me in such rapid eddies that I could hardly keep my eyes open. Every now and then the heavens were torn asunder by vivid lightning, and in the flashes I could see ahead of me a great mass of trees, chiefly yew and cypress, all heavily coated with snow. I was soon amongst the shelter of the trees, and there in comparative silence I could hear the rush of the wind high overhead. Presently the blackness of the storm had become merged in the darkness of the night. By and by the storm seemed to be passing away. It now only came in fierce puffs or blasts. At such moments the weird sound of the wolf appeared to be echoed by many similar sounds around me. Now and again, through the black mass of drifting cloud, came a straggling ray of moonlight which lit up the expanse and showed me that I was at the edge of a dense mass of cypress and yew trees. As the snow had ceased to fall, I walked out from the shelter and began to investigate more closely. It appeared to me that, amongst so many old foundations as I had passed, there might be still standing a house in which, though in ruins, I could find some sort of shelter for a while. As I skirted the edge of the copse, I found that a low wall encircled it, and following this I presently found an opening. Here the cypresses formed an alley leading up to a square mass of some kind of building. Just as I caught sight of this, however, the drifting clouds obscured the moon, and I passed up the path in darkness. The wind must have grown colder, for I felt myself shiver as I walked. But there was hope of shelter, and I groped my way blindly on. I stopped, for there was a sudden stillness. The storm had passed, and, perhaps in sympathy with nature's silence, my heart seemed to cease to beat. But this was only momentarily, for suddenly the moonlight broke through the clouds showing me that I was in a graveyard, and that the square object before me was a massive tomb of marble, as white as the snow that lay on, and all around it. With the moonlight there came a fierce sigh of the storm which appeared to resume its course with a long, low howl, as of many dogs or wolves. I was awed and shocked, and I felt the cold perceptibly grow upon me till it seemed to grip me by the heart. Then, while the flood of moonlight still fell on the marble tomb, the storm gave further evidence of renewing, as though it were returning on its track. Impelled by some sort of fascination, I approached the sepulchre to see what it was and why such a thing stood alone in such a place. I walked around it in red, over the Doric door, in German. Countess Dolingen of Graz, in Styria, sought and found death, 1801. On the top of the tomb, seemingly driven through the solid marble, where the structure was composed of a few vast blocks of stone, was a great iron spike or stake. On going to the back I saw, graven in great Russian letters, the dead travel fast. There was something so weird and uncanny about the whole thing that it gave me a turn and made me feel quite faint. I began to wish, for the first time, that I had taken Johann's advice. Here a thought struck me, which came under almost mysterious circumstances and with a terrible shock. This was Walpurgis Night. Walpurgis Night was when, according to the belief of millions of people, the devil was abroad, when the graves were opened and the dead came forth and walked, when all evil things of earth and air and water held revel. This very place the driver had specially shunned. This was the depopulated village of centuries ago. This was where the suicide lay, and this was the place where I was alone. Unmanned, shivering with cold in a shroud of snow with a wild storm gathering again upon me. 
It took all my philosophy, all the religion I had been taught, all my courage, not to collapse in a paroxysm of fright. And now a perfect tornado burst upon me. The ground shook as though thousands of horses thundered across it, and this time the storm bore on its icy wings, not snow but great hailstones which drove with such violence that they might have come from the thongs of Balearic singers, hailstones that beat down leaf and branch and made the shelter of the cypresses of no more avail than though their stems were standing corn. At the first I had rushed to the nearest tree, but I was soon fain to leave it and seek the only spot that seemed to afford refuge— the deep Doric doorway of the marble tomb. There, crouching against the massive bronze door, I gained a certain amount of protection from the beating of the hailstones, for now they only drove against me as they ricocheted from the ground and the side of the marble. As I leaned against the door, it moved slightly and opened inwards. The shelter of even a tomb was welcome in that pitiless tempest, and I was about to enter it when there came a flash of forked lightning that lit up the whole expanse of the heavens. In the instant... As I am a living man, I saw, as my eyes turned into the darkness of the tomb, a beautiful woman with rounded cheeks and red lips, seemingly sleeping on a bier. As the thunder broke overhead, I was grasped as by the hand of a giant and hurled out into the storm. The whole thing was so sudden that, before I could realize the shock, moral as well as physical, I found the hailstones beating me down. At the same time I had a strange, dominating feeling that I was not alone. I looked towards the tomb. Just then there came another blinding flash which seemed to strike the iron stake that surmounted the tomb and to pour through to the earth, blasting and crumbling the marble, as in a burst of flame. The dead woman rose for a moment of agony while she was lapped in the flame, and her bitter scream of pain was drowned in the thunder crash. The last thing I heard was this mingling of dreadful sound— as again I was seized in the giant grasp and dragged away, while the hailstones beat on me and the air around seemed reverberant with the howling of wolves. The last sight that I remembered was a vague, white, moving mass, as if all the graves around me had sent out the phantoms of their sheeted dead, and that they were closing in on me through the white cloudiness of the driving hail. Gradually there came a sort of vague beginning of consciousness, then a sense of weariness that was dreadful. For a time I remembered nothing, but slowly my senses returned. My feet seemed positively racked with pain, yet I could not move them. They seemed to be numbed. There was an icy feeling at the back of my neck and all down my spine, and my ears, like my feet, were dead yet in torment. But there was in my breast a sense of warmth, which was by comparison delicious. It was as a nightmare, a physical nightmare if one may use such an expression, for some heavy weight on my chest made it difficult for me to breathe. This period of semi-lethargy seemed to remain a long time, and as it faded away I must have slept or swooned. Then came a sort of loathing, like the first stage of seasickness, and a wild desire to be free of something. I knew not what. A vast stillness enveloped me, as though all the world were asleep or dead, only broken by the low panting as of some animal close to me. I felt a warm rasping at my throat. Then came a consciousness of the awful truth which chilled me to the heart and sent the blood surging up through my brain. Some great animal was lying on me and now licking my throat. I feared to stir, for some instinct of prudence bade me lie still. But the brute seemed to realize that there was now some change in me, for it raised its head. Through my eyelashes I saw above me the two great flaming eyes of a gigantic wolf. Its sharp white teeth gleamed in the gaping red mouth, and I could feel its hot breath fierce and acred upon me. For another spell of time I remembered no more. Then I became conscious of a low growl, followed by a yelp, renewed again and again. Then seemingly very far away I heard a halloa, halloa as of many voices calling in unison. Cautiously I raised my head and looked in the direction whence the sound came, but the cemetery blocked my view. The wolf still continued to yelp in a strange way, and a red glare began to move round the grove of cypresses, as though following the sound. As the voices drew closer, the wolf yelped faster and louder. I feared to make either sound or motion, Nearer came the red glow over the white pall which stretched into the darkness around me, 
Then all at once from beyond the trees there came at a trot a troop of horsemen bearing torches. The wolf rose from my breast and made for the cemetery. I saw one of the horsemen, soldiers by their caps and their long military cloaks, raise his carbine and take aim. A companion knocked up his arm, and I heard the ball whiz over my head. He had evidently taken my body for that of the wolf. Another sighted the animal as it slunk away, and a shot followed. Then, at a gallop, the troop rode forward, some towards me, others following the wolf as it disappeared amongst the snow-clad cypresses. As they drew nearer I tried to move but was powerless, although I could see and hear all that went on around me. Two or three of the soldiers jumped from their horses and knelt beside me. One of them raised my head and placed his hand over my heart. "'Good news, comrades!' he cried. "'His heart still beats!' And then some brandy was poured down my throat. It put vigor into me, and I was able to open my eyes fully and look around. Lights and shadows were moving among the trees, and I heard men call to one another. They drew together, uttering frightened exclamations, and the lights flashed as the others came pouring out of the cemetery pell-mell, like men possessed. When the further ones came close to us, those who were around me asked them eagerly, "'Well, have you found him?' The reply rang out hurriedly, "'No, no! Come away quick, quick! This is no place to stay, and on this of all nights!' "'What was it?' was the question, asked in all manner of keys. The answer came variously and all indefinitely, as though the men were moved by some common impulse to speak, yet were restrained by some common fear from giving their thoughts. "'It... it, it indeed!' gibbered one, whose wits had plainly given out for the moment. "'A wolf, and yet not a wolf,' another put in shudderingly. "'No use trying for him without the sacred bullet,' a third remarked in a more ordinary manner. "'Serve us right for coming out on this night. Truly we have earned our thousand marks,' were the ejaculations of a fourth. "'There was blood on the broken marble,' another said after a pause. "'The lightning never brought that there. "'And for him, is he safe?' Look at his throat. See, comrades, the wolf has been lying on him and keeping his blood warm. The officer looked at my throat and replied, He is all right. The skin is not pierced. What does it all mean? We should never have found him but for the yelping of the wolf. What became of it? asked the man who was holding up my head and who seemed the least panic-stricken of the party, for his hands were steady and without tremor. On his sleeve was the chevron of a petty officer. It went home, answered the man, whose long face was pallid and who actually shook with terror as he glanced around him fearfully. There are graves enough there in which it may lie. Come, comrades, come quickly. Let us leave this cursed spot. The officer raised me to a sitting posture as he uttered a word of command. Then several men placed me upon a horse. He sprang to the saddle behind me, took me in his arms, gave the word to advance, and, turning our faces away from the cypresses, we rode away in swift military order. As yet my tongue refused its office, and I was perforce silent. I must have fallen asleep, for the next thing I remembered was finding myself standing up, supported by a soldier on each side of me. It was almost broad daylight, and to the north a red streak of sunlight was reflected like a path of blood over the waste of snow. The officer was telling the men to say nothing of what they had seen, except that they had found an English stranger, guarded by a large dog. Dog? That was no dog, cut in the man who had exhibited such fear. I think I know a wolf when I see one. The young officer answered calmly, I said a dog. Dog, reiterated the other ironically. It was evident that his courage was rising with the sun, and, pointing to me, he said, Look at his throat. "'Is that the work of a dog, master?' "'Instinctively I raised my hand to my throat, "'and as I touched it I cried out in pain. "'The men crowded round to look, "'some stooping down from their saddles, "'and again there came the calm voice of the young officer. "'A dog,' as I said. "'If aught else were said, we should only be laughed at.' "'I was then mounted behind a trooper, "'and we rode on into the suburbs of Munich.' Here we came across a stray carriage into which I was lifted, and it was driven off to the Quatre Saisons. 
the young officer accompanying me, whilst the trooper followed me with his horse, and the others rode off to their barracks. When we arrived, Herr Delbuck rushed so quickly down the steps to meet me that it was apparent he had been watching within. Taking me by both hands, he solicitously led me in. The officer saluted me and was turning to withdraw, when I recognized his purpose and insisted that he should come to my rooms. Over a glass of wine I warmly thanked him and his brave comrades for saving me. He replied simply that he was more than glad, and that Herr Delbruck had at the first taken steps to make all the searching party pleased, at which ambiguous utterance the maitre d'hôtel smiled, while the officer pled duty and withdrew. But, Herr Delbruck, I inquired, how and why was it that the soldiers searched for me? He shrugged his shoulders, as if in depreciation of his own deed, as he replied, I was so fortunate as to obtain leave from the commander of the regiment in which I serve, to ask for volunteers. But how did you know I was lost? I asked. The driver came hither with the remains of his carriage, which had been upset when the horses ran away. But surely you would not send a search party of soldiers merely on this account? Oh, no, he answered. But even before the coachman arrived, I had this telegram from the boyar whose guests you are. And he took from his pocket a telegram which he handed to me, and I read, Bistritz, be careful of my guest. His safety is most precious to me. Should aught happen to him, or if he be missed, Spare nothing to find him and ensure his safety. He is English and therefore adventurous. There are often dangers from snow and wolves in night. Lose not a moment if you suspect harm to him. I answer your zeal with my fortune. Dracula As I held the telegram in my hand, the room seemed to whirl around me, and if the attentive maitre d'hôtel had not caught me, I think I should have fallen. There was something so strange in all this, something so weird and impossible to imagine, that there grew on me a sense of my being in some way the sport of opposite forces, the mere vague idea of which seemed in a way to paralyze me. I was certainly under some form of mysterious protection. From a distant country had come, in the very nick of time, a message that took me out of the danger of the snow sleep and the jaws of the wolf. End of Dracula's Guest The Night Doings at Deadman's by Ambrose Beers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Craster. THE NIGHT DOINGS AT DEADMAN'S, A STORY THAT IS UNTRUE. It was a singularly sharp night, and clear as the heart of a diamond. Clear nights have a trick of being keen. In darkness you may be cold and not know it. When you see, you suffer. This night was bright enough to bite like a serpent. The moon was moving mysteriously along behind the giant pines crowning the south mountain, striking a cold sparkle from the crusted snow, and bringing out against the black west and ghostly outlines of the coast range, beyond which lay the invisible Pacific. The snow had piled itself in the open spaces along the bottom of the gulch. Indeed, long ridges had seemed to heave and into the hills that appeared to toss and scatter spray. The spray was sunlight, twice reflected, dashed once from the moon, once from the snow. In the snow, many of the shanties of the abandoned mining camp were obliterated. A sailor might have said they had gone down, and at irregular intervals it had overtopped the tall trestles which had once supported a river called a flume, for of course flume is flumen. Among the advantages of which the mountains cannot deprive the gold hunter is the privilege of speaking Latin. He says of his dead neighbor, he has gone up the flume. This is not a bad way to say, his life has returned to the fountain of life. 
while putting on its armour against the assaults of the wind this snow had neglected no coin of vantage snow pursued by the wind is not wholly unlike a retreating army in the open field it ranges itself in ranks and battalions where it can get a foothold it makes a stand where it can take cover it does so you may see whole platoons of snow cowering behind a bit of broken wall the devious old road hewn out of the mountainside was full of it squadron upon squadron had struggled to escape by this line when suddenly pursuit had ceased a more desolate and dreary spot than dead man's gulch in a winter midnight it is impossible to imagine yet mr hiram beeson elected to live there the sole inhabitant away from the side of the north mountain his little pine log shanty projected from its single pane of glass a long thin beam of light and looked not altogether unlike a black beetle fastened to the hillside with a bright new pin within it sat mr beeson himself before a roaring fire staring into its hot heart as if he had never before seen such a thing in all his life he was not a comely man he was grey he was ragged and slovenly in his attire his face was wan and haggard his eyes were too bright as to his age if any one had attempted to guess it one might have said forty-seven then corrected himself and said seventy-four he was really twenty-eight emaciated he was as much perhaps as he dared to be with a needy undertaker at bentley's flat and a new and enterprising coroner at sonora poverty and zeal are an upper and a nether millstone it is dangerous to make a third in that kind of sandwich two as mr beeson sat there with his ragged elbows on his ragged knees his lean jaws buried in his lean hands and with no apparent intention of going to bed he looked as if the slightest movement would tumble him to pieces yet during the last hour he had winked no fewer than three times there was a sharp rapping at the door a rap at that time of night and in that weather might have surprised an ordinary mortal who had dwelt two years in the gulch without seeing a human face and could not fail to know that the country was impassable but mr beeson did not so much as pull his eyes out of the coals and even when the door was pushed open he only shrugged a little more closely into himself as one does who is expecting something that he would rather not see you may observe this movement in women when in a mortuary chapel the coffin is borne up the aisle behind them but when a long old man in a blanket overcoat his head tied up in a handkerchief and nearly his entire face in a muffler wearing green goggles and with a complexion of glittering whiteness where it could be seen strode silently into the room laying a hard gloved hand on mr beeson's shoulder the latter so far forgot himself as to look up with an appearance of no small astonishment whomever he may have been expecting he had evidently not counted on meeting any one like this nevertheless the sight of this unexpected guest produced in mr beeson the following sequence a feeling of astonishment a sense of gratification a sentiment of profound goodwill rising from his seat he took the knotty hand from his shoulder and shook it up and down with a fervour quite unaccountable for in the old man's aspect was nothing to attract much to repel however attraction is too general a property for repulsion to be without it the most attractive object in the world in the face we instinctively cover with a cloth when it becomes still more attractive fascinating we put seven feet of earth above it three sir said mr beeson releasing the old man's hand which fell passively against his thigh with a quiet clack it is an extremely disagreeable night please be seated i am very glad to see you mr beeson spoke with an easy good breeding that one would hardly have expected considering all things indeed the contrast between his appearance and his manner was sufficiently surprising to be one of the commonest 
of social phenomena in the mines. The old man advanced a step toward the fire, glowing cavernously in the green goggles. Mr. Beeson resumed. You bet your life I am. Mr. Beeson's elegance was not too refined. It had made reasonable concessions to local taste. He paused a moment, letting his eyes drop from the muffled head of his guest, down along the row of mouldy buttons confining the blanket overcoat to the greenish cowhide boots powdered with snow, which had begun to melt and run along the floor in tiny rills. He took an inventory of his guest and appeared satisfied. Who would not have been? Then he continued, The cheer I can offer you is, unfortunately, in keeping with my surroundings. But I shall esteem myself highly favoured if it is your pleasure to partake of it, rather than seek better at Bentley's flat. With a singular refinement of hospitable humility, Mr. Beeson spoke as if a sojourn in his warm cabin on such a night as compared with walking fourteen miles up to the throat in snow with a cutting crust, would be an intolerable hardship. By way of reply, his guest unbuttoned his blanket overcoat. The host lay fresh fuel on the fire, swept the heart with the tail of a wolf, and added, But I think you'd better skedaddle. The old man took a seat by the fire, spreading his broad soles to the heat without removing his hat. In the mines, the hat is seldom removed except when the boots are. Without further remark, Mr. Beeson also seated himself in a chair which had been a barrel, and which, retaining much of its original character, seemed to have been designed with a view to preserving his dust of it, should please him to crumble. For a moment there was a silence, then from somewhere among the pines came the snarling yelp of a coyote and simultaneously the door rattled in his frame. There was no other connection between the two incidents than that the coyote has an aversion to storms, and the wind was rising, yet there seemed somehow a kind of supernatural conspiracy between the two, and Mr. Beeson shuddered with a vague sense of terror. He recovered himself in a moment and again addressed his guest. 4. There are strange doings here. I will tell you everything, and then if you decide to go, I shall hope to accompany you over the worst of the way, as far as where Baldy Peterson shot Ben Hike. I dare say you know the place. The old man nodded emphatically, as intimating not merely that he did, but that he did indeed. Two years ago, began Mr. Beeson. I, with two companions, occupied this house. But when the rush to the flat occurred, we left, along with the rest. In ten hours the gulch was deserted. That evening, however, I discovered I had left behind me a valuable pistol. That is it. And returned for it, passing the night here alone, as I have passed every night since. I must explain that a few days before we left, our Chinese domestic had the misfortune to die while the ground was frozen, so hard that it was impossible to dig a grave in the usual way. So on the day of our hasty departure, we cut through the floor there and gave him such burial as we could. Before putting him down, I had the extremely bad taste to cut off his pigtail and spike it to that beam above his grave, where you may see it at this moment, or, preferably, when warmth has given you leisure for observation. I stated, did I not, that the Chinaman came to his death from natural causes. I had, of course, nothing to do with that, and returned through no irresistible attraction or morbid fascination, but only because I had forgotten a pistol. That is clear to you, is it not, sir? The visitor nodded gravely. He appeared to be a man of few words, if any. Mr. Beeson continued, According to the Chinese faith, a man is like a kite. He cannot go to heaven without a tail. Well, to shorten this tedious story, which, however, I thought it my duty to relate, on that night, while I was here alone and thinking of anything but him, that Chinaman came back for his pigtail. Five. 
he did not get it. At this point, Mr. Beeson relapsed into blank silence. Perhaps he was fatigued by the unwanted exercise of speaking. Perhaps he had conjured up a memory that demanded his undivided attention. The wind was now fairly abroad, and the pines along the mountainside sang with singular distinctness. The narrator continued, You say you do not see much in that, and I must confess I do not myself. But he keeps coming. There was another long silence, during which both stared into the fire without the movement of a limb. Then Mr. Beeson broke out almost fiercely, fixing his eyes on what he could see of the impassive face of his auditor. Give it him. Sir, in this matter, I have no intention of troubling anyone for advice. You will pardon me, I am sure. Here he became singularly persuasive. But I have ventured to nail that pigtail fast, and have assumed that somewhat onerous obligation of guarding it. So it is quite impossible to act on your considerate suggestion. Do you play me for a Modoc? Nothing could exceed the sudden ferocity with which he thrust this indignant remonstrance into the ear of his guest. It was as if he had struck him on the side of the head with a steel gauntlet. It was a protest, but it was a challenge. To be mistaken for a coward, to be played for a Modoc. These two expressions are one. Sometimes it is a Chinaman. Do you play me for a Chinaman? is a question frequently addressed to the ear of the suddenly dead. Mr. Beeson's buffet produced no effect, and after a moment's pause during which the wind thundered in the chimney like the sound of clods upon a coffin, he resumed. But as you say, it is wearing me out. I feel that the life of the last two years has been a mistake, a mistake that corrects itself. You see how. The grave. No, there is no one to dig it. The ground is frozen, too. But you are very welcome. You may say at Bentley's, but that is not important. It was very tough to cut. They braid silk into their pigtails. Qua! 6. Mr. Beeson was speaking with his eyes shut, and he wondered. His last word was a snore. A moment later he drew a long breath, opened his eyes with an effort, made a single remark, and fell into a deep sleep. What he said was this. They are swiping my dust. Then the aged stranger, who had not uttered one word since his arrival, arose from his seat and deliberately laid off his outer clothing, looking as angular in his flannels as the late Signorina Festorazzi an Irish woman six feet in height and weighing fifty-six pounds, who used to exhibit herself in her chemise to the people in San Francisco. He then crept into one of the bunks, having first placed a revolver in easy reach, according to the custom of the country. This revolver he took from a shelf, and it was the one which Mr. Beeson had mentioned as that for which he had returned to the gulch two years before. In a few moments, Mr. Beeson awoke, and seeing that his guests had retired, he did likewise. But before doing so, he approached the long, plaited wisp of pagan hair, and gave it a powerful tug, to assure himself that it was fast and firm. The two beds, mere shelves covered with blankets, not over clean, faced each other from opposite sides of the room. The little square trapdoor had given access to the Chinaman's grave being midway between. This, by the way, was crossed by a double row of spike heads. In his resistance to the supernatural, Mr. Beeson had not disdained the use of material precautions. The fire was now low, the flames burning bluely and petulantly, with occasional flashes projecting spectral shadows on the walls, shadows that moved mysteriously about now dividing, now uniting. The shadow of the pendant queue, however, kept moodily apart, near the roof at the farther end of the room, looking like a note of admiration. The song of the pines outside had now risen to the dignity of a triumphal hymn. In the pauses, the silence was dreadful. 
7. It was during one of these intervals that the trap in the floor began to lift. Slowly and steadily it rose, and slowly and steadily rose the swaddled head of the old man in the bunk to observe it. Then with a clap that shook the house to its foundation it was thrown clean back, where it lay with its unsightly spikes pointing threateningly upward. Mr. Beeson awoke, and without rising, pressed his fingers into his eyes. He shuddered. His teeth chattered. His guest was now reclining on one elbow, watching the proceedings with the goggles that glowed like lamps. Suddenly, a howling gust of wind swooped down the chimney, scattering ashes and smoke in all directions, for a moment obscuring everything. When the firelight again illuminated the room, there was seen, sitting gingerly on the edge of a stool by the hearth side, a swarthy little man of prepossessing appearance, and dressed with faultless taste, nodding to the old man with a friendly and engaging smile. From San Francisco, evidently, thought Mr. Beeson, who, having somewhat recovered from his fright, was groping his way to a solution of the evening's events. But now another actor appeared on the scene. Out of the square black hole in the middle of the floor protruded the head of the departed Chinaman, his glassy eyes turned upward in their angular slits and fastened on the dangling queue above with a look of yearning unspeakable. Mr. Beeson groaned and again spread his hands upon his face. A mild odour of opium pervaded the place. A phantom clad only in a short blue tunic quilted and silken but covered with grave mould rose slowly, as if pushed by a weak spiral spring. Its knees were at the level of the floor, when with a quick upward impulse like the silent leaping of a flame, it grasped the cue with both hands, drew up its body, and took the tip in its horrible yellow teeth. To this it clung in a seeming frenzy, grimacing ghastly, surging and plunging from side to side in its effort to disengage its property from the beam, but uttering no sound. It was like a corpse artificially convulsed by means of a galvanic battery. The contrast between its superhuman activity and its silence was no less than hideous. 8. Mr. Beeson cowered in his bed. The swarthy little gentleman uncrossed his legs, beat an impatient tattoo with the toe of his boot, and consulted a heavy gold watch. The old man sat erect and quietly laid hold of the revolver. Bang! Like a body cut from the gallows, the Chinaman plumped into the black hole below, carrying his tail in his teeth. The trap door turned over, shutting down with a snap. The swarthy little gentleman from San Francisco sprang nimbly from his perch, caught something in the air with his hat, as a boy catches a butterfly, and vanished into the chimney as if drawn by suction. From away somewhere in the outer darkness floated in through the open door a faint far cry, a long sobbing wail as of a child death strangled in the desert, or a lost soul borne away by the adversary. It may have been the coyote. In the early days of the following spring, a party of miners on their way to new diggings passed along the gulch and straying through the deserted shanties found in one of them the body of Hiram Beeson stretched upon a bunk with a bullet hole through his heart. The ball had evidently been fired from the opposite side of the room, for in one of the oaken beams overhead was a shallow blue dint where it had struck a knot and been deflected downward to the breast of its victim. Strongly attached to the same beam was what appeared to be an end of a rope of braided horsehair, which had been cut by the bullet in its passage to the knot. Nothing else of interest was noted, excepting a suit of mouldy and incongruous clothing, several articles of which were afterward identified by respectable witnesses as those in which certain deceased citizens of Deadman's had been buried years before but it is not easy to understand how that could be unless indeed the garments had been worn as a disguise by death himself which is hardly credible end of 
The Night Doings at Deadman's, a story that is untrue. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. An Egyptian Hornet by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. An Egyptian Hornet. The word has an angry, malignant sound that brings the idea of attack vividly into the mind. There is a vicious sting about it somewhere. Even a foreigner, ignorant of the meaning, must feel it. A hornet is wicked. It darts and stabs, it pierces, aiming without provocation for the face and eyes. The name suggests a metallic droning of evil wings, fierce flight, and poisonous assault. Though black and yellow, it sounds scarlet. There is blood in it, a striped tiger of the air in concentrated form. There is no escape if it attacks. In Egypt, an ordinary bee is the size of an English hornet, but the Egyptian hornet is enormous. It is truly monstrous, an ominous dying terror. It shares that universal quality of the land of the Sphinx and Pyramids, great size. It is a formidable insect, worse than scorpion or tarantula. The Reverend James Milligan, meeting one for the first time, realized the meaning of another word as well, a word he used prolifically in his eloquent sermons. Devil. One morning in April, when the heat began to bring the insects out, he rose as usual betimes and went across the wide stone corridor to his bath. The desert already glared in through the open windows. The heat would be afflicting later in the day, but at this early hour the cool north wind blew pleasantly down the hotel passages. It was Sunday, and at half-past eight o'clock he would appear to conduct the morning service for the English visitors. The floor of the passageway was cold beneath his feet, in their thin native slippers of bright yellow. He was neither young nor old. His salary was comfortable. He had a competency of his own, without wife or children to absorb it. The dry climate had been recommended to him, and the big hotel took him in for next to nothing, and he was thoroughly pleased with himself, for he was a sleek, vain, pompous, well-advertised personality, but mean as a rat. No worries of any kind were on his mind, as carrying sponge and towel, scented soap and a bottle of scrubs ammonia, he travelled amiably across the deserted, shining corridor to the bathroom. And nothing went wrong with the Reverend James Milligan until he opened the door, and his eye fell upon a dark, suspicious-looking object clinging to the window-pane in front of him. And even then, at first, he felt no anxiety or alarm, but merely a natural curiosity to know exactly what it was this little clot of an odd-shaped elongated thing that stuck there on the wooden framework six feet before his aquiline nose. He went straight up to it to see, then stopped dead. His heart gave a distinct unclerical leap. His lips formed themselves into unregenerate shape. He gasped. Good God, what is it? For something unholy, something wicked as a secret sin, stuck there before his eyes in the patch of blazing sunshine he caught his breath for a moment he was unable to move as though the sight half fascinated him then cautiously and very slowly stealthily in fact he withdrew towards the door he had just entered fearful of making the smallest sound he retraced his step on tiptoe his yellow slippers shuffled his dry sponge fell and bounded till it settled, rolling close beneath the horribly attractive object facing him. From the safety of the open door, with ample space for retreat behind him, he paused and stared. His entire being focused itself in his eyes. It was a hornet that he saw. 
It hung there, motionless and threatening, between him and the bathroom door. And at first he merely exclaimed, below his breath, Good God! It's an Egyptian hornet! Being a man with a reputation for decided action, however, he soon recovered himself. He was well schooled in self-control. When people left his church at the beginning of the sermon, no muscle in his face betrayed the wounded vanity and annoyance that burned deep in his heart. But a hornet sitting directly in his path was a very different matter. He realized in a flash that he was poorly clothed, in a word, that he was practically half-naked. From a distance he examined this intrusion of the devil. It was calm and very still. It was wonderfully made, both before and behind. Its wings were folded upon its terrible body. Long, sinuous things, pointed like temptation, barbed as well, stuck out of it. There was poison, and yet grace, in its exquisite presentment. Its shiny black was beautiful and the yellow stripes upon its sleek, curved abdomen were like the gleaming ornaments upon some feminine body of the seductive world he preached against. Almost, he saw an abandoned dancer on the stage. And then swiftly, in his impressionable soul, the simile changed, and he saw instead more blunt and aggressive forms of destruction. The well-filled body, tapering to a horrid point, reminded him of those perfect engines of death that reduce hundreds to annihilation unawares, torpedoes, shells, projectiles, crammed with secret, desolating powers. Its wings, its awful, quiet head, its delicate, slim waist, its stripes of brilliant saffron, all these seemed the concentrated prototype of abominations made cleverly by the brain of man and beautifully painted to disguise their invisible freight of cruel death. Bah! he exclaimed, ashamed of his prolific imagination. It's only a hornet, after all, an insect. And he contrived a hurried, careful plan. He aimed a towel at it, rolled up into a ball, but did not throw it. He might miss. He remembered that his ankles were unprotected. Instead, he paused again examining the black and yellow object in safe retirement near the door, as one day he hoped to watch the world in leisurely retirement in the country. It did not move. It was fixed and terrible. It made no sound. Its wings were folded. Not even the black antennae, blunt at the tips like clubs, showed the least stir or tremble. It breathed, however. He watched the rise and fall of the evil body. It breathed air in and out, as he himself did. The creature, he realized, had lungs and heart and organs. It had a brain. Its mind was active all this time. It knew it was being watched. It merely waited. Any second, with a whiz of fury and with perfect accuracy of aim, it might dart at him and strike. If he threw the towel and missed, it certainly would. There were other occupants of the corridor, however, and a sound of steps approaching gave him the decision to act. He would lose his bath if he hesitated much longer. He felt ashamed of his timidity, though pusillanimity was the word thought selected owing to the pulpit vocabulary it was his habit to prefer. He went with extreme caution towards the bathroom door, passing the point of danger so close that his skin turned hot and cold. With one foot gingerly extended, he recovered his sponge. The hornet did not move a muscle. But it had seen him pass. It merely waited. All dangerous insects had that trick. It knew quite well he was inside. It knew quite well he must come out a few minutes later. It also knew quite well that he was naked. Once inside the little room, he closed the door with exceeding gentleness, lest the vibration might stir the fearful insect to attack. The bath was already filled, and he plunged to his neck with a feeling of comparative security. A window into the outside passage he also closed, so that nothing could possibly come in, and steam soon charged the air 
and left its blurred deposit on the glass. For ten minutes he could enjoy himself and pretend that he was safe. For ten minutes he did so. He behaved carelessly, as though nothing mattered, and as though all the courage in the world were his. He splashed and soaped and sponged, making a lot of reckless noise. He got up and dried himself. Slowly the steam subsided. The air grew clearer. He put on dressing gown and slippers. It was time to go out. Unable to devise any further reason for delay, he opened the door softly half an inch, peeped out, and instantly closed it again with a resounding bang. He had heard a drone of wings. The insect had left its perch and now buzzed upon the floor directly in his path. The air seemed full of stings. He felt stabs all over him. His unprotected portions winced with the expectancy of pain. The beast knew he was coming out and was waiting for him. In that brief instant, he had felt its sting all over him, on his unprotected ankles, on his back, his neck, his cheeks, in his eyes, and on the bald clearing that adorned his Anglican head. Through the closed door he heard the ominous dull murmur of his striped adversary as it beat its angry wings. Its oiled and wicked sting shot in and out with fury. Its deft legs worked. He saw its tiny waist already writhing with the lust of battle. Ah, that tiny waist! A moment's steady nerve, and he could have severed that cunning body from the directing brain with one swift, well-directed thrust. But his nerve had utterly deserted him. Human motives, even in the professedly holy, are an involved affair at any time. Just now, in the Reverend James Milligan, they were inextricably mixed. He claims this explanation, at any rate, in excuse of his abominable subsequent behaviour. For exactly at this moment, when he had decided to admit cowardice by ringing for the Arab servant, a step was audible in the corridor outside, and courage came with it into his disreputable heart. It was a step of the man he cordially disapproved of, using the pulpit version of hated and despised. He had overstayed his time, and the bath was in demand by Mr. Mullins. Mr. Mullins invariably followed him at seven-thirty. It was now a quarter to eight, and Mr. Mullins was a wretched drinking man, a sot. In a flash the plan was conceived and put into execution. The temptation, of course, was of the devil. Mr. Milligan hid the motive from himself, pretending he hardly recognized it. The plan was what men call a dirty trick. It was also irresistibly seductive. He opened the door, stepped boldly, nose in the air, right over the hideous insect on the floor, and fairly pranced into the outer passage. The brief transit brought a hundred horrible sensations that the hornet would rise and sting his leg, that it would cling to his dressing gown and stab his spine, that he would step upon it and die like Achilles of a heel exposed. But with these and conquering them was another stronger emotion that robbed the lesser terrors of their potency, that Mr. Mullins would run precisely the same risks five seconds later, unprepared. He heard the gloating insect buzz and scratch the oilcloth, but it was behind him. He was safe. "'Good morning to you, Mr. Mullins,' he observed with a gracious smile. "'I trust I have not kept you waiting.' "'Morning,' grunted Mullins sourly in reply, as he passed him with a distinctly hostile and contemptuous air. For Mullins, though depraved, perhaps was an honest man, abhorring Parsons and making no secret of his opinions, whence the bitter feeling. All men, except those very big ones who are supermen, have something astonishingly despicable in them. The despicable thing in Milligan came uppermost now. He fairly chuckled. He met the snub with a calm, forgiving smile, and continued his shambling gait with what dignity he could towards his bedroom opposite. Then he turned his head to see. His enemy would meet an infuriated hornet, an Egyptian hornet, and might not notice it. He might step on it. He might not. 
but he was bound to disturb it and rouse it to attack. The chances were enormously on the clerical side, and its sting meant death. May God forgive me, ran subconsciously through his mind, and side by side with the repentant prayer ran also a recognition of the tempter's eternal skill. I hope the devil it will sting him. It happened very quickly. The Reverend James Milligan lingered a moment by his door to watch. He saw Mullins, the disgusting Mullins, step blithely into the bathroom passage. He saw him pause, shrink back, and raise his arm to protect his face. He heard him swear aloud. What's the damn thing doing there? Have I really got him again? And then he heard him laugh, a hearty, guffawing laugh of genuine relief. It's real. The moment of revulsion was overwhelming. It filled the churchly heart with anguish and bitter disappointment. For a space he hated the whole race of men. For the instant Mr. Mullins realized that the insect was not a fiery illusion of his disordered nerves, he went forward without the smallest hesitation. With his towel he knocked down the flying terror. Then he stooped. He gathered up the venomous thing his well-aimed blow had stricken so easily to the floor. He advanced with it, held at arm's length, to the window. He tossed it out carelessly. The Egyptian hornet flew away uninjured. And Mr. Mullins, the Mr. Mullins who drank, gave nothing to the church, attended no services, hated parsons, and proclaimed the fact with enthusiasm. This same Mr. Mullins went to his unearned bath without a scratch. But first he saw his enemy standing in the doorway across the passage watching him, and understood. That was the awful part of it. Mullins would make a story of it, and the story would go the round of the hotel. The Reverend James Milligan, however, proved that his reputation for self-control was not undeserved. He conducted morning service half an hour later, with an expression of peace upon his handsome face. He conquered all outward sign of inward spiritual vexation. The wicked, he consoled himself, ever flourished like green bay trees. It was notorious that the righteous never had any luck at all. That was bad enough. But what was worse? And the Reverend James Milligan remembered for very long was the superior ease with which Mullins had relegated both himself and Hornet to the same level of comparative insignificance. Mullins ignored them both, which proved that he thought himself superior, infinitely worse than the sting of any Hornet in the world. He really was superior. End of An Egyptian Hornet by Algernon Blackwood Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. A Haunted Island by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. A Haunted Island the following events occurred on a small island of isolated position in a large Canadian lake, to whose cool waters the inhabitants of Montreal and Toronto flee for rest and recreation in the hot months. It is only to be regretted that events of such peculiar interest to the genuine student of the psychical should be entirely uncorroborated. Such, unfortunately, however, is the case. Our own party of nearly twenty had returned to Montreal that very day, and I was left in solitary possession for a week or two longer, in order to accomplish some important reading for the law which I had foolishly neglected during the summer. It was late in September, and the big trout and masquinonge were stirring themselves in the depths of the lake, and beginning slowly to move up to the surface waters as the north winds and early frosts lowered their temperature. Already the maples were crimson and gold, and the wild laughter of the loons echoed in sheltered bays that never knew their strange cry in the summer. 
with a whole island to oneself, a two-story cottage, a canoe, and only the chipmunks, and the farmer's weekly visit with eggs and bread to disturb one, the opportunities for hard reading might be very great. It all depends. The rest of the party had gone off with many warnings to beware of Indians, and not to stay late enough to be the victim of a frost that thinks nothing of forty below zero. After they had gone, the loneliness of the situation made itself unpleasantly felt. There were no other islands within six or seven miles, and though the mainland forests lay a couple of miles behind me, they stretched for a very great distance unbroken by any signs of human habitation. But, though the island was completely deserted and silent, the rocks and trees that had echoed human laughter and voices almost every hour of the day for two months could not fail to retain some memories of it all. And I was not surprised to fancy I heard a shout or a cry as I passed from rock to rock, and more than once to imagine that I had heard my own name called aloud. In the cottage there were six tiny little bedrooms, divided from one another by plain unvarnished partitions of pine. A wooden bedstead, a mattress, and a chair stood in each room, but I have only found two mirrors, and one of these was broken. The boats creaked a good deal as I moved about, and the signs of occupation were so recent that I could hardly believe I was alone. I half expected to find someone left behind, still trying to crowd into a box more than it would hold. The door of one room was stiff and refused for a moment to open, and it required very little persuasion to imagine someone was holding the handle on the inside, and that when it opened I should meet a pair of human eyes. A thorough search of the floor led me to select as my own sleeping quarters a little room and a diminutive balcony over the veranda roof. The room was very small, but the bed was large and had the best mattress of them all. It was situated directly over the sitting-room where I should live and do my reading, and the miniature window looked out to the rising sun. With the exception of a narrow path which led from the front door and veranda through the trees to the boat landing, the island was densely covered with maples, hemlocks, and cedars. The trees gathered in round the cottage so closely that the slightest wind made the branches scrape the roof and tap the wooden walls. A few moments after sunset, the darkness became impenetrable, and ten yards beyond the glare of the lamps that shone through the sitting-room windows, of which there were four, you could not see an inch before your nose, nor move a step without running up against a tree. The rest of the day I spent moving my belongings from my tent to the sitting-room, taking stock of the contents of the larder, and chopping enough wood for the stove to last me for a week. After that, just before sunset, I went round the island a couple of times in my canoe for precaution's sake. I had never dreamed of doing this before, but when a man is alone, he does things that never occur to him when he is one of a large party. How lonely the island seemed when I landed again. The sun was down, and twilight is unknown in these northern regions. The darkness comes up at once. The canoe safely pulled up and turned over on her face. I groped my way up the little narrow pathway to the veranda. The six lamps were soon burning merrily in the front room, but in the kitchen, where I dined, the shadows were so gloomy, and the lamplight was so inadequate that the stars could be seen peeping through the cracks between the rafters. I turned in early that night. Though it was calm and there was no wind, the creaking of my bedstead and the musical gurgle of the water over the rocks below were not the only sounds that reached my ears. As I lay awake, the appalling emptiness of the house grew upon me. The corridors and vacant rooms seemed to echo innumerable footsteps, shufflings, the rustle of skirts, and a constant undertone of whispering. When sleep at length overtook me, the breathings and noises, however, passed gently to mingle with the voices of my dreams. A week passed by, and the reading progressed favorably. On the tenth day of my solitude, a strange thing happened. I awoke after a good night's sleep to find myself possessed with a marked repugnance from my room. The air seemed to stifle me. The more I tried to define the cause of this dislike, the more unreasonable it appeared. There was something about the room that made me afraid. Absurd as it seems, this feeling clung to me obstinately while dressing, and more than once I caught myself shivering and conscious of an inclination to get out of the room as quickly as possible. The more I tried to laugh it away, the more real it became, and when at last I was dressed and went out into the passage and downstairs into the kitchen, it was with feelings of relief such as I might imagine would accompany one's escape from the presence of a dangerous, contagious disease. While cooking my breakfast, I carefully recalled every night spent in the room, in the hope that I might in some way connect the dislike I now felt with some disagreeable incident that had occurred in it. 
But the only thing I could recall was one stormy night when I suddenly awoke and heard the boats creaking so loudly in the corridor that I was convinced there were people in the house. So certain was I of this that I had descended the stairs gun in hand only to find the doors and windows securely fastened, and the mice and black beetles in sole possession of the floor. This was certainly not sufficient to account for the strength of my feelings. The morning hours I spent in steady reading, and when I broke off in the middle of the day for a swim and luncheon, I was very much surprised, if not a little alarmed, to find that my dislike for the room had, if anything, grown stronger. Going upstairs to get a book, I experienced the most marked aversion to entering the room, and while within I was conscious all the time of an uncomfortable feeling that was half uneasiness and half apprehension. The result of it was that, instead of reading, I spent the afternoon on the water paddling and fishing, and when I got home about sundown, brought with me half a dozen delicious black bass for the supper-table and the larder. As sleep was an important matter to me at this time, I had decided that if my aversion to the room was so strongly marked on my return, as it had been before, I would move my bed down into the sitting-room and sleep there. This was, I argued, in no sense a concession to an absurd and fanciful fear, but simply a precaution to ensure a good night's sleep. A bad night involved the loss of the next day's reading, a loss I was not prepared to incur. I accordingly moved my bed downstairs into a corner of the sitting-room facing the door, and was moreover uncommonly glad when the operation was completed, and the door of the bedroom closed finally upon the shadows, the silence, and the strange fear that shared the room with them. The croaking stroke of the kitchen clock sounded the hour of eight as I finished washing up my few dishes, and closing the kitchen door behind me, passed into the front room. All the lamps were lit, and their reflectors, which I had polished up during the day, threw a blaze of light into the room. Outside the night was still and warm, not a breath of air was stirring. The waves were silent, the trees motionless, and heavy clouds hung like an oppressive curtain over the heavens. The darkness seemed to have rolled up with unusual swiftness, and not the faintest glow of colour remained to show where the sun had set. There was present in the atmosphere that ominous and overwhelming silence which so often precedes the most violent storms. I sat down to my books with my brain unusually clear, and in my heart the pleasant satisfaction of knowing that five black bass were lying in the ice-house, and that to-morrow morning the old farmer would arrive with fresh bread and eggs, I was soon absorbed in my books. As the night wore on the silence deepened, even the chipmunks were still, and the boards of the floors and walls ceased creaking. I read on steadily till, from the gloomy shadows of the kitchen, came the hoarse sounds of the clock striking nine. How loud the strokes sounded! They were like blows of a big hammer. I closed one book and opened another, feeling that I was just warming up to my work. This, however, did not last long. I presently found that I was reading the same paragraphs over twice, simple paragraphs that did not require such effort. Then I noticed that my mind began to wander to other things, and the effort to recall my thoughts became harder with each digression. Concentration was growing momentarily more difficult. Presently I discovered that I had turned over two pages instead of one, and had not noticed my mistake until I was well down the page. This was becoming serious. What was the disturbing influence? Could not be physical fatigue. On the contrary, my mind was unusually alert, and in a more receptive condition than usual. I made a new and determined effort to read, and for a short time succeeded in giving my whole attention to my subject. But in a very few moments again I found myself leaning back in my chair, staring vacantly into space. Something was evidently at work in my subconsciousness. There was something I had neglected to do. Perhaps the kitchen door and windows were not fastened. I accordingly went to see and found that they were. The fire perhaps needed attention. I went in to see and found that it was all right. I looked at the lamps, went upstairs into every bedroom in turn, and then went round the house, and even into the ice house. Nothing was wrong. Everything was in its place. Yet something was wrong. The conviction grew stronger and stronger within me. When I, at length, settled down to my books again and tried to read, I became aware for the first time that the room seemed growing cold. Yet the day had been oppressively warm, and evening had brought no relief. The six big lamps, moreover, gave out heat enough to warm the room pleasantly. But a chilliness that perhaps crept up from the lake made itself felt in the room and caused me to get up to close the glass door opening on to the veranda. For a brief moment I stood looking out at the shaft of light that fell from the windows and shone some little distance down the pathway and out for a few feet into the lake. As I looked, 
I saw a canoe glide into the pathway of light, and immediately crossing it pass out of sight again into the darkness. It was perhaps a hundred feet from the shore, and it moved swiftly. I was surprised that a canoe should pass the island at that time of night, for all the summer visitors from the other side of the lake had gone home weeks before, and the island was a long way out of any line of water traffic. My reading from this moment did not make very good progress, for somehow the picture of that canoe, gliding so dimly and swiftly across the narrow track of light in the black waters, silhouetted itself against the background of my mind with singular vividness. It kept coming between my eyes and the printed page. The more I thought about it, the more surprised I became. It was of larger build than any that I had seen during the past summer months, and was more like the old Indian war canoes with the high curving bows and stern and wide beam. The more I tried to read, the less success attended my efforts, and finally I closed my books and went out on the veranda to walk up and down a bit and shake the chilliness out of my bones. The night was perfectly still, and as dark as imaginable. I stumbled down the path to the little landing wharf where the water made the very faintest of gurgling under the timbers. The sound of a big tree falling in the mainland forest far across the lake stirred echoes in the heavy air, like the first guns of a distant night attack. No other sound disturbed the stillness that reigned supreme. As I stood upon the wharf in the broad splash of light that followed me from the sitting-room windows, I saw another canoe cross the pathway of uncertain light upon the water, and disappear at once into the impenetrable gloom that lay beyond. This time I saw more distinctly than before. It was like the former canoe, a big birch bark with high-crested bows and stern and broad beam. It was paddled by two Indians, of whom the one in the stern, the steerer, appeared to be a very large man. I could see this very plainly, and though the second canoe was much nearer the island than the first, I judged that they were both on their way home to the government reservation, which was situated some fifteen miles away from the mainland. I was wondering in my mind what could possibly bring any Indians down to this part of the lake at such an hour of the night, when a third canoe, of precisely similar built, and also occupied by two Indians passed silently round the end of the wharf. This time the canoe was very much nearer shore, and it suddenly flashed into my mind that the three canoes were in reality one and the same, and that only one canoe was circling the island. This was by no means a pleasant reflection, because, if it were the correct solution of the unusual appearance of the three canoes in this lonely part of the lake at so late an hour, the purpose of the two men could only reasonably be considered to be in some way connected with myself. I had never known of the Indians attempting any violence upon the settlers who shared the wild, inhospitable country with them. At the same time, it was not beyond the region of possibility to suppose. But then I did not care even to think of such hideous possibilities, and my imagination immediately sought relief in all manner of other solutions to the problem, which indeed came readily enough to my mind but did not succeed in recommending themselves to my reason. Meanwhile, by a sort of instinct, I stepped back out of the bright light in which I had hitherto been standing, and waited in the deep shadow of a rock to see if the canoe would again make its appearance. Here I could see without being seen, and the precaution seemed a wise one. After less than five minutes, the canoe, as I had anticipated, made its fourth appearance. This time it was not twenty yards from the wharf, and I saw that the Indians meant to land, I recognized the two men as those who had passed before, and the steerer was certainly an immense fellow. It was unquestionably the same canoe. There could be no longer any doubt that, for some purpose of their own, the men had been going round and round the island for some time, waiting for an opportunity to land. I strained my eyes to follow them in the darkness, but the night had completely swallowed them up, and not even the faintest swish of the paddles reached my ears as the Indians plied their long and powerful strokes. The canoe would be round again in a few moments, and this time it was possible that the men might land. It was well to be prepared. I knew nothing of their intentions, and two to one, when the two are big Indians, late at night on a lonely island, was not exactly my idea of pleasant intercourse. In a corner of the sitting-room, leaning up against the back wall, stood my marlin rifle, with ten cartridges in the magazine, and one lying snugly in the grease breech. There was just time to get up to the house and take up a position of defence in that corner. Without an instant's hesitation, I ran up to the veranda, carefully picking my way among the trees so as to avoid being seen in the light. Entering the room, I shut the door leading to the veranda, and as quickly as possible turned out every one of the six lamps. To be in a room so brilliantly lighted, 
where my every movement could be observed from outside, while I could see nothing but impenetrable darkness at every window, was by all laws of warfare an unnecessary concession to the enemy. And this enemy, if enemy it was to be, was far too wily and dangerous to be granted any such advantages. I stood in the corner of the room with my back against the wall, and my hand on the cold rifle barrel. The table covered with my books lay between me and the door, and for the first few minutes after the lights were out, the darkness was so intense that nothing could be discerned at all. Then, very gradually, the outline of the room became visible, and the framework of the windows began to shape itself dimly before my eyes. After a few minutes, the door, its upper half of glass, and the two windows that looked out upon the front veranda became specially distinct, and I was glad that this was so because if the Indians came up to the house, I should be able to see their approach and gather something of their plans. Nor was I mistaken, for there presently came to my ears the peculiar hollow sound of a canoe landing, and being carefully dragged up over the rocks, the paddles I distinctly heard being placed underneath, and the silence that ensued thereupon I rightly interpreted to mean that the Indians were stealthily approaching the house. While it would be absurd to claim that I was not alarmed, even frightened at the gravity of the situation and its possible outcome, I speak the whole truth when I say that I was not overwhelmingly afraid for myself. I was conscious that even at this stage of the night I was passing into a psychical condition in which my sensations seemed no longer normal. Physical fear at no time entered into the nature of my feelings, and though I kept my hand upon my rifle the greater part of the night, I was all the time conscious that its assistance would be of little avail against the terrors that I had to face. More than once I seemed to feel most curiously that I was in no real sense a part of the proceedings, nor actually involved in them, but that I was playing the part of a spectator, a spectator, moreover, on a psychic rather than on a material plane. Many of my sensations that night were too vague for definite description and analysis, but the main feeling that will stay with me to the end of my days is the awful horror of it all, and the miserable sensation that if the strain had lasted a little longer than was actually the case, my mind must inevitably have given away. Meanwhile, I stood still in my corner and waited patiently for what was to come. The house was as still as a grave, but the inarticulate voices of the night sang in my ears, and I seemed to hear the blood running in my veins and dancing in my pulses. If the Indians came to the back of the house, they would find the kitchen door and window securely fastened. They could not get in there without making considerable noise, which I was bound to hear. The only mode of getting in was by means of the door that faced me, and I kept my eyes glued on that door without taking them off for the smallest fraction of a second. My sight adapted itself every minute better to the darkness. I saw the table that nearly filled the room, and left only a narrow passage on each side. I could also make out the straight backs of the wooden chairs pressed up against it, and could even distinguish my papers and inkstand lying on the white oilcloth covering. I thought of the gay faces that had gathered around that table during the summer, and I longed for the sunlight as I never longed for it before. Less than three feet to my left the passageway led to the kitchen, and the stairs leading to the bedrooms above commenced in this passageway, but almost in the sitting-room itself. Through the windows I could see the dim motionless outlines of the trees. Not a leaf stirred, not a branch moved. A few moments of this awful silence, and then I was aware of a soft tread on the boards of the veranda so stealthy that it seemed an impression directly on my brain rather than upon the nerves of the hearing. Immediately afterwards a black figure darkened the glass door, and I perceived that a face was pressed against the upper panes. A shiver ran down my back, and my hair was conscious of a tendency to rise and stand at right angles to my head. It was a figure of an Indian, broad-shouldered and immense, indeed the largest figure of a man I have ever seen outside of a circus hall. By some power of light that seemed to generate itself in the brain, I saw the strong dark face with the aquiline nose and high cheekbones flattened against the glass. The direction of the gaze I could not determine, but faint gleams of light as the big eyes rolled round and showed their whites told me plainly that no corner of the room escaped their searching. For what seemed fully five minutes, the dark figure stood there, with the huge shoulders bent forward so as to bring the head down to the level of the glass, while behind him, Though not nearly so large, the shadowy form of the other Indian swayed to and fro like a bent tree. While I waited in an agony of suspense and agitation for the next movement, little currents of icy sensation ran up and down my spine and my heart seemed alternately to stop beating and then start off again with terrifying rapidity. They must have heard its thumping and the singing of the blood in my head. 
Moreover, I was conscious, as I felt a cold stream of perspiration trickle down my face, of a desire to scream, to shout, to bang the walls like a child, to make a noise or do anything that would relieve the suspense and bring things to a speedy climax. It was probably this inclination that led me to another discovery, for when I tried to bring my rifle from behind my back to raise it and have it pointed at the door ready to fire, I found that I was powerless to move. The muscles, paralyzed by this strange fear, refused to obey the will. Here, indeed, it was a terrifying complication. There was a faint sound of rattling at the brass knob, and the door was pushed open a couple of inches. A pause of a few seconds, and it was pushed open still further. Without a sound of footsteps, that was appreciable to my ears, the two figures glided into the room, and the man behind gently closed the door after him. They were alone with me between the four walls. Could they see me standing there so still and straight in my corner? Had they perhaps already seen me? My blood surged and sang like the roll of drums in an orchestra, and though I did my best to suppress my breathing, it sounded like the rushing of wind through a pneumatic tube. My suspense as to the next move was soon at an end, only, however, to give place to a new and keener alarm. The men had hitherto exchanged no words and no signs, but there were general inclinations of a movement across the room, and whichever way they went they would have to pass round the table. If they came my way they would have to pass within six inches of my person. While I was considering this very disagreeable possibility, I perceived that the smaller Indian, smaller by comparison, suddenly raised his arm and pointed to the ceiling. The other fellow raised his head and followed the direction of his companion's arm. I began to understand at last. They were going upstairs, and the room directly overhead to which they pointed had been until this night my bedroom. It was a room in which I had experienced that very morning so strange a sensation of fear, and but for which I should then have been lying asleep in the narrow bed against the window. The Indians began to move silently around the room. They were going upstairs, and they were coming round my side of the table. So stealthy were their movements that, but for the abnormally sensitive state of the nerves, I should never have heard them. As it was, their cat-like tread was distinctly audible. Like two monstrous black cats, they came round the table toward me, and for the first time I perceived that the smaller of the two dragged something along the floor behind him. As it trailed along over the floor with a soft, sweeping sound, I somehow got the impression that it was a large, dead thing with outstretched wings, or a large, spreading cedar branch. Whatever it was, I was unable to see it even in outline, and I was too terrified, even had I possessed the power over my muscles, to move my neck forward in the effort to determine its nature. Nearer and nearer they came. The leader rested a giant hand upon the table as he moved. My lips were glued together, and the air seemed to burn in my nostrils. I tried to close my eyes, so that I might not see as they passed me, but my eyelids had stiffened and refused to obey. Would they never get by me? Sensation seemed also to have left my legs, and it was as if I were standing on mere supports of wood or stone. Worse still, I was conscious that I was losing the power of balance, the power to stand upright or even to lean backwards against the wall. Some force was drawing me forward, and a dizzy terror seized me that I should lose my balance and topple forward against the Indians just as they were in the act of passing me. Even moments drawn out into hours must come to an end sometime, and almost before I knew it, the figures had passed me and had their feet upon the lower step of the stairs leading to the upper bedrooms. They could not have been six inches between us, and yet I was conscious only of a current of cold air that followed them. They had not touched me, and I was convinced that they had not seen me. Even the trailing thing on the floor behind them had not touched my feet, as I had dreaded it would, and on such an occasion as this I was grateful even for the smallest mercies. The absence of the Indians from my immediate neighborhood brought little sense of relief. I stood shivering and shuddering in my corner, and beyond being able to breathe more freely, I felt no whit less uncomfortable. Also, I was aware that a certain light, which without apparent source or rays, had enabled me to follow their very gesture and movement, had gone out of the room with their departure, and a natural darkness now filled the room and pervaded its every corner, so that I could barely make out the positions of the windows and the glass doors. As I said before, my condition was evidently an abnormal one. The capacity for feeling surprise seemed, as in dreams, to be wholly absent. My senses recorded with such unusual accuracy every smallest occurrence, but I was able to draw only the simplest deductions. 
the Indians soon reached the top of the stairs, and there they halted for a moment. I had not the faintest clue as to their next movement. They appeared to hesitate. They were listening attentively. Then I heard one of them, who by the weight of his soft tread must have been the giant, cross the narrow corridor and enter the room directly overhead, my own little bedroom. But for the insistence of that unaccountable dread I had experienced there in the morning, I should at that very moment have been lying in the bed with the big Indian in the room standing beside me. For the space of a hundred seconds there was silence, such as might have existed before the birth of sound. It was followed by a long quivering shriek of terror, which rang out into the night, and ended in a short gulp before it had run its full course. At the same moment, the other Indian left his place at the head of the stairs and joined his companion in the bedroom. I heard the thing trailing behind him along the floor. A thud followed, as of something heavy falling. And then all became as still and silent as before. It was at this point that the atmosphere, surcharged all day with the electricity of a fierce storm, found relief in a dancing flash of brilliant lightning simultaneously with a crash of loudest thunder. For five seconds every article in the room was visible to me with amazing distinctness, and through the windows I saw the tree trunks standing in solemn rows. The thunder pealed and echoed across the lake, and among the distant islands, and the floodgates of heaven then opened and let out her rain in streaming torrents. The drops fell with a swift rushing sound upon the still waters of the lake, which leaped up to meet them and pattered with the rattle of shot on the leaves of the maples and the roof of the cottage. A moment later, and another flash, even more brilliant and of longer duration than the first, lit up the sky from zenith to horizon and bathed the room momentarily in dazzling whiteness. I could see the rain glistening on the leaves and branches outside. The wind rose suddenly, and in less than a minute the storm that had been gathering all day burst forth in its full fury. Above all the noisy voices of the elements, the slightest sounds in the room overhead made themselves heard, and in the few seconds of deep silence that followed the shriek of terror and pain, I was aware that the movements had commenced again. The men were leaving the room and approached the top of the stairs. A short pause, and they began to descend. Behind them, tumbling from step to step, I could hear that trailing thing being dragged along. It had become ponderous. I waited their approach with a degree of calmness, almost of apathy, which was only explicable on the ground that after a certain point nature applies her own anaesthetic, and a merciful condition of numbness supervenes. On they came, step by step, nearer and nearer, with the shuffling sound of the burden behind growing louder as they approached. They were already halfway down the stairs when I was galvanized afresh into a condition of terror by the consideration of a new and horrible possibility. It was a reflection that if another vivid flash of lightning were to come, when the shadowy procession was in the room, perhaps when it was actually passing in front of me, I should see everything in detail, and worse, be seen myself. I could only hold my breath and wait, wait while the minutes lengthened into hours, and the procession made its slow progress round the room. The Indians had reached the foot of the staircase, the form of the huge leader loomed in the doorway of the passage, and the burden with an ominous thud had dropped from the last step to the floor. There was a moment's pause while I saw the Indian turn and stoop to assist his companion. Then the procession moved forward again, entered the room close on my left, and began to move slowly round my side of the table. The leader was already beyond me, and his companion dragging on the floor behind him the burden, whose confused outline I could dimly make out, was exactly in front of me, when the cavalcade came to a dead halt. At the same moment, with the strange suddenness of thunderstorms, the splash of rain ceased altogether, and the wind died away into utter silence. For the space of five seconds, my heart seemed to stop beating, and then the worst came. A double flash of lightning lit up the room and its contents with merciless vividness. The huge Indian leader stood a few feet past me on my right. One leg was stretched forward in the act of taking a step, his immense shoulders were turned toward his companion, and in all their magnificent fierceness I saw the outline of his features. His gaze was directed upon the burden his companion was dragging along the floor, but his profile, with the big aquiline nose, high cheekbone, straight black hair and bold chin, burned itself in that brief instant into my brain, never again to fade. Dwarfish compared with his gigantic figure appeared the proportions of the other Indian, who, within twelve inches of my face, 
was stooping over the thing he was dragging in a position that lent to his person the additional horror of deformity and the burden lying upon a sweeping cedar branch which he held and dragged by a long stem was the body of a white man the scalp had been neatly lifted and blood lay in a broad smear upon the cheeks and forehead then for the first time that night the terror that had paralyzed my muscles and my will lifted its unholy spell from my soul with a loud cry i stretched out my arms to seize the big indian by the throat and by grasping only air tumbled forward unconscious upon the ground i had recognized the body and the face was my own it was bright daylight when a man's voice recalled me to consciousness i was lying where i had fallen and the farmer was standing in the room with the loaves of bread in his hands the horror of the night was still in my heart and as the bluff settler helped me to my feet and picked up the rifle which had fallen with me with many questions and expressions of condolence i imagine my brief replies were neither self-explanatory nor even intelligible that day after a thorough and fruitless search of the house i left the island and went over to spend my last ten days with a farmer and when the time came for me to leave the necessary reading had been accomplished and my nerves had completely recovered their balance on the day of my departure the farmer started early in his big boat with my belongings to row to the point twelve miles distant where a little steamer ran twice a week for the accommodation of hunters late in the afternoon i went off in another direction in my canoe wishing to see the island once again where i had been the victim of so strange an experience in due course i arrived there and made a tour of the island i also made a search of the little house and it was not without a curious sensation in my heart that i entered the little upstairs bedroom there seemed nothing unusual just after i re-embarked i saw a canoe gliding ahead of me round the curve of the island a canoe was an unusual sight at this time of the year and this one seemed to have sprung from nowhere altering my course a little i watched it disappear around the next projecting point of rock it had high curving bows and there were two indians in it i lingered with some excitement to see if it would reappear again round the other side of the island and in less than five minutes it came into view there were less than two hundred yards between us and the indians sitting on their haunches were paddling swiftly in my direction i never paddled faster in my life than i did in those next few minutes when i turned to look again the indians had altered their course and were again circling the island the sun was sinking behind the forests on the mainland and the crimson colored clouds of sunset were reflected in the waters of the lake when i looked round for the last time and saw the big bark canoe and its two dusky occupants still going round the island then the shadows deepened rapidly the lake grew black and the night wind blew its first breath in my face as i turned a corner and a projecting bluff of rock hid my view from both island and canoe end of the haunted island by algernon blackwood read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama The Statement of Randolph Carter by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Lau. The Statement of Randolph Carter by H. P. Lovecraft. I repeat you, gentlemen, that your inquisition is fruitless. Detain me here for ever, if you will. Confine or execute me, if you must have a victim to appropriate the illusion you call justice. But I can say no more than I have said already. Everything that I can remember I have told with perfect candor. Nothing has been distorted or concealed, and if anything remains vague, it is only because of the dark cloud which has come over my mind. That cloud and a nebulous nature of the horrors which brought it upon me. Again, I say, I do not know what has become of Harley Warren, though I think almost hope that he is in peaceful oblivion, if there be anywhere so blessed a thing. It is true that I have for five years been his closest friend, and a partial sharer of his terrible researches into the unknown. 
I will not deny, though, my memory is uncertain and indistinct, that this witness of yours may have seen us together, as he says, on a Gainesville pike, walking toward Big Cypress Swamp at half-past eleven on that awful night, that we bore electric lanterns, spades, and a curious coil of wire with attached instruments. I will even affirm for these things, all played a part in the single hideous scene which remains burned into my shaken recollection. But of what followed, and of the reason I was found alone and dazed on the edge of the swamp next morning, I must insist that I know nothing save what I have told you over and over again. You say to me that there is nothing in the swamp or near it which could form the setting of that frightful episode. I reply that I knew nothing beyond what I saw. Vision or nightmare it may have been. Vision or nightmare I fervently hope it was. Yet it is all that my mind retains of what took place in those shocking hours after we left the sight of men. And why Harley Warren did not return, or some nameless thing I cannot describe, alone can tell. As I have said before, the weird studies of Harley Warren were well known to me, and to some extent shared by me, of his vast collection of strange, rare books. On forbidden subjects I have read all that are written in the language of which I am master, but these are few as compared with those in languages I cannot understand. Most, I believe, are in Arabic, and the fiend-inspired book, which brought on the end. The book which he carried in his pocket out of the world was written in characters whose like I never saw elsewhere. Warren would never tell me just what was in that book. As to the nature of our studies, must I say again that I no longer retain full comprehension? It seems to me rather merciful that I do not, for they were terrible studies, which I pursued more through reluctant fascination than through actual inclination. Warren always dominated me, and sometimes I feared him. I remember how I shuddered at his facial expression on the night before the awful happening, when he talked so incessantly of his theory, why certain corpses never decay but rest firm and fat in their tombs for a thousand years. But I do not fear him now, for I suspect that he has known horrors beyond my ken. Now I fear for him. Once more I say that I have no clear idea of our object on that night. Certainly it had much to do with something in the book which Warren carried with him, that ancient book, in undecipherable characters, which had come to him from India a month before. But I swear... I do not know what it was that we expected to find. Your witness says he saw us at half-past eleven, on a Gainesville pike, headed for a big cypress swamp. This is probably true, but I have no distinct memory of it. The picture seared into my soul is of one scene only, and the hour must have been long after midnight, for a waning crescent moon was high in the vaporous heavens. The place was an ancient cemetery, so ancient that I trembled at the manifold signs of immemorial years. It was in a deep, damp hollow, overgrown with rank grass, moss, and curious creeping weeds, and filled with a vague stench which my idle fancy associated absurdly with rotting stone. On every hand were the signs of neglect and decrepitude, and I seemed haunted by the notion that Warren and I were the first living creatures to invade a lethal silence of centuries. Over the valley's rim, a wan, waning crescent moon peered through the noisome vapors that seemed to emanate from unheard of catacombs, and by its feeble, wavering beams, I could distinguish a repellent array of antique slabs, urns, cenotaphs, and mausoleum facades, all crumbling, moss-grown, and moisture-stained, and partly concealed by the gross luxuriance of the unhealthy vegetation. My first vivid impression of my own presence in this terrible necropolis concerns the act of pausing with Warren before a certain half-obliterated sepulchre and of throwing down some burdens, which we seem to have been carrying. I now observe that I had with me an electric lantern and two spades, whilst my companion was supplied with a similar lantern and a portable telephone outfit. No word was uttered for the spot and a task seemed known to us, and without delay we seized our spades and commenced to clear away the grass, weeds, and drifted earth from the flat, archaic mortuary. After uncovering the entire surface, which consisted of three immense granite slabs, 
we stepped back some distance to survey the charnel scene, and Warren appeared to make some mental calculations. Then he returned to the sepulchre, and, using his spade as a lever, sought to pry up the slab lying nearest to a stony ruin, which may have been a monument in its day. He did not succeed, and motioned to me to come to his assistance. Finally, our combined strength loosened the stone, which we raised and tipped to one side. The removal of the slab revealed a black aperture, from which rushed an effluence of miasmal gases so nauseous that we started back in horror. After an interval, however, we approached the pit again, and found the exhalations less unbearable. Our lanterns disclosed the top of a flight of stone steps, dripping with some detestable ichor of the inner earth, and bordered by moist walls, and crusted with nitre. And now, for the first time, my memory records verbal discourse. Warren, addressing me at length in his mellow tenor voice, a voice singularly unperturbed by our awesome surroundings. I'm sorry to have to ask you to stand the surface, he said, but it would be a crime to let anyone with your frail nerves go down there. You can't imagine, even from what you have read, and from what I've told you, the things I shall have to see and do. It's fiendish work, Carter, and I doubt if any man without ironclad sensibilities could ever see it through and come up alive and sane. I don't wish to offend you, and heaven knows I'd be glad to have you with me, but the responsibility is, in a certain sense, mine, and I couldn't drag a bundle of nerves like you down to probable death or madness. I tell you, you can't imagine what the thing is really like. But I promise to keep you informed over the telephone of every move. You see, I've enough wire here to reach the center of the earth and back. I can still hear, in memory, those coolly spoken words, and I can still remember my remonstrances. I seem desperately anxious to accompany my friend into those sepulchral depths. Yet he proved inflexibly obdurate. At one time he threatened to abandon the expedition if I remained insistent, a threat which proved effective, since he alone held the key to the thing. All this I can still remember, though I no longer know what manner of thing we sought. After he had obtained my reluctant acquiescence in his design, Warren picked up the reel of wire and adjusted the instruments. At his nod I took one of the latter, and seated myself upon an aged, discolored gravestone close by the newly uncovered aperture. Then he shook my hand, shouldered the coil of wire, and disappeared within that indescribable ossuary. For a minute I kept sight of the glow of his lantern, and heard the rustle of the wire as he laid it down after him, but the glow soon disappeared abruptly as if a turn in a stone staircase had been encountered, and a sound died away almost as quickly. I was alone, yet bound to the unknown depths by those magic strands whose insulated surface lay green beneath the struggling beams of that waning crescent moon. In the lone silence of that hoary and deserted city of the dead, my mind conceived the most ghastly fantasies and illusions, and the grotesque shrines and monoliths seemed to assume a hideous personality, a half senience Amorphous shadows seemed to lurk in the darker recesses of the weed-choked hollow, and to flit as in some blasphemous ceremonial procession past the portals of the mouldering tombs in the hillside, shadows which could not have been cast by that pallid, peering crescent moon. I constantly consulted my watch by the light of my electric lantern, and listened with feverish anxiety at the receiver of the telephone. But for more than a quarter of an hour heard nothing, then a faint clicking came from the instrument, and I called down to my friend in a tense voice. Apprehensive as I was, I was nevertheless unprepared for the words which came up from that uncanny vault, in accents more alarmed and quivering than any I had heard before from Harley Warren. He, who had so calmly left me a little while previously, now called from below in a shaky whisper, more portentous than the loudest shriek. God, if you could see what I am seeing! I could not answer. Speechless, I could only wait. Then came the frenzied tones again. Carter, it's terrible, monstrous, unbelievable. This time my voice did not fail me, and I poured into the transmitter a flood of excited questions. Terrified, I continued to repeat, Warren, what is it? What is it? Once more came the voice of my friend, still hoarse with fear, and now apparently tinged with despair. 
I can't tell you, Carter. It's too utterly beyond thought. I dare not tell you. No man could know it and live. Great God! I never dreamed of this. Stillness again, save for my now incoherent torrent of shuddering inquiry. Then the voice of Warren, in a pitch of wilder consternation. Carter, for the love of God, put back the slab and get out of this if you can. Quick, leave everything else and make for the outside. It's your only chance. Do as I say, and don't ask me to explain. I heard it was able only to repeat my frantic questions. Around me were the tombs and the darkness and the shadows. Below me, some peril beyond the radius of the human imagination. But my friend was in greater danger than I, and through my fear I felt a vague resentment that he should deem me capable of deserting him under such circumstances. More clicking, and after a pause, a piteous cry from Warren. Beat it! For God's sake! Put the slab back and beat it, Carter! Something in the boyish slang of my evidently stricken companion unleashed my faculties. I formed and shouted a resolution. Warren! Brace up! I'm coming down! But at this offer, the tone of my auditor changed to a scream of utter despair. Don't! You can't understand! It's too late, and my own fault! Put back the slab and run! There's nothing else you or anyone can do now! The tone changed again, acquiring a softer quality, as of hopeless resignation. Yet it remained tense through anxiety for me. Quick, before it's too late! I tried not to heed him tried to break through the paralysis which held me, and to fulfill my vow to rush down to his aid. But his next whisper found me still, held inert in the chains of stark horror. Carter, hurry, it's no use. You must go. Better one than two. The slab. A pause, more clicking, then the faint voice of Warren. Nearly over now. Don't make it harder. Cover up those damn steps and run for your life. You're losing time. So long, Carter. Won't see you again. Here, Warren's whisper swelled into a cry. A cry that gradually rose to a shriek, fraught with all the horror of the ages. Curse these hellish things! Lesions! My God! Beat it! Beat it! Beat it! After that was silence. I know not how many interminable eons I sat stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into that telephone. Over and over again, through those eons, I whispered and muttered, called, shouted, and screamed, Warren! Warren! Answer me! Are you there? And then there came to me the crowning horror of all, the unbelievable, unthinkable, almost unmentionable thing. I have said that eons seemed to elapse after Warren shrieked forth his last despairing warning and that only my own cries now broke the hideous silence. But after a while there was a fervor clicking in the receiver, and I strained my ears to listen. Again I called down, Warren, are you there? And in answer I heard of the thing which has brought this cloud over my mind. I do not try, gentlemen, to account for that thing, that voice, nor can I venture to describe it in detail since the first words took away my consciousness and created a mental blank which reaches to the time of my awakening in the hospital. Shall I say that the voice was deep, hollow, gelatinous, remote, unearthly, disembodied? What shall I say? It was the end of my experience, and is the end of my story. I heard it, and knew no more, heard it as I sat petrified in that unknown cemetery in the hollow, amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and the miasmal vapors, heard it well up from the innermost depths of that damnable open sepulchre as I watched amorphous necrophagous shadows dance beneath an accursed waning moon, and this is what it said. You fool! Warren is dead! End of the Statement of Randolph Carter Recording by Alex Lau, Manchester, United Kingdom, 2012. The Alchemist by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Lau. The Alchemist by H. P. Lovecraft. High up, crowning the grassy summit of a swelling mound, whose sides are wooded near the base with the gnarled trees of the primeval forest, stands the old chateau of my ancestors. For centuries its lofty battlements have frowned down upon the wild and rugged countryside about, serving as a home and stronghold for the proud house whose honoured line is older even than the moss-grown castle walls. These ancient turrets, stained by the storms of generation and crumbling under the slow yet mighty pressure of time, formed in the ages of feudalism, one of the most dreaded and formidable fortresses in all of France. From its machicolated parapets and mounted battlements, barons, counts, and even kings had been defied, yet never had its spacious halls resounded to the footstep of the invader. But since those glorious years, all is changed. A poverty but little above the level of dire want, together with a pride of name that forbids its alleviation by the pursuits of commercial life, have prevented the scions of our line from maintaining their estates in pristine splendour, and the falling stones of the walls, the overgrown vegetation in the parks, the dry and dusty moat, the ill-paved courtyards and toppling towers without, as well as the sagging floors, the worm-eaten wainscots, and the faded tapestries within, all tell a gloomy tale of fallen grandeur. As the ages passed, first one, then another, of the four great turrets were left to ruin, until at last but a single tower housed the sadly reduced descendants of the once mighty lords of the estate. It was in one of these vast and gloomy chambers of this remaining tower that I, Antoine, last of the unhappy and accursed Comte de C, first saw the light of day ninety long years ago. Within these walls and amongst the dark and shadowy forests, the wild ravines and grottoes of the hillside below, were spent the first years of my troubled life. My parents I never knew. My father had been killed at the age of thirty-two, a month before I was born, by the fall of a stone somehow dislodged from one of the deserted parapets of the castle, and my mother having died at my birth. My care and education devolved solely upon one remaining servitor, an old and trusted man of considerable intelligence, whose name I remember as Pierre. I was an only child, and the lack of companionship which this fact entailed upon me was augmented by the strange care exercised by my aged guardian. In excluding me from the society of the peasant children, whose abodes were scattered here and there, upon the plains that surround the base of the hill. At the time, Pierre said that this restriction was imposed upon me because my noble birth placed me above association with such plebeian company. Now I know that its real object was to keep from my ears the idle tales of the dread curse upon our line, that were nightly told and magnified by the simple tenantry as they conversed in hushed accents in the glow of their cottage hearths. Thus isolated and thrown upon my own resources, I spent the hours of my childhood in poring over the ancient tombs that filled the shadow-haunted library of the chateau, and in roaming without aim or purpose through the perpetual dusk of the spectral wood that cloves the sides of the hill near its foot. It was perhaps an effect of such surroundings that my mind early acquired a shade of melancholy those studies and pursuits which partake of the dark and occult in nature most strongly claimed my attention. Of my own race I was permitted to learn singularly little, yet what small knowledge of it I was able to gain seemed to depress me much. Perhaps it was at first only the manifest reluctance of my old preceptor to discuss with me my paternal ancestry, that gave rise to the terror which I ever felt at the mention of my great house. Yet as I grew out of childhood, I was able to piece together disconnected fragments of discourse, 
let slip from the unwilling tongue which had begun to falter in approaching senility, that had a sort of relation to a certain circumstance which I had always deemed strange, but which now became dimly terrible. The circumstance to which I allude is the early age at which all the comptes of my line had met their end. Whilst I had hitherto considered this but a natural attribute of a family of short-lived men, I afterward pondered long upon these premature deaths, and began to connect them with the wanderings of the old man, who often spoke of a curse, which for centuries had prevented the lives of the holders of my title from exceeding the span of thirty-two years. Upon my twenty-first birthday, the aged Pierre gave to me a family document, which he said had for many generations been handed down from father to son, and continued by each possessor. Its contents were of the most startling nature, and its perusal confirmed the gravest of my apprehensions. At this time, my belief in the supernatural was firm and deep-seated, else I should have dismissed with scorn the incredible narrative unfolded before my eyes. The paper carried me back to the days of the thirteenth century, when the old castle in which I sat had been a feared and impregnable fortress. It told of a certain ancient man who had once dwelt on our estates, a person of no small accomplishments, though little above the rank of peasant, by name Michel, usually designated by the surname of Mauvais, the evil, on account of his sinister reputation. He had studied beyond the custom of his kind, seeking such things as the Philosopher's Stone, or the elixir of eternal life, and was reputed wise in the terrible secrets of black magic and alchemy. Michel Mauvais had one son named Charles, a youth as proficient as himself in the hidden arts, and who had therefore been called Le Sorcier, or the Wizard. This pair, shunned by all honest folk, were suspected of the most hideous practices. Old Michel was said to have burnt his wife alive as a sacrifice to the devil, and the unaccountable disappearances of many small peasant children were laid at the dreaded door of these two. Yet through the dark natures of the father and the son ran one redeeming ray of humanity. The evil old man loved his offspring with fierce intensity, whilst the youth had for his parent a more than filial affection. One night the castle on the hill was thrown into the wildest confusion by the vanishment of young Godfrey, son to Henry de Comte. A searching party, headed by the frantic father, invaded the cottage of the sorcerers, and there came upon old Michel Mauvais, busy over a huge and violently boiling cauldron. Without certain cause, in the ungoverned madness of fury and despair, the Comte laid hands on the aged wizard and ere he released his murderous hold, his victim was no more. Meanwhile, joyful servants were proclaiming aloud the finding of young Godfrey in a distant and unused chamber of the great edifice, telling too late that poor Michel had been killed in vain. As the Comte and his associates turned away from the lowly abode of the alchemists, the form of Charles Le Saucier appeared through the trees, the excited chatter of the menials standing about, told him what had occurred, yet he seemed at first unmoved by his father's fate. He pronounced in dull yet terrible accents the curse that ever afterward haunted the house of C. May never a noble of thy murderous line survive to reach a greater age than thine, spake he, when suddenly, leaping backward into the black wood, he drew from his tunic a phial of colourless liquid which he threw in the face of his father's slayer as he disappeared behind the inky curtain of the night. The Comte died without utterance and was buried the next day, but little more than two and thirty years from the hour of his birth. No trace of the assassin could be found. The relentless bands of peasants scoured the neighbouring woods and the meadow land around the hill. Thus... Time and the want of a remainder dulled the memory of the curse in the minds of the late Comte's family, so that when Godfrey, innocent cause of the whole tragedy, and now bearing the title, was killed by an arrow whilst hunting, at the age of thirty-two, 
there were no thoughts save those of grief at his demise. But when years afterward the next young Comte, Robert by name, was found dead in a nearby field from no apparent cause, the peasants told in whispers that their seigneur had but lately passed his thirty-second birthday, when surprised by early death, Louis sent to Robert was found drowned in the moat at the same fateful age, and thus down through the centuries ran the ominous chronicle. Henry's Robert, Antoine's and Armand's snatched from happy and virtuous lives, when a little below the age of their unfortunate ancestor at his murder. That I had left at most, but eleven years of further existence was made certain to me by the words which I read. My life, previously held at small value, now became dearer to me each day, as I delved deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the hidden world of black magic. Isolated as I was, modern science had produced no impression upon me, and I laboured as in the Middle Ages, as rapt as had been old Michel and young Charles themselves in the acquisition of demonological and alchemical learning. Yet read as I might, in no manner could I account for the strange curse upon my line. In unusually rational moments, I would even go so far as to seek a natural explanation, attributing the early deaths of my ancestors to the sinister Charles Le Saucier and his heirs, yet having found upon careful inquiry that there were no known descendants of the alchemist. I would fall back to my occult studies, and once more endeavour to find a spell that would release my house from its terrible burden. Upon one thing I was absolutely resolved. I should never wed, for since no other branches of my family were in existence, I might thus end the curse with myself. As I drew near the age of thirty, old Pierre was called to the land beyond. Alone I buried him, beneath the stones of the courtyard, about which he had loved to wander in life. Thus I was left to ponder on myself as the only human creature within the great fortress and in my utter solitude my mind began to cease its vain protest against the impending doom, to become almost reconciled to the fate which so many of my ancestors had met. Much of my time was now occupied in the exploration of the ruined and abandoned halls and towers of the old chateau, which in youth fear had caused me to shun, and some of which old Pierre had once told me had not been trodden by human foot for over four centuries. Strange and awesome were many of the objects I encountered. Furniture covered by the dust of ages, and crumbling with the rot of long dampness met my eyes. Cobwebs in a profusion never before seen by me were spun everywhere, and huge bats flapped their bony and uncanny wings on all sides of the otherwise untenanted gloom. Of my exact age, even down to days and hours, I kept a most careful record, for each movement of the pendulum of the massive clock in the library told off so much more of my doomed existence. At length I approached that time which I had so long viewed with apprehension, since most of my ancestors had been seized some little while before they reached the exact age of the Comte Henry at his end. I was every moment on the watch for the coming of the unknown death. In what strange form the curse should overtake me, I knew not, but I was resolved at least that it should not find me a cowardly or a passive victim. With new vigour I applied myself to my examination of the old chateau and its contents. It was upon one of the longest of all my excursions of discovery in the deserted portion of the castle less than a week before that fatal hour, which I must mark the utmost limit of my stay on earth, beyond which I could have not even the slightest hope of continuing to draw breath, that I came upon the culminating event of my whole life. I had spent the better part of the morning in climbing up and down half-ruined staircases in one of the most dilapidated of the ancient turrets. As the afternoon progressed, I sought the lower levels, descending into what appeared to be either a medieval place of confinement or a more recently excavated storehouse for gunpowder. As I slowly traversed the nitre-encrusted passageway at the foot of the last staircase, the paving became very damp, 
and soon I saw by the light of my flickering torch that a blank water-stained wall impeded my journey. Turning to retrace my steps, my eye fell upon a small trap-door with a ring, which lay directly beneath my feet. Pausing, I succeeded with difficulty in raising it, whereupon there was revealed a black aperture, exhaling noxious fumes which caused my torch to sputter, and disclosing in the unsteady glare the top of a flight of stone steps. As soon as the torch, which I lowered into the repellent depths, burned freely and steadily, I commenced my descent. The steps were many, and led to a narrow stone-flagged passage which I knew must be far underground. This passage proved of great length, and terminated in a massive oaken door, dripping with the moisture of the place, and stoutly resisting all my attempts to open it. Ceasing after a time my efforts in this direction, I had proceeded back some distance toward the steps, when there suddenly fell to my experience one of the most profound and maddening shocks capable of reception by the human mind. Without warning, I heard the heavy door behind me creak slowly open upon its rusted hinges. My immediate sensations are incapable of analysis. To be confronted in a place as thoroughly deserted as I had deemed the old castle, with evidence of the presence of man or spirit, produced in my brain a horror of the most acute description. When at last I turned and faced the seat of the sound, my eyes must have started from their orbits at the sight that they beheld. There in the ancient Gothic doorway stood a human figure. It was that of a man, clad in a skull-cap and a long medieval tunic of dark colour. His long hair and flowing beard were of a terrible and intense black hue, and of incredible profusion. His forehead high beyond the usual dimensions, his cheeks deep-sunken and heavily lined with wrinkles, and his hands, long, claw-like and gnarled, were of such a deathly marble whiteness as I have never elsewhere seen in a man. His figure, lean to the proportions of a skeleton, was strangely bent and almost lost within the voluminous folds of his peculiar garment. But strangest of all were his eyes, twin caves of abysmal blackness, profound in expression of understanding, yet inhuman in degree of wickedness. These were now fixed upon me, piercing my soul with their hatred, and rooting me to the spot whereon I stood. At last the figure spoke in a rumbling voice that chilled me through with its dull hollowness and latent malevolence. The language in which the discourse was clothed was that debased form of Latin in use amongst the more learned men of the Middle Ages, and made familiar to me by my prolonged researches into the works of the old alchemists and demonologists. The apparition spoke of the curse which had hovered over my house, told me of my coming end, dwelt on the wrong perpetrated by my ancestor against old Michel Morvet, and gloated over the revenge of Charles Le Sorcier. He told me how the young Charles had escaped into the night, returning in after years to kill Godfrey, the heir, with an arrow just as he approached the age which had been his father's at his assassination. How he had secretly returned to the estate, and established himself unknown in the even then deserted subterranean chamber, whose doorway now framed a hideous narrator. How he had seized Robert, son of Godfrey in a field, forced poison down his throat, and left him to die at the age of thirty-two, thus maintaining the foul provisions of his vengeful curse. At this point I was left to imagine the solution of the greatest mystery of all, how the curse had been fulfilled since that time when Charles Le Saucier must in the course of nature have died, for the man digressed into an account of the deep alchemical studies of the two wizards, father and son, speaking most particularly of the researches of Charles Le Saucier concerning the elixir which should grant to him who partook of it eternal life and youth. His enthusiasm had seemed for the moment to remove from his terrible eyes the hatred that had at first so haunted them. But suddenly the fiendish glare returned, and with a shocking sound like the hissing of a serpent, 
the stranger raised a glass phial with the evident intent of ending my life as had charles le sorcier six hundred years before ended that of my ancestor prompted by some persevering instinct of self-defence i broke through the spell that had hitherto held me immovable and flung my now dying torch at the creature who menaced my existence i heard the file break harmlessly against the stones of the passage as the tunic of the strange man caught fire and lit the horrid scene with a ghastly radiance the shriek of fright and impotent malice emitted by the would-be assassin proved too much for my already shaken nerves and i fell prone upon the slimy floor in a total faint when at last my senses returned all was frightfully dark and my mind remembering what had occurred shrank from the idea of beholding more yet curiosity overmastered all who i asked myself was this man of evil and how came he within the castle walls why should he seek to avenge the death of poor Michel Mauvais? And how had the curse been carried on through all the long centuries since the time of Charles Le Saucier? The dread of years was lifted off my shoulders, for I knew that he whom I had felled was the source of all my danger from the curse. And now that I was free, I burned with the desire to learn more of the sinister thing which had haunted my line for centuries and made of my own youth one long continued nightmare determined upon further exploration i felt in my pockets for flint and steel and lit the unused torch which i had with me first of all the new light revealed the distorted and blackened form of the mysterious stranger the hideous eyes were now closed disliking the sight i turned away and entered a chamber beyond the gothic door here I found what seemed much like an alchemist's laboratory. In the corner was an immense pile of a shining yellow metal that sparkled gorgeously in the light of the torch. It may have been gold, but I did not pause to examine it, for I was strangely affected by that which I had undergone. At the farther end of the apartment was an opening leading out into one of the many wild ravines of the dark hillside forest. Filled with wonder, yet now realising how the man had obtained access to the chateau, I proceeded to return. I had intended to pass by the remains of the stranger with averted face. But as I approached the body, I seemed to hear emanating from it a faint sound, as though life were not yet wholly extinct. Aghast, I turned to examine the charred and shriveled figure on the floor. Then... All at once, the horrible eyes, blacker even than the seared face in which they were set, opened wide with an expression which I was unable to interpret. The cracked lips tried to frame words which I could not well understand. Once I caught the name of Charles Le Sorcier, and again I fancied that the words years and curse issued from the twisted mouth. Still I was at a loss to gather the purport of his disconnected speech. At my evident ignorance of his meaning, the pitchy eyes once more flashed malevolently at me, until, helpless as I saw my opponent to be, I trembled as I watched him. Suddenly the wretch, animated with his last burst of strength, raised his hideous head from the damp and sunken pavement. Then, as I remained paralysed with fear, he found his voice, and in his dying breath screamed forth, those words which have ever afterward haunted my days and my nights. Fool! he shrieked. Can you not guess my secret? Have you no brain whereby you may recognize the will which has through six long centuries fulfilled the dreadful curse upon your house? Have I not told you of the great elixir of eternal life? Know you not how the secret of alchemy was solved? I tell you, it is I, 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 that have lived for six hundred years to maintain my revenge, for I am Charles Le Sorcier. End of the Alchemist Recording by Alex Lau Manchester, 2012
The Minister's Black Veil by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Minister's Black Veil. The sexton stood in the porch of Milford Meeting House, pulling busily at the bell rope. The old people of the village came stooping along the street. Children with bright faces tripped merrily besides their parents, or mimicked a graver gait in the conscious dignity of their Sunday clothes. Spruce bachelors looked sidelong at the pretty maidens, and fancied that the Sabbath sunshine made them prettier than on weekdays. When the throng had mostly streamed into the porch, the sexton began to toll the bell, keeping his eye on the Reverend Mr. Hooper's door. The first glimpse of the clergyman's figure was a signal for the bell to seize its summons. "'But what has good Parson Hooper got upon his face?' cried the sexton in astonishment. All within hearing immediately turned about, and beheld the semblance of Mr. Hooper, pacing slowly his meditative way towards the meeting-house. With one accord they started, expressing more wonder than if some strange minister were coming to dust the cushions of Mr. Hooper's pulpit. "'Are you sure it is our parson?' inquired Goodman Gray of the sexton. Of a certainty it is good, Mr. Hooper, replied the sexton. He was to have exchanged pulpits with Parson Shoot of Westbury, but Parson Shoot sent to excuse himself yesterday, being to preach a funeral sermon. The cause of so much amazement may appear sufficiently slight. Mr. Hooper, a gentlemanly parson of about thirty, though still a bachelor, was dressed with due clerical neatness, as if a careful wife had starched his bend and brushed the weekly dust from his Sunday's garb. There was but one thing remarkable in his appearance. Swathed about his forehead, and hanging down over his face, so low as to be shaken by his breath, Mr. Hooper had on a black veil. On a nearer view it seemed to consist of two folds of crepe, which entirely concealed his features, except the mouth and chin, but probably did not intercept his sight, further than to give a darkened aspect to all living and inanimate things. With this gloomy shape before him, good Mr. Hooper walked onward, at a slow and quiet pace, stooping somewhat and looking on the ground, as is customary with abstracted men, yet nodding kindly to those of his parishioners who still waited on the meeting-house steps. But so wonderstruck were they that his greeting hardly met with a return. "'I can't really feel as if good Mr. Hooper's face was behind that piece of crape," said the sexton. "'I don't like it.' muttered an old woman, as she hobbled into the meeting-house. He has changed himself into something awful, only by hiding his face. "'Our parson has gone mad,' cried Goodman Gray, following him across the threshold. A rumour of some unaccountable phenomenon had preceded Mr. Hooper into the meeting-house, and set all the congregation astir. Few could refrain from twisting their heads towards the door. Many stood upright, and turned directly about while several little boys clambered upon the seats, and came down again with a terrible racket. There was a general bustle, a rustling of women's gowns and shuffling of the men's feet, greatly at variance with that hushed repose which should attend the entrance of the minister. But Mr. Hooper appeared not to notice the perturbation of his people. He entered with an almost noiseless step, bent his head mildly to the pews on each side, and bowed as he passed his old parishioner, a white-haired great-grandsire, who occupied an armchair in the centre of the aisle. It was strange to observe how slowly this venerable man became conscious of something singular in the appearance of his pastor. He seemed not fully to partake of the prevailing wonder till Mr. Hooper had ascended the stairs and showed himself in the pulpit, face to face with his congregation, except for the black veil. The mysterious emblem was never once withdrawn. It shook with his measured breath as he gave out the psalm, it threw its obscurity between him and the holy page as he read the scriptures, and while he prayed the veil lay heavily on his uplifted countenance. Did he seek to hide it from the dread being whom he was addressing? Such was the effect of this simple piece of crepe that more than one woman of delicate nerves was forced to leave the meeting-house, yet perhaps the pale-faced congregation was almost as fearful a sight to the minister as his black veil to them. Mr. Hooper had the reputation of a good preacher, but not an energetic one. 
he strove to win his people heavenward by mild persuasive influences rather than to drive them thither by the thunder of the word the sermon which he now delivered was marked by the same characteristics of style and manner as a general series of his pulpit oratory but there was something either in the sentiment of the discourse itself or in the imagination of the auditors which made it greatly the most powerful effort that they had ever heard from their pastor's lips it was tinged rather more darkly than usual with the gentle gloom of mr hooper's temperament the subject had reference to secret sin and those sad mysteries which we hide from our nearest and dearest and would fain conceal from our own consciousness even forgetting that the omniscient can detect them a subtle power was breathed into his words each member of the congregation the most innocent girl and the man of hardened breast felt as if the preacher had crept upon them behind his awful veil and discovered their hoarded iniquity of deed or thought many spread their clasped hands on their bosoms there was nothing terrible in what mr hooper said at least no violence and yet with every tremor of his melancholy voice the hearers quaked an unsought pathos came hand in hand with awe so sensible were the audience of some unwonted attribute in their minister that they longed for a breath of wind to blow aside the veil almost believing that a stranger's visage would be discovered though the form gesture and voice were those of mr hooper at the close of services the people hurried out with indecorous confusion eager to communicate their pent-up amazement and conscious of lighter spirits the moment they lost sight of the black veil some gathered in little circles huddled closely together with their mouths all whispering in the centre some went homeward alone wrapped in silent meditation some talked loudly and profaned the sabbath day with ostentatious laughter a few shook their sagacious heads intimating that they could penetrate the mystery while one or two affirmed that there was no mystery at all but only that mr hooper's eyes were so weakened by the midnight lamp as to require a shade after a brief interval forth came good mr hooper also in the rear of his flock turning his veiled face from one group to another he paid due reverence to the hoary heads saluted the middle-aged with kind dignity as their friend and spiritual guide greeted the young with mingled authority and love and laid his hands on the little children's heads to bless them such was always his custom on the sabbath day strange and bewildered looks repaid him for his courtesy none as on former occasions aspired to the honour of walking by their pastor's side old squire saunders doubtless by an accidental lapse of memory neglected to invite mr hooper to his table where the good clergyman had been wont to bless the food almost every sunday since his settlement he returned therefore to the parsonage and at the moment of closing the door was observed to look back upon the people all of whom had their eyes fixed upon the minister a sad smile gleamed faintly from beneath the black veil and flickered about his mouth glimmering as he disappeared how strange said a lady that a simple black veil such as any woman might wear on her bonnet should become such a terrible thing on mr hooper's face something must surely be amiss with mr hooper's intellects observed her husband the physician of the village but the strangest part of the affair is the effect of this vagary even on a sober-minded man like myself the black veil though it covers only our pastor's face throws its influence over his whole person and makes him ghost-like from head to foot do you not feel it so truly do i replied the lady and i would not be alone with him for the world i wonder he is not afraid to be alone with himself men sometimes are so said her husband the afternoon service was attended with similar circumstances at its conclusion the bell tolled for the funeral of a young lady the relatives and friends were assembled in the house and the more distant acquaintances stood about the door speaking of the good qualities of the deceased when their talk was interrupted by the appearance of mr hooper still covered with his black veil it was now an appropriate emblem the clergyman stepped into the room where the corpse was laid and bent over the coffin to take a last farewell of his deceased parishioner as he stooped the veil hung straight down from his forehead so that if her eyelids had not been closed for ever the dead maiden might have seen his face could mr hooper be fearful of her glance that he so hastily caught back the black veil a person who watched the interview between the dead and living scrupled not to affirm that at the instant when the clergyman's features were disclosed the corpse had slightly shuddered 
rustling the shroud and muslin cap, though the countenance retained the composure of death. A superstitious old woman was the only witness of this prodigy. From the coffin Mr. Hooper passed into the chamber of the mourners, and thence to the head of the staircase, to make the funeral prayer. It was a tender and heart-dissolving prayer, full of sorrow, yet so imbued with celestial hope that the music of a heavenly harp, swept by the fingers of the dead, seemed faintly to be heard among the saddest accents of the minister. The people trembled, though they but darkly understood him when he prayed that they and himself and all of mortal race might be ready, as he trusted this young maiden had been for the dreadful hour that should snatch the wail from their faces. The bearers went heavily forth, and the mourners followed, saddening all the street, with the dead before them, and Mr. Hooper in his black veil behind. "'Why do you look back?' said one in the procession to his partner. "'I had a fancy,' replied she, "'that the minister and the maiden's spirit were walking hand in hand. "'And so had I at the same moment,' said the other. "'That night,' The handsomest couple in Milford Village were to be joined in wedlock. Though reckoned a melancholy man, Mr. Hooper had a placid cheerfulness for such occasions, which often excited a sympathetic smile where livelier merriment would have been thrown away. There was no quality of his disposition which made him more beloved than this. The company at the wedding awaited his arrival with impatience, trusting that the strange awe which had gathered over him throughout the day would now be dispelled. But such was not the result. When Mr. Hooper came, the first thing that their eyes rested was on the same horrible black veil, which had added deeper gloom to the funeral, and could portend nothing but evil to the wedding. Such was its immediate effect on the guests, that a cloud seemed to have rolled duskily from beneath the black crape, and dimmed the light of the candles. The bridal pair stood up before the minister, but the bride's cold fingers quivered in the tremulous hand of the bridegroom, and her death-like paleness caused a whisper that the maiden who had been buried a few hours before was come from her grave to be married. If ever another wedding was so dismal, it was that famous one where they told the wedding knell. After performing the ceremony, Mr. Hooper raised a glass of wine to his lips to the new married couple in a strain of mild pleasantry that ought to have brightened the features of the guests like a cheerful gleam from the hearth. At that instant, catching a glimpse of his figure in the looking glass, the black veil involved his own spirit in the horror with which it overwhelmed all others. His frame shuddered, his lips grew white. He spilt the untasted wine upon the carpet, and rushed forth into the darkness, for the earth, too, had on her black veil. The next day, the whole village of Milford talked of little else than Parson Hooper's black veil. That and the mystery concealed behind it supplied a topic for discussion between acquaintances meeting in the street, and good women gossiping at their open windows. It was the first item of news that the tavern-keeper told to his guests. The children babbled of it on their way to school. One imitative little imp covered his face with an old black handkerchief, thereby so affrighting his playmates that the panic seized himself, and he well-nigh lost his wits by his own vagary. It was remarkable that of all the busybodies and impertinent people in the parish, not one ventured to put the plain question to Mr. Hooper. Wherefore, he did his thing. Hitherto, whenever there appeared the slightest call for such interference, he had never plagued advisers, nor shown himself averse to be guided by their judgment. If he erred at all, it was by so painful a degree of self-distrust that even the mildest censure would lead him to consider an indifferent action as a crime. Yet, though so well acquainted with this amiable weakness, no individual among his parishioners chose to make the black veil a subject of friendly remonstrance. There was a feeling of dread, neither plainly confessed nor carefully concealed, which caused each to shift the responsibility upon another, till at length it was found expedient to send a deputation of the church in order to deal with Mr. Hooper about the mystery before it should grow into a scandal. Never did an embassy so ill discharge its duties. The minister received them with friendly courtesy, but became silent after they were seated, leaving to his visitors the whole burden of introducing their important business. The topic, it might be supposed, was obvious enough. There was the black veil swathed round Mr. Hooper's forehead, and concealing every feature above his placid mouth, on which at times they could perceive the glimmering of a melancholy smile. But that piece of crape, to their imagination, seemed to hang down before his heart, the symbol of a fearful secret between him and them. Were the veil but cast aside, they might speak freely of it, but not till then. Thus they sat a considerable time, speechless, confused, and shrinking uneasily from Mr. Hooper's eye, which they felt to be fixed upon them with an invisible glance. 
Finally, the deputies returned abashed to their constituents, pronouncing the matter too weighty to be handled, except by a council of the churches, if, indeed, it might not require a general synod. But there was one person in the village unappalled by the awe with which the black whale had impressed all beside herself. When the deputies returned without an explanation, or even venturing to demand one, she, with the calm energy of her character, determined to chase away the strange cloud that appeared to be settling around Mr. Hooper, every moment more darkly than before. As his plightful wife, it should be her privilege to know what the black whale concealed. At the minister's first visit, therefore, she entered upon the subject with a direct simplicity, which made the task easier both for him and her. After he had seated himself, she fixed her eyes steadfastly upon the whale, but could discern nothing of the dreadful gloom that had so overawed the multitude. It was but a double fold of crape, hanging down from his forehead to his mouth, and slightly stirring with his breath. No, she said aloud and smiling, there is nothing terrible in this piece of crape, except that it hides a face which I am always glad to look upon. Come, good sir, let the sun shine from behind the cloud. First lay aside your black veil, then tell me why you put it on. Mr. Hooper smiled glimmered faintly. There is an hour to come, said he, when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Take it not amiss, beloved friend, if I wear this piece of crape till then. Your words are a mystery, too, returned the young lady. Take away the veil from them, at least. Elizabeth, I will, said he, so far as my vow may suffer me. No, then, this veil is a type and a symbol, and I am bound to wear it ever, both in light and darkness, in solitude, and before the gaze of multitudes, and as with strangers, so with my familiar friends. No mortal eye will see it withdrawn. This dismal shade must separate me from the world. Even you, Elizabeth, can never come behind it. What grievous affliction hath befallen you? She earnestly inquired, that you should thus darken your eyes for ever. If it be a sign of mourning, replied Mr. Hooper, I, perhaps, like most other mortals, have sorrows dark enough to be typified by a black veil. But what if the world will not believe that it is the type of an innocent sorrow, urged Elizabeth? Beloved and respected as you are, there may be whispers that you hide your face under the consciousness of secret sin. For the sake of your holy office, do away the scandal. The colour rose into her cheeks as she intimated the nature of the rumours that were already abroad in the village. But Mr. Hooper's mildness did not forsake him. He even smiled again, that same sad smile, which always appeared like a faint glimmering of light, proceeding from the obscurity beneath the veil. If I hide my face for sorrow, there is cause enough, he merely replied, and if I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? And with this gentle but unconquerable obstinacy did he resist all her entreaties. At length Elizabeth sat silent. For a few moments she appeared lost in thought, considering probably what new methods might be tried to withdraw her lover from so dark a fantasy, which, if it had no other meaning, was perhaps a symptom of mental disease. Though of a firmer character than his own, the tears rolled down her cheeks. But in an instant, as it were, a new feeling took the place of sorrow. Her eyes were fixed insensibly on the black veil, and when, like a sudden twilight in the air, its terrors fell around her, she arose and stood trembling before him. "'And do you feel it, then, at last?' said he mournfully. She made no reply, but covered her eyes with her hand and turned to leave the room. He rushed forward and caught her arm. "'Have patience with me, Elizabeth,' cried he passionately. "'Do not desert me, though this wail must be between us here on earth. Be mine, and hereafter there shall be no veil over my face, no darkness between our souls. It is but a mortal veil. It is not for eternity. Oh, you know not how lonely I am, and how frightened to be alone behind my black veil. Do not leave me in this miserable obscurity for ever. Lift the veil but once and look me in the face, said she. Never. It cannot be replied Mr. Hooper. Then farewell, said Elizabeth. She withdrew her arm from his grasp and slowly departed, pausing at the door to give one long shuddering gaze that seemed almost to penetrate the mystery of the black veil. But even amid his grief, Mr. Hooper smiled to think that only a material emblem had separated him from happiness, though the horrors which it shadowed forth 
must be drawn darkly between the fondest of lovers. From that time no attempts were made to remove Mr. Hooper's black veil, or by a direct appeal to discover the secret which it was supposed to hide. By persons who claimed a superiority to popular prejudice, it was reckoned merely an eccentric whim, such as often mingles with the sober actions of men otherwise rational, and tinges them all with its own semblance of insanity. But with the multitude was irreparably a bugbear. He could not walk the street with any peace of mind, so conscious was he that the gentle and timid would turn aside to avoid him, and that others would make it a point of hardihood to throw themselves in his way. The impertinence of the latter class compelled him to give up his customary walk at sunset to the burial ground, for when he leaned pensively over the gate, there would always be faces behind the gravestones, peeping at his black veil. A fable went the rounds that the stare of the dead people drove him thence. It grieved him to the very depth of his kind heart to observe how the children fled from his approach, breaking up their merriest sports, while his melancholy figure was yet afar off. Their instinctive dread caused him to feel more strongly than aught else that a preternatural horror was interwoven with the threads of the black crepe. In truth, his own antipathy to the veil was known to be so great that he never willingly passed before a mirror, nor stooped to drink at a still fountain, lest in its peaceful bosom he should be affrighted by himself. This was what gave plausibility to the whispers, that Mr. Hooper's conscience tortured him for some great crime too horrible to be entirely concealed, or otherwise, than so obscurely intimated. Thus from beneath the black veil there rolled a cloud into the sunshine, an ambiguity of sin or sorrow which enveloped the poor minister, so that love or sympathy could never reach him. It was said that ghost and fiend consorted with him there. With self-shudderings and outward terrors, he walked continually in its shadow, groping darkly within his own soul, or gazing through a medium that saddened the whole world. Even the lawless wind, it was believed, respected his dreadful secret, and never blew aside the veil. But still, good Mr. Hooper sadly smiled at the pale visages of the worldly throng as he passed by. Among all its bad influences, the black veil had the one desirable effect of making its wearer a very efficient clergyman. By the aid of his mysterious emblem, for there was no other apparent cause, he became a man of awful power over souls that were in agony for sin. His converts always regarded him with a dread peculiar to themselves, affirming, though but figuratively, that before he brought them to celestial light, they had been with him behind the black veil. Its gloom, indeed, enabled him to sympathize with all dark affections, Dying sinners cried aloud for Mr. Hooper, and would not yield their breath till he appeared, though ever as he stooped to whisper consolation, they shuddered at the veiled face so near their own. Such were the terrors of the black veil, even when death had bared his visage. Strangers came long distances to attend service at his church, with a mere idle purpose of gazing at his figure, because it was forbidden them to behold his face. But many were made to quake ere they departed. Once during Governor Belcher's administration, Mr. Hooper was appointed to preach the election sermon. Covered with his black veil, he stood before the chief magistrate, the council, and the representatives, and wrought so deep an impression that the legislative measures of that year were characterized by all the gloom and piety of our earlier ancestral sway. In this manner Mr. Hooper spent a long life, irreproachable in outward act, yet shrouded in dismal suspicions, kind and loving, though unloved and dimly feared, a man apart from men, shunned in their health and joy, but ever summoned to their aid in mortal anguish. As years wore on, shedding their snows above his sable veil, he acquired a name throughout the New England churches, and they called him Father Hooper. Nearly all his parishioners who were of mature age when he was settled had been borne away by many a funeral. He had one congregation in the church, and a more crowded one in the churchyard, and having wrought so late into the evening, and done his work so well, it was now good Father Hooper's turn to rest. Several persons were visible by the shaded candlelight in the deck chamber of the old clergyman. Natural connections he had none, but there was the decorously grave though unmoved physician seeking only to mitigate the last pangs of the patient whom he could not save. There were the deacons and other eminently pious members of his church. There also was the Reverend Mr. Clark of Vesbury a young and zealous divine, who had ridden in haste to pray by the bedside of the expiring minister. There was the nurse, 
no hired handmaiden of death, but one whose calm affection had endured thus long in secrecy, in solitude, amid the chill of age, and would not perish even at the dying hour. Who but Elizabeth? And there lay the hoary head of good father Hooper upon the dead pillow, with the black veil still swathed about his brow, and reaching down over his face, so that each more difficult gasp of his faint breath caused it to stir. All through life that piece of crape had hung between him and the world. It had separated him from cheerful brotherhood and woman's love, and kept him in that saddest of all prisons, his own heart, and still it lay upon his face, as if to deepen the gloom of his darksome chamber, and shade him from the sunshine of eternity. For some time previous his mind had been confused, wavering doubtfully between the past and the present, and hovering it forward, as it were, at intervals, into the indistinctness of the world to come. There had been feverish turns which tossed him from side to side, and wore away what little strength he had, but in his most convulsive struggles and in the wildest vagaries of his intellect, when no other thought retained its sober influence, he still showed an awful solicitude lest the black veil should slip aside. Even if his bewildered soul could have forgotten, there was a faithful woman at his pillow, who with averted eyes would have covered that aged face, which she had last beheld in the comeliness of manhood. At length, the dead-stricken old man lay quietly in the torpor of mental and bodily exhaustion, with an imperceptible pulse and breath that grew fainter and fainter, except when a long, deep and irregular inspiration seemed to prelude the flight of his spirit. The minister of Vesbury approached the bedside. Venerable Father Hooper, said he, the moment of your release is at hand. Are you ready for the lifting of the veil that shuts in time from eternity? Father Hooper at first replied, merely a feeble motion of his head. Then, apprehensive, perhaps, that his meaning might be doubted, he exerted himself to speak. Yea, said he in faint accents, my soul hath a patient weariness until that veil be lifted. And is it fitting, resumed the Reverend Mr. Clark, that a man so given to prayer, of such a blameless example, holy in deed and thought, so far a mortal judgment may pronounce, is it fitting that a father in the church should leave a shadow on his memory that may seem to blacken a life so pure? I pray you, my venerable brother, let not this thing be. Suffer us to be gladdened by your triumphant aspect as you go to your reward. Before the veil of eternity be lifted, let me cast aside this black veil from your face and thus speaking, the Reverend Mr. Clark bent forward to reveal the mystery of so many years. But exerting a certain energy that made all the beholders stand aghast, Father Hooper snatched both his hands from beneath the bedclothes and pressed them strongly on the black veil, resolute to struggle if the minister of Vesbury would contend with the dying man. Never! cried the veiled clergyman. On earth, never! Dark old man! exclaimed the affrighted minister. With what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? Father Hooper's breath heaved. It rattled in his throat. But with a mighty effort, grasping forward with his hands, he caught hold of life and held it back till he should speak. He even raised himself in bed, and there he sat, shivering with the arms of death around him, while the black veil hung down, awful at that last moment, in the gathered terrors of a lifetime. And yet the faint sad smile, so often there, now seemed to glimmer from its obscurity, and linger on Father Hooper's lips. Why do you tremble at me alone? cried he, turning his veiled face round the circle of pale spectators. Tremble also at each other. Have men avoided me, and women shown no pity, and children screamed and fled only for my black veil? What? But the mystery which it obscurely typifies has made this piece of crape so awful. When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, the lover to his best beloved, when a man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator, loathsomely treasuring up the secret of his sin, then deem me a monster, for the symbol beneath which I have lived and die. I look around me, and lo, on every visage, a black veil. While his auditors shrank from one another in mutual affright, Father Hooper fell back upon his pillow, a veiled corpse, with a faint smile lingering on his lips. 
still veiled, they laid him in his coffin, and a veiled corpse they bore him to the grave. The grass of many years has sprung up and withered on that grave. The burial stone is moss-grown, and good Mr. Hooper's face is dust. But awful is still the thought that it moulded beneath the black veil. End of The Minister's Black Veil by Nathaniel Hawthorne Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Elise Sauer. An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge by Ambrose Bierce. A man stood upon a railroad bridge in northern Alabama, looking down into the swift water twenty feet below. The man's hands were behind his back, the wrists bound with a cord. A rope closely encircled his neck. It was attached to a stout cross timber above his head, and the slack fell to the level of his knees. Some loose boards laid upon the ties supporting the rails of the railway supplied a footing for him and his executioners. Two private soldiers of the Federal Army, directed by a sergeant who in civil life may have been a deputy sheriff. At a short remove, upon the same temporary platform, was an officer in the uniform of his rank, armed. He was a captain. A sentinel at each end of the bridge stood with his rifle in a position known as support, that is to say, vertical in front of the left shoulder, the hammer resting on the forearm thrown straight across the chest. A formal and unnatural position, enforcing an erect carriage of the body. It did not appear to be the duty of those two men to know what was occurring at the center of the bridge. They merely blockaded the two ends of the foot-blanking that traversed it. Beyond one of the sentinels, nobody was in sight. The railroad ran straight away into a forest for a hundred yards, then curving, was lost to view. Doubtless there was an outpost farther along. The other bank of the stream was open ground, a gentle slope topped with a stockade of vertical tree trunks, loopholed for rifles, with a single embrasure through which protruded the muzzle of a brass cannon commanding the bridge. Midway up the slope, between the bridge and the fort, were the spectators, a single company of infantry in line at parade rest, the butts of their rifles on the ground, the barrels inclining slightly backward against the right shoulder, the hands crossed upon the stock. A lieutenant stood at the right of the line, the point of his sword upon the ground, his left hand resting upon his right. Excepting the group of four at the center of the bridge, not a man moved. The company faced the bridge, staring stonily, motionless. The sentinels, facing the banks of the stream, might have been statues to adorn the bridge. The captain stood with folded arms, silent, observing the work of his subordinates but making no sign. Death is a dignitary who, when he comes announced, is to be received with formal manifestations of respect, even by those most familiar with him. In the code of military etiquette, silence and fixity are forms of deference. The man who was engaged in being hanged was apparently about thirty-five years of age. He was a civilian, if one might judge from his habit, which was that of a planter. His features were good, a straight nose, firm mouth, broad forehead, from which his long, dark hair was combed straight back, falling behind his ears to the collar of his well-fitting frock coat. He wore a mustache and a pointed beard, but no whiskers. His eyes were large and a dark gray, and had a kindly expression, which one would hardly have expected in one whose neck was in the hemp. Evidently, this was no vulgar assassin. The liberal military code makes provision for hanging many kinds of persons, and gentlemen are not excluded. The preparations being complete, 
the two private soldiers stepped aside and each drew away the plank upon which he had been standing. The sergeant turned to the captain, saluted, and placed himself immediately behind that officer, who turned, moved apart one pace. These movements left the condemned man and the sergeant standing on two ends of the same plank, which spanned three of the cross ties of the bridge. The end upon which the civilian stood almost, but not quite, reached a fourth. This plank had been held in place by the weight of the captain. It was now held by that of the sergeant. At a signal from the former, the latter would step aside, the plank would tilt, and the condemned man go down between two ties. The arrangement commended itself to his judgment as simple and effective. His face had not been covered nor his eyes bandaged. He looked a moment at his unsteadfast footing, then let his gaze wander to the swirling water of the stream racing madly beneath his feet. A piece of dancing driftwood caught his attention, and his eyes followed it down the current. How slowly it appeared to move! What a sluggish stream! He closed his eyes in order to fix his last thoughts upon his wife and children. The water, touched to gold by the early sun, the brooding mists under the banks at some distant down the stream, the fort, the soldiers, the piece of drift, all had distracted him. And now he became conscious of a new disturbance, striking through the thought of his dear ones with a sound which he could neither ignore nor understand, a sharp, distinct, metallic percussion like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer upon an anvil. It had the same ringing quality. He wondered what it was and whether measurably distant or nearby, it seemed both. Its recurrence was regular, but as slow as the tolling of a death now. He awaited each new stroke with impatience, and, he knew not why, apprehension. The intervals of silence grew progressively longer, the delays became maddening. With their greater infrequency, the sounds increased in strength and sharpness. They heard his ear like the trust of a knife. He feared he would shriek. What he heard was the ticking of his watch. He unclosed his eyes and saw again the watch below him. If I could free my hands, he thought, I might throw off the noose and spring into the stream. By diving, I could evade the bullets and, swimming vigorously, reach the bank, take to the woods and get away home, my home, thank God is as yet outside their lines, my wife and little ones are still beyond the invader's father's advance. As these thoughts, which have here to be set down in words, were flashed into the doomed man's brains rather than evolved from it, the captain nodded to the sergeant. The sergeant stepped aside. Peyton Farquhar was... A well-to-do planter of an old and highly respected Alabama family. Being a slave owner, and like other slave owners, a politician, he was naturally an original secessionist and ardently devoted to the Southern cause. Circumstances of an imperious nature, which it is unnecessary to relate here, had prevented him from taking service with the gallant army which had fought the disastrous campaigns ending with the fall of Corinth, and he chafed under the inglorious restraint, longing for the release of his energies, the larger life of the soldier, the opportunity for distinction. That opportunity, he felt, would come, as it comes to all in wartime. Meanwhile, he did what he could. No service was too humble for him to perform in aid of the South. No adventure too perilous for him to undertake if consistent with the character of a civilian who was at heart a soldier, and who in good faith and without too much qualification assented to at least a part of the frankly villainous dictum that all is fair in love and war. One evening, while Farquhar and his wife were sitting on a rustic bench near the entrance to his grounds, a grey-clad soldier rode up to the gate and asked for a drink of water. Mrs. Farquhar was only too happy to serve him with her own white hands. While she was fetching the water, her husband approached the dusty horseman and inquired eagerly for news from the front. 
The Yanks are repairing the railroads, said the man, and are getting ready for another advance. They have reached the Owl Creek Bridge and put it in order and built a stockade at the north bank. The commandant has issued an order which is posted everywhere declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. I saw the order. How far is the Owl Creek Bridge? Farquhar asked. About thirty miles. Is there no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post half a mile out on the railroad and a single sentinel at the end of the bridge. Suppose a man, a civilian and a student of hanging, should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel, said Farquhar, smiling. What could he accomplish? The soldier reflected. I was there a month ago, he replied. I observed that the flood of the last winter had lodged a great quantity of driftwood against a wooden pier at the end of the bridge. It is now dry, and would burn like tinder. The lady had now brought water, which the soldier drank. He thanked her ceremoniously, bowed to her husband, and rode away. An hour later, after nightfall, he repassed the plantation, going northward in the direction from which he had come. He was a federal scout. As Peyton Farquhar fell straight downward through the bridge, he lost consciousness, and was as one already dead. From this state he was awakened, ages later it seemed to him, by the pain of a sharp pressure upon his throat, followed by a sense of suffocation. Keen, poignant agony seemed to shoot from his neck downward through every fiber of his body and limbs. These pains appeared to flash along well-defined lines of ramification and to beat with an inconceivably rapid periodicity. They seemed like streams of pulsating fire, heating him to an intolerable temperature. As to his head, he was conscious of nothing but a feeling of fullness of congestion. These sensations were unaccompanied by thought. The intellectual part of his nature was already effaced. He had only power to feel, and the feeling was torment. He was conscious of motion, encompassed in a luminous cloud of which he was now merely the fiery heart without material substance he swung through unthinkable arcs of oscillation like a vast pendulum. Then all at once, with terrible suddenness, the light about him shot upward, and the noise of a loud splash, a frightful roaring in his ears, and all was cold and dark. The power of thought was restored. He knew that the rope had broken, and he had fallen into the stream. There was no additional strangulation. The noose around his neck was already suffocating him, and kept the water from his lungs. To die of hanging, at the bottom of a river, the idea seemed ludicrous. He opened his eyes, in the darkness, and saw above him a gleam of light. But how distant, how inaccessible! He was still sinking, for the light became fainter and fainter, until it was a mere glimmer. Then it began to grow and brighten, and he knew that he was rising toward the surface, knew it with reluctance, for he was now very comfortable. To be hanged and drowned, he thought, that is not so bad, but I do not wish to be shot. No, I will not be shot. That is not fair. He was not conscious of an effort, but a sharp pain in his wrist apprised him that he was trying to free his hands. He gave the struggle his attention, as an idler might observe the feat of a juggler without interest in the outcome. What splendid effort! What magnificent! What superhuman strength! Ah, oh, that was a fine endeavor! Bravo! The cord fell away, his arms parted and floated upward, the hands dimly seen on each side in the growing light. He watched them with a new interest as first one and then another pounced upon the noose at his neck. They tore it away and thrust it fiercely aside, its undulations resembling those of a water snake. Put it back, put it back, he thought, he shouted these words to his hands, for the undoing of the noose had been succeeded by the directest pang he had yet experienced. His neck ached horribly, his brain was on fire, his heart, which had been fluttering faintly, gave a great leap trying to force itself out at his mouth. 
His whole body was racked and wrenched with an insupportable anguish, but his disobedient hands gave no heed to the command. They beat the water vigorously with quick downward strokes, forcing him to the surface. He felt his head emerge. His eyes were blinded by the sunlight. His chest expanded convulsively, and with a supreme and crowning agony, his lungs engulfed a great draught of air, which instantly he expelled in a shriek. He was now in possession of his physical senses. They were, indeed, preternaturally keen and alert. Something in the awful disturbance of his organic system had so exalted and refined them that they may record things never before perceived. He felt the ripples upon his face, and heard their separate sounds as they struck. He looked at the forest on the bank of the stream, saw the individual trees, the leaves, and the veining of each leaf. He saw the very insects upon them, the locusts, the brilliant-bodied flies, the gray spiders stretching their webs from twig to twig. He noted the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops upon the million blades of grass, the humming of the gnats that danced above the eddies of the stream, the beating of the dragonfly's wings, the strokes of the water spider's legs, like oars which had lifted their boat. All these made audible music. A fish slid along beneath his eye, and he heard the rush of its body parting the water. He had come to the surface facing down the stream. In a moment the visible world seemed to wheel slowly round, himself the pivotal point, and he saw the bridge the fort, the soldiers upon the bridge, the captain, the sergeant, the two privates, his executioners. They were in silhouette against the blue sky. They shouted and gesticulated, pointing at him. The captain had drawn his pistol, but did not fire. The others were unarmed. Their movements were grotesque and horrible, their forms gigantic. Suddenly, he heard a sharp report and something struck the water smartly within a few inches of his head, spattering his face with spray. He heard a second report, and saw one of the sentinels with his rifle at his shoulder, a light cloud of blue smoke rising from the muzzle. The man in the water saw the eye of the man on the bridge gazing into his own through the sights of the rifle. He observed that it was a gray eye, and remembering having read the gray eyes were keenest, and that all famous marksmen had them, nevertheless, this one had missed. A counter-swirl had caught Farquhar, and he turned himself half round. He was again looking at the forest, on the bank opposite the fort. The sound of a clear, high voice in a monotonous sing-song now rang out behind him and came across the water with a distinctness that pierced and subdued all other sounds, even the beating ripples in his ears. Although no soldier, he had frequented camps enough to know the dread significance of that deliberate drawling aspirated chant. The lieutenant on shore was taking part in the morning's work. How coldly and piteously, with what an even calm imitation, presaging and enforcing tranquility in the men, with what accurately measured interval fell those cruel words. Company! Attention! Shoulder! Arms! Ready! Aim. Fire. Farquhar dived, dived as deeply as he could. The water roared in his ears like the voice of Niagara, yet he heard the dull thunder of the volley and, rising again toward the surface, met shining bits of metal, singularly flattened, oscillating slowly downward. Some of them touched him on his face and hands, then fell away, continuing their descent. One lodged between his collar and neck. It was uncomfortably warm when he snatched it out. As he rose to the surface, gasping for breath, he saw that he had been a long time under water. He was perceptibly farther downstream and near to safety. The soldiers had almost finished reloading. The metal ramrods flashed all at once in the sunshine as they were drawn from the barrels, turned in the air, and thrust into their sockets. The two sentinels fired again, independently and ineffectually. The hunted man saw all this over his shoulder. He was now swimming vigorously with the current. His brain was as energetic as his arms and legs. He thought with the rapidity of lightning. The officer, he reasoned, will not make the martinet's error a second time. It is as easy to dodge a volley 
as a single shot. He has probably already given the command to fire at will. God help me, I cannot dodge them all. An appalling splash within two yards of him was followed by a loud rushing sound. Diminuendo, which seemed to travel back through the air to the fort and died in an explosion which stirred the very river to its deeps. A rising sheet of water curved over him, fell down upon him, blinded him, strangled him. The cannon had taken a hand in the game. As he shook his head free from the commotion of the smitten water, he heard a deflected shot humming through the air ahead, and in an instant it was cracking and smashing the branches in the forest beyond. They will not do that again, he thought. The next time they will use a charge of grape. I must keep my eye upon the gun. The smoke will apprise me. The report arrives too late. It lags behind the missile. That is a good gun. Suddenly, he felt himself whirled round and round, spinning like a top. The water, the banks, the forests, the now distant bridge, fort and men, all were commingled and blurred. Objects were represented by their colors only, circular, horizontal streaks of color. That was all he saw. He had been caught in a vortex and was being whirled on with a velocity of advance and gyration that made him giddy and sick. In a few moments, he was flung upon the gravel at the foot of the left bank of the stream, the southern bank, and behind a projecting point which concealed him from his enemies. The sudden arrest of his motion, the abrasion of one of his hands on the gravel, restored him, and he wept with delight. He dug his fingers into the sand, threw it over himself in handfuls, and audibly blessed it. It looked like diamonds, rubies, emeralds. He could think of nothing beautiful, which it did not resemble. The trees upon the bank were giant garden plants. He noted the definite order in their arrangement, inhaled the fragrance of their blooms. A strange roseate light shone through the space among their trunks, and the wind made their branches the music of Aeolian harps. He had not wished to perfect his escape. He was content to remain in that enchanted spot until retaken. A whiz and a rattle of grape shot among the branches high above his head roused him from his dream. The baffled cannoneer had fired him a random farewell. He sprang to his feet, brushed up the sloping bank, and plunged into the forest. All that day he traveled, laying his course by the rounding sun. The forest seemed interminable. Nowhere did he discover a break in it, not even a woodman's road. He had not known that he had lived in so wild a region. There was something uncanny in the revelation. By nightfall, he was fatigued, footsore, famished. The thought of his wife and children urged him on. At last he found a road, which led him in what he knew to be the right direction. It was as wide and straight as a city street, yet it seemed untraveled. No fields bordered it, no dwelling anywhere. Not so much as the barking of a dog suggested human habitation. The black bodies of trees formed a straight wall on both sides, terminating on the horizon in a point like a diagram in a lesson in perspective. Overhead, as he looked up through this rift in the wood, shone great golden stars looking unfamiliar and grouped in strange constellations. He was sure they were arranged in some order which had a secret and malign significance. The wood on either side was full of singular noises, among which once, twice, and again he distinctly heard whispers in an unknown tongue. His neck was in pain, and lifting his head to find it horribly swollen, he knew that it had a circle of black where the rope had bruised it. His eyes felt congested. He could no longer close them. His tongue was swollen with thirst. He relieved its fever by thrusting it forward from between his teeth into the cold air. How softly the turf had carpeted the untraveled avenue. He could no longer feel the roadway beneath his feet. Doubtless, despite his suffering, he had fallen asleep while walking. For now he sees another scene. Perhaps he has merely recovered from a delirium. He stands at the gate of his own home. All his ears left it, and all bright and beautiful in the morning sunshine. He must have traveled the entire night. And as he pushes open the gate and passes up the wide white walk, 
he sees a flutter of female garments, his wife, looking fresh and cool and sweet, steps down from the veranda to meet him. At the bottom of the steps, she stands waiting, with a smile of ineffable joy, an attitude of matchless grace and dignity. Ah, oh, how beautiful she is. He springs forward with extended arms. As he is about to clasp her, he feels a stunning blow upon the back of the neck. A blinding white light blazes all about him with a sound like the shock of a cannon. Then all is darkness and silence. Peyton Farquhar was dead. His body, with a broken neck, swung gently from side to side beneath the timbers of the Owl Creek Bridge. End of An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge Recorded by Elise Sauer, Houston, August 1st, 2012